your host for this evening. Tonight we've got another great detective grab bag. First off, we have That Hammer Guy. This series is based on the character of Mike Hammer by Mickey Spillane, and it ran on the Mutual Broadcasting System from December of 1952 until October of 1954. Larry Haynes starred as Mike Hammer. He was also played by George Petrie and Ted DeCorsia, and I believe tonight's episodes feature George Petrie as Hammer. Jan Minor plays the secretary. If you haven't heard this show before, I think you're in for a real treat. After a few episodes of That Hammer Guy, then we've got yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And for tonight's lineup, we've got episodes featuring Bob Bailey, Edmund O'Brien, Mandel Kramer, and of course, more Bob Bailey. So all in all, I think we're in for an enjoyable evening. Now, just before we get into the show, I do want to take a minute and remind you about the Johnny Dollar Club. Starting at just a dollar a month, you can help support the channel and help keep these great shows coming. Check out the links in the description below. And another thing I want to mention is our Yours Truly Johnny Dollar collection in our Hearth and Home Etsy shop. We've got the links for that down below as well. We've got a lot of new great products in our Yours Truly Johnny Dollar collection, including a t-shirt, a hoodie, the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Action Pack Journal, a comfy throw, and even a Christmas ornament. I'll also be adding some new items, including puzzles. So make sure you check that out. Now, without any further ado, let's get on with our program. It's time to sit back and relax and enjoy that hammer guy. And yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And as always, thanks for tuning in. The number one selling mystery character in all fiction is on the air. The hard-hitting private eye, Mike Hammer, in the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. <laughs> Makers of kicks, tasty, crispy corn puffs, food for action. And the makers of mild, flavorful camels, America's most popular cigarette. And the publishers of Esquire magazine, in cooperation with the Mutual Broadcasting System, present That Hammer Guy, a new suspense series transcribed based on Mickey Spillane's fabulous Mike Hammer. More than 20 million readers have thrilled to his exciting books. In just a moment, you'll meet in person Mickey Spillane's That Hammer Guy. Here's the shocking truth. The truth about the growing immorality in the United States. May Esquire's revealing expose, Call Girls and Fall Guys, reports that millions of Americans would end up behind prison bars if it were possible to enforce all the laws on sex. Yes, it's the truth, now told in a way you've never heard before. And it's in the current issue of Esquire. Here are the startling facts. Each year, both you and the government are cheated by those who would use immorality as an income tax deduction. And loose money is buying loose morals in a way that threatens your very way of life. May Esquire reveals the carefully hidden secrets of New York and Hollywood's Romeos and Juliets. Don't miss Call Girls and Fall Guys in the May issue of Esquire on your newsstand now. And now, here is Larry Haynes in the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. You've been prowling the town like a happy tomcat with a night full of delicatessen garbage cans. But by the time dawn rolls around, you've got that washed out gray feeling. So you turn in at the nearest glorified flop house and hit up the sleepy room clerk for a berth. Here's the key, room 500. Someone just checked out. You're lucky. Any special service you want? All you want is sleep. So you crawl in the sack like a bear who's finally found its winter cave. But just when you settle down to hibernate, the knocking starts. Oh. (sighs) Keep your shirt on. Okay, okay, I'm coming. (sighs) Yeah, what is it? Oh, no. Before the world exploded into orange flashes, all you saw was a pair of old beat-up brown and white saddle shoes. The stabbing pain in your side brings you out of the whirling blackness, and you're still in the room, but on the bed now, and the unfriendly, pasty face of the desk clerk is looking down into yours. You're lucky, Hammer. It's only a flesh wound. This is luck. I'd like to know what you think misfortune is. If you're going to get yourself shot, why pick this hotel? Uh, Where else in town can you get a bullet through your side instead of breakfast in bed? You can't afford to be funny. Oh, well, thanks for the patch job. 
Does uh, a little information come with the room service? For information, you go to a booth in an apartment store. I'd like to know who plugged me. You don't mind that, do you? Your clothes are hanging over the chair. You're all checked out. I asked you a question. How should I know? You fool around with dames. Things like this can happen. This wasn't a dame. You know more than I do. Why ask me? There's a guy wearing brown and white saddle shoes. That's all I know. You tell me the rest. All I can tell you is to get out of here. Well, maybe I want to stay till the doctor comes. You don't need a doctor. All right, then the cops. Look, Hammer, you don't want any trouble with cops. They ask a lot of questions. We don't want any trouble with the cops either. We got enough trouble already. I'll bet you have. Like I said, your clothes are on the chair. We need the room. Uh Uh-huh, for a shooting gallery. You got ten minutes to get out. Well, I'll need more. Ten minutes or a couple of guys will be up to show you. I'll show you. Be hospitable or you'll get your neck wrapped around the bedpost. Let go. You're going to answer my question. Let go. You're going to answer or you're going to go around with your head in a cast for a long time. All right, all right, all right. Don't stop. Now you saw the guy who shot me. No, I didn't. On the brights. I-, I swear. He must have passed through the lobby downstairs. You were the last person I saw in the lobby. Probably used the back stairs. You said somebody just checked out of the room before I took it. Who was it? I don't know his name. You got to register. He didn't sign in. He slipped me five bucks nah, to sign in. Let's try that again. <laughs> Martin. Registers Frank Martin. Why didn't you want to tell me his name? He slipped me the money to keep my mouth shut. Okay, fill me in with the rest. What kind of a guy was this Frank Martin? Well, looked like Hayes. He checked in two days ago. Stayed in his room all the time, even... Had his meal sent out. Why'd he leave? I don't know. He came running down the stairs like the devil was after him and went out. Went out where? Didn't leave a forwarding address. Oh, you want more of the same? No, wait. All right, keep talking. I helped him get a cab. I heard him tell the driver something. What? An address. Uh, Hotel Fairfield, I think. You just think? Fairfield, I'm sure. That's better. No trouble. I told you we don't want any trouble here. Yeah, well, you better pray you told me the truth. Oh, I did. Now, will you please get out of here? All right. But if you didn't level with me, I'll be back. And it won't be the reputation of this joint I'll hurt. It'll be you. You find Frank Martin at the Fairfield, all right. But someone found him before you did. Whoever shot you by mistake got to Martin and corrected the error. The desk clerk was right. This Frank Martin must have been a hayseed. The kind of a guy you'd expect to see calling the turns at a square dance. The room's been stripped of everything except a leather picture frame on the night table. And whoever tore out the picture left the lower right-hand corner jammed into the broken glass. And on that corner, you read the scrawl, To my darling husband, from Lillian. Except for that, you're at a standoff. Yeah. Frankie. Uh, yeah. This is Ella. I found out where she is, Frankie boy. You're in for a big surprise. Who? Who? You spent two years looking for that ever-loving wife of yours. You come here all the way from Kansas, and now that I can deliver her, you sound like it don't mean a thing. Uh, where is she? Where is she? Say, what's the matter with you? Don't you remember our agreement? Oh, uh, yeah, I just was anxious. Well, don't get too anxious. A bargain's a bargain, Frankie boy. You bring the 500 bucks, and you'll get the information. Mm -hmm. Bring it where? Jefferson Park in 20 minutes, okay? Fine. I'll be under the statue of Columbus. And believe me, Frankie boy, you're going to discover a whole new world. You've got to know the rest about Frank Martin, because you've got to know how you can locate saddle shoes. On the way over to the park, you keep thinking about a mild little guy who came to the big city to find his wife and was stopped dead. When you get to the statue of Columbus, there's a dame standing under it, glancing around like a lookout for a heist job. Looking for something? If I was, you couldn't find it. That's a nice statue, but you'd make a much nicer one. Don't get fresh. I might blow the whistle. There's nothing wrong with talking, is there? This isn't the time. I'm here on business. Mm Mm-hmm. You're lucky I know what kind of business, or I might blow the whistle. Hey, who are you? We made a date, Ella. Remember? Either I have a short memory, or you've got a long nose. Frankie Martin. I'm right about the nose, it's not Our business. You uh, have some information for me. I have some information, but you're not Frank Martin. You'll have to settle for me. Where's Frank? My date's with him. He's been dead over an hour. Try again. I just talked to him 20 minutes ago. You talked to me. 
Too bad. About Martin? About the 500. I hate to miss a payoff like that. Uh, well, you can tell me what you were going to tell him. Sure, I could. Well. Got the 500? No. I didn't think so. Yeah, but why let this relationship be cheapened by money? I never do anything for nothing. I didn't think so. Goodbye, soldier. Your leaf is over. Don't overrate yourself. I just hate to see people killed. It messes up our fair city streets. Killed? What's that supposed to mean? Frankie Martin was looking for his wife, Lillian, wasn't he? So? So somebody didn't want him to find her, so he got killed. So he got killed. What's that got to do with me? You know where his wife is, don't you? All right, I do. Why should you want to know? You're no cop, are you? No, I'm no cop. But I'm curious about Lillian Martin and the guy who wears a pair of beat-up saddle shoes. I stopped one of saddle shoes slugs for Frank Martin before the mistake was corrected. Saddle shoes, huh? Maybe I could locate them for you. Cash on the line, of course. Hmm. What a wonderful friend you'd make. The only friend I have looks at me in the mirror every morning when I brush my teeth. I bet you like to think that people write books about you. I learned early in life that you get by only on a strict cast and carry basis. And I didn't read it in a book. You mind telling me how well you know Lillian Martin? Well enough to feel sorry for her husband. Not go home and lick your wounds. You look like the kind of a guy with a past that can absorb this experience. A wound of mine isn't going to get healed till I find saddle shoes and Lillian Martin. Save your strength. Even in my society, her kind is marked no good. You can easily lose your life membership in your society. You said that before. You know where she is. It'll be just as easy to kill you as it was to kill Martin. I can take care of myself. Yeah, that's what they all say before the gun goes off. Now, if you'll tell you me... still haven't got the 500. See you around. You should live so long. You watch her walk down the park path, swinging her hips like a basketball player taking a pivot shot. In a moment, she's free of the bushes and out in the open. You grind out your cigarette and start to follow. Only you don't get far. And Ella, well, she makes even less progress. In just a moment, we'll return to That Hammer Guy. Here's a sad little song by a person who starts the day without breakfast. It's a shame to be a Nixie like me. I suffer from a lack of energy. Won't somebody tell me why I fail in everything I try? It's a shame to be a Nixie like me. People slow to catch on. Hard to get started are Nixies, unlike quick-witted, fast-footed Kixies. Kixies are men of action who eat kicks, food for action, peppy boys and girls, grown-ups, too, who build breakfast around a heaping bowl of kicks, have lots of energy every morning, because kicks is an 83% energy food. Start your day with kicks corn puffs, tender, tasty, crisp. Eat kicks. Food for action. Oh, it's grand to be a kicksy like me. Always feeling full of pep and energy. Every morning I eat kicks, so I'm never in a fix. Oh, it's grand to be a kicksy like me. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery. That hammer guy. <laughs> can't see where the shots come from, but you know by the crazy pirouette Ella makes as she goes down that she isn't getting up anymore. And when she goes down, your hopes of locating either Lily and her shoes sink with her. She was dealing for $500, but all she has in her pocketbook is $2.40 and several matchbooks advertising the friendship bar. After you call Pat Chambers at Homicide, you go to that bar. Good call wound up, mister. Why don't you relax? You've been buying drinks around, but nobody knows a thing. You take a look at the dame who's wrapped around the bar stool next to you. And you know a few more drinks and she won't even recognize her own name. Sophisticated lady. Isn't that a pretty song? It's a song. Special for me. Never get tired of listening. I hear you've been asking around about Lillian. Wouldn't you like to buy me a drink? Sure, why not? What are you drinking? Almost anything. Name it. Bourbon will be fine. Same as you. Another one of these, bartender. Such a pretty song. What about Lillian? Sophisticated lady. It's my special favorite piece. Oh, um, your drink. Thanks. Well, that's you here, huh? To you, mister. 
You want to know about Lillian Martin? That's right. Forget her, mister. She's no good. She'll ruin you. Look, I want information, not advice. How well do you know her? Lillian, too well. Look at me. Pretty. Oh, I can no. be pretty again, too, anytime I want. All I have to do is stop drinking this stuff. So why don't you stop? Because <laughs> I can't. <laughs> you ask a silly question, you get a silly answer. Silly, isn't it? What was she to you? Lillian? Everything, nothing. What's that supposed to mean? Two kinds of people in this world. One with a long story and the ones with a short story. You don't want to hear the story of my life, do you? I've got nothing but time. Well, I'm the short story type. Lillian was my friend. I gave her a place to sleep, helped to get a job, let her wear my clothes. Even introduced her to, as they say in the storybooks, the man I loved. And? And she took him away from me. You want to find her? I want to find her. Me too. Ruined me. Ruined my boyfriend. Ruined the only guy I ever loved. You ever hear such a sad short story? <laughs> my name's Vera Comden. Call me Vera if you like. What about your ex-boyfriend? Is he around? Dave? Mm. I haven't seen him since she took him away. No. Well, maybe he'll come floating back. Dave? I'll slam the door right in his face. No, I won't. But what's the difference? What I do? He's not coming back. Look, uh, Vera, here's my card. If he does show, give me a ring, huh? If you happen to find out where he is, let me know. You're a nice guy. We should have met before. Things would have been different. Yeah. Things always would have been different. The days roll by as slow as glue coming out of a bottle. And with every itching ache of the healing wound in your side, you know you're going to find Lillian Martin in saddle shoes if it's the last thing you do. You try everything, look everywhere, but nothing happens. And just when you're ready to face the fact you're in a downfall with no hope for a breeze, the phone rings. Mike, this is Vera Comden. Come over to room 417, the Royalty Apartments. The door will be open. If the apartments are royalty, you know they've been in exile too long. Vera's room is filthy with empty bottles and smells like old home week at a Kentucky mountain still. And she's sprawled over the bed, kicking her feet against the backboard in time to the phonograph record. Ever hear such a pretty song, Mike? Sophisticated lady. What do you want to see me about, Vera? I remember when guys didn't have to have a reason to see me. Now, you know what my reason is. Yeah. Lillian. Always her. What's the matter with me? Nothing, but... You can't kid me, I know. Huh. No more sophisticated lady. You know something. That's why you asked me over. You know something about Lillian Martin. She disappeared over a year ago with Dave. I still don't know where she is. Maybe Dave does. You uh, told me you didn't know where he is. Well, you know how girls are. They always change their minds. So? Well, there ought to be something in it for me besides a drink at a bar, don't you think? What do you want, Vera? Something I lost a long time ago. My self-respect. I can't help you with that. Too late, huh? Mike, you don't have to be honest all the time. Vera, I can't help you lie to yourself. You can't break every mirror in the world. Nobody can help me anymore. Nobody but you. You're a nice guy. I like you, Mike. I'm a guy looking for somebody. If I tell you where he is, will you come back and see me? Sure. Even if you find Lillian? Sure. His name's Dave Williams. Where will I find him? Where you find everybody who's been nice to Lillian. At the bottom of the ladder. In the mud. And where's the mud he's in? A place called the Gotham Club down on the 4th Street. But don't let the name fool you. It's a flea bag of a flop house. Thanks. Here, uh, maybe you can use this. Twenty dollars. You're a nice guy, Mike. You don't have to tell me what it's for. So you don't have to bother with someone like me anymore. I'm paid off. I told you I'll come back. I mean it. I can straighten out, Mike. Honest. Sure you can. If the bottle you buy has perfume in it. Sure. Perfume. That's a good idea. When you see me again, I'll be like I was before. Sparkling, just like those rhinestones. I can really straighten out. You leave Vera all hope. But you know her hope is as empty as the stock exchange on Sunday morning. You know just what kind of a bottle she's going to buy. 
When you find Dave Williams in that flop house, you begin to understand what she means about Lillian. It's an old story, friend. She made me what I am today. You don't know what Dave Williams was like a year ago, but today he isn't winning any prizes as a lady killer. It's crazy for a guy to believe in a dame. You always find out too late. Isn't what Vera told me. Vera? Yeah, I understand it's even too late for her. I'm only interested in Lillian right now. Forget her. I can try, but her husband won't let me. Husband? So she had one of those, too? Yeah. And he got paid off worse than you did. Somebody killed him because he wanted to find her. Always a smart operator, that Lillian. Nobody who uses a gun instead of his brains is smart. I wonder. What? Who's better off, her husband or me? I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I could use a benefit. Look, just tell me where I can get hold of Lillian and I'll leave you. Get hold of her? <laughs> you got a shovel handy? What do you mean? Lillian's dead. She's been buried in Fairmont Cemetery for over six months. In just a moment, we'll return to That Hammer Guy. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. When Dave Williams tells you that Lillian Martin is dead, the news hits you like a pile driver. But right after that shock, you get the biggest crusher of them all. Just as you get up to leave, you look down at the foot of his bed... And there, peeping out at you like obscene eyes, is a pair of old, beat-up brown and white saddle shoes. You want to turn back and listen to a few of Dave's bones crack, but you hold yourself in and get out. You're waiting outside in your car when he comes out and gets into a cab. You tail him to a Tony apartment building on Park Avenue. You watch him go in, call on the house phone, and then take off. The doorman tells you his call was to the penthouse occupied by a Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Kane. Kane himself greets you at the penthouse door, shows you into the library, and answers your questions with the calm of an efficient surgeon. I'm sorry, Mr. Hammer, but I never heard of this Lillian Martin. I didn't think you did. This, uh, this isn't her kind of world. I suppose we ourselves create our own kind of world. Yeah, well, sometimes you get helped along, whether you like it or not. I happen to believe that we are the masters of our own destinies. Well, maybe you're right, but it's nice to think you've got someone to blame. Just, what do you mean by that? I mean the guy who called up here a few minutes ago. Nobody called here. This phone is used for my business only. Well, for him, the call might have been for pleasure. The call may have come in on the house phone. It did. You could be entirely mistaken, Mr. Hammer. Is your wife around? I don't know. What does she do, fly in and out the window? She's anything but a witch, Mr. Hammer. I didn't mean it that way. I'm sure you didn't. You're perhaps referring to her coming and going without my knowledge. Yeah, that's right, I am. She has a private entrance to her portion of the apartment. Society life is rather boring, unless you have an outside interest such as charity work. I'm afraid Helen has thrown herself completely into her hobby. Hmm. I never met a husband who doesn't know where his wife is. I don't have to know. I trust my wife implicitly. Yeah, well, like you said, people creeled. But I'd still like to know about that phone call. Then why don't you ask my wife? Well, I thought you said you didn't know whether or not she was here. I was only talking in theory. I like people to know how well mated we are. Saves embarrassing talk about the difference in our ages. Mm -hmm. Would you mind calling her in? She's resting in her sitting room. You may go in, if you like. <laughs> You go into the sitting room, and the first feeling you get is the fluffiness of the ruffles and the smoothness of the satin. But Mrs. Helen Kane, for better or worse, is conspicuous by her absence. Then you spot a photograph on an end table. It's a shot of a beautiful, blonde, slow-eyed dish, practically smiling the words of the autograph in the lower right-hand corner. To my darling husband, from Helen... And it's written in the same scrawl it's spelled out to my darling husband from Lillian. Hello, Mike. I came back like I promised, Vera. Thanks. Same song, same pretty song, sophisticated lady. My song. I saw Dave Williams, Vera. Did he ask for me? No, he talked mostly about Lillian. Oh. He said she was dead. 
can't say I'm sorry. But she isn't. Huh? Dead. I found her. You did? What did she say? She said, you did? What did she say? You're laughing at me, Mike. You're nothing to laugh at, Lillian. I'm not that drunk. You got the names mixed up. Mine's Vera. Sure. Vera and a lot of other things, too, including Mrs. Helen Kane. Now who's drinking too much? Look, I saw your photo in your sitting room with your autograph. Oh? Oh. I've heard of Dave's making themselves up, but never down, like you. And you didn't believe Dave about my death six months ago. I almost did, until I saw his saddle shoes under the bed. Is that a mistake? The worst kind. I was shot by a guy wearing saddle shoes. Oh? Oh. It's a pity I didn't have a chance to spend that $20 you gave me. Would have been for perfume. No perfume could kill the stink of death around you. Well, I had to do something about Frank. My new husband would have been horrified if he found out I was a bigamist. From Hayseed to Park Avenue, you worked your way up the ladder, didn't you? The girl's got a right to live. So did Frank Martin. So that dame who was killed in Park Avenue. All she wanted was 500 bucks. She wanted much more from me. What does Dave Williams want from you? All the money he can get. But I don't mind giving it to him. Nice guy, Dave. I'm satisfied. Sure, as long as your husband doesn't find out. He's old, and he doesn't ask questions. He's glad to have me around. On my turn. He's not going to have you around anymore, Vera, or Lillian, or Helen. By the way, which is it, really? Pick anyone, Mike. Any name you call me is all right. Now, you wouldn't like the name I've got picked out for you. Mike. You're thinking of a price. Everybody's got one. Well, this is one time I haven't. You should have believed Dave. Doesn't make any difference now. Doesn't it? Oh. Why did you wait till now to get out that gun? I thought it wouldn't be necessary. Yeah, but it is, huh? Very. You'll never use it. You think I came here alone? I think you're bluffing. Wait and see. Sorry, I can't. You try a bluff and it doesn't work, but something else does. Right on top of the shot, Vera's body jerks like a monkey on a string. And then the string breaks. You swing around and standing behind you in the doorway is Stephen Kane. The only motion is the smoke swirling up from the nose of the gun in his hand. You know how he got here. He followed you. She had it on her terms long enough. Now it's on mine. You switch your eyes from him to the twisted body on the floor. The sophisticated lady. The fight against cancer commands our deepest concern. This disease can strike anyone, and it will strike one in five of us. However, it is a heartening fact that progress is being made against cancer. The gains made through the research, education, and service programs must continue, but need our united support. Because of the serious nature of the problem, and the way each of us may be personally affected, it is important that your response equals the urgency of the challenge. Since cancer can strike anyone, everyone should take proper protective measures. Have regular physical examinations and learn the seven danger signals. For free literature on these seven danger signals, contact your local unit of the American Cancer Society. Education alone could save 70,000 lives annually, which are lost only because treatment is begun too late. Don't fail to do your share in fighting mankind's most dread disease. Cancer strikes one in five. Strike back. Next week at the same time, listen to another suspenseful adventure with America's number one selling mystery character, Mickey Spillane's exciting That Hammer Guy. Larry Haynes is Mike Hammer with Jan Miner as Vera. This program is presented transcribed by the makers of mild, flavorful camels, America's most popular cigarette. The publishers of Esquire magazine and the makers of Kicks, tasty, crispy corn puffs, food for action, in cooperation with the Mutual Network. All names and places in the story were fictitious, and any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy, is a Moss and Lewis production, written by Ed Adamson and directed by Richard Lewis. Ed Ladd speaking. And now, here is Larry Haynes in the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. Like the song says, there's nothing like a day. And there isn't. You know. You've met all kinds.
Lights from the obvious bar room type will stop at nothing to sell a drink to the Park Avenue smoothies will stop at nothing to get their Grecian profiles on the society page. Yeah, that's what you know about dames. So naturally, you're suspicious. Do you have to look at me as if I robbed the bank? Those are the first words you hear from this special representative of the weaker sex. Your tried and true secretary Zelda is gone for the day, and you're loitering around the office, minding your own bottle of bourbon, when in walks this 105 pounds of platinum top curve. You are my camera, aren't you? Well, I'm not the Wizard of Oz. My, my, isn't the man charming? Do you mind if I sit down? If I did. You're, uh, interested in business, Mike? Ah, oh, you picked the wrong day. I just got news that I fell heir to seven best Arabian oil wells, so let's talk pleasure, huh? My husband might object. Yeah, maybe he would if you had a husband. You're very observant, Mike. I should have worn my gloves. I'll take you the way you are. Later, perhaps. I would like to talk business first. If you say so. I do. And I also say there's a thousand dollars in my handbag. I also say that thousand is yours, Mike, if you want it. Uh, what'd you say your name was? I didn't say. Yep. Well, uh, you'd better or we're going to fight each other total strangers. There's no reason at all we should be strangers. I like you, Mike. My name is Laura Fenton. Mm-hmm. Well, look, Laura, uh, I get paid to help solve murders, not commit them. Oh, commit murder? What's so funny? You. You have no sense of humor. Well, I do when I've got something to laugh about. Well, I nearly offered you the $1,000 to look after a young lady from tonight until Monday morning. Mm. You still don't want the money? A grant to take care of a young lady? Well, there may be trouble. I have reason to believe Jolie's life is in danger. A Jolie? That's her name? Yes, she just arrived from Paris. I want to be absolutely certain no harm comes to her. A thousand's a lot of folding money for just uh, bodyguarding. As I said, there may be trouble. Well, Mike? Um, this uh, Jolie. Oh, you're wondering what she looks like. Well... Let me just say she's won several beauty contests in France. Uh, man doesn't work for bread alone. Uh, you understand. I'm staying at the Phoenix Mart. If you come around tonight at, um, say, 10 o'clock, I'll see that you and Jolie get acquainted. Well, that suits me. Oh, but uh, I don't speak a word of French. That's all right. Jolie doesn't speak a word of English. Oh, we'll get along fine, then. Your $1,000 has been this envelope. Count it if you like. Uh, yeah, thanks. I will. It's been a pleasure meeting you, Mike. I'll see you at ten. I'll be there. Oh, there's nothing like a dame. But there's nothing like a guy, either. The prospect of protecting a lovely morsel from Gay Paris doesn't exactly turn your stomach. After all, you're not hired to protect this surely from yourself. So you have a late dinner, go to your place, shine up like a freshman gone to his first prom, and then you drive to the Phoenix Hotel. You stand before the door of Laura Fenton's apartment, make a final tie adjustment, and ring the bell. Well, well, what have we here? Now, this is no French dish grinning at you from the doorway. This is Captain Pat Chambers, and it wouldn't take more than a crepe Suzette to knock you over. Come on in, Mike. What are you doing here, Pat? Well, I was about to ask you that very same question. Quite a coincidence, huh? All right, don't be comical. I'm here on business, I know. Laura Fenton is your client. But she happens to be. Tell me more, Mike. All right, where is she? We made a date for ten tonight. Somebody beat you to it. Who? Never mind. You were about to ask me that very same question. Maybe I was. Mm. So I'm stood up, am I? Yeah, but not in the usual way. Meaning? Meaning look in the bedroom and find out. Only don't touch anything, especially the knife. We don't want that for fingerprints. So you walk in the bedroom alone and look. And you find out, all right. Laura Fenton is sprawled face down across the bed. And the knife Pat Chambers was talking about is buried in the left side of her back. You walk up close and you find out something else. You're not alone in the room. It's a dark, all right. Big and as angry sounding as a losing football coach between the halves. First, you figure he's gone for you, but when you back off, he just stands there growling. Dogs you can do without. And besides, you've seen all the nastiness you had to. Okay, Pat, I've had the 50 cents to her. What happened? I've already told you. Somebody beat you to your date. That's all I noticed. Look, Pat, this isn't so good for the home team. This afternoon, Laura Fenton walks in on me as alive as dynamo wire. Tonight, she's a dead corpse. 
Give me the rundown, huh? As much as I can. The call came into my office around nine. The room clerk here. Somebody in a hotel complained about a dog barking. On investigation, they found her. By 9.45, I talked myself sick and come up with nothing. You walked in at 10. Now you know as much as I do. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you know more. Well, now, look what I hold out on you, Pat. You don't want me to answer that, do you? No, not this time, but I'm not. Why should this time be different? It is. Take my word. Uh, you got a cigarette? Sure. Hey, thanks. She came to your office this afternoon. Around five. Why? Now, that's a silly question. Why does anyone? She figured someone was out to get her. Not her. Some doll just came over from Paris. Oh, she wants you to look out for this doll. Yeah, that's right. From now until Monday morning. You gonna do it? If I can find her, yeah. I get paid for a job, I do a job. Mike. Yeah. Maybe I can help you. Laura Fenton didn't happen to mention the French doll's name, did she? Yeah, she did. Uh, the name's Jolie. What? Jolie. She didn't give it a rest. <laughs> Find her, all right. The room clerk told me who she was. Who? Well, you already met her. What? Inside, Mike. Huh? The poodle in <laughs> just come over from France, and her name is Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to That Hammer Guy. a young lady from Paris, and it turns out she's a French poodle. Won several beauty contests on the continent. Very funny, Pat. Very, very funny. Doesn't speak a word of English. Now, you're positively side-spreading, Lieutenant. <laughs> I've had so much fun since, since dear old Grandma <laughs> broke her leg. Why, Mike, how could you be so bitter? <laughs> now, the last on you, all right. But like you told Pat, somebody pays for a job, you follow through, no matter how embarrassing. So you clip the leash on and slink back across town to your place. Uh, pickles and milk go better together than you and a French poodle with a ribbon in its head. On the way up in the elevator, the night man starts to make a crack, but has a fast change of mind when he spots the black scowl you're wearing. And no sooner do the both of you get into your apartment when Jolie pulls a fog. Guys, now look at that, Pants. Don't start teasing. Here, life isn't all champagne. I believe the animal is referring to me, but I'm going to introduce myself to Baldwin's name, Let him a Baldwin. Nice girl, easy girl. How did you get in here? Now, that's a good dog. How did I get in? <laughs> Simple, sir. Open the door and walked in. But it was open, was it not, Mr. Hammer? You should be more careful, sir. Other visitors might not be quite as gentle as myself. <laughs> oh, so your name's Latimer Baldwin. You wish you to know more about me. I wish. I, Mr. Hammer, am a fancier. Fancier than what? 
That's a joke, I take it. I'm a fancier of canines, and both a breeder and a trainer. Okay, so you've gone to the dog. <laughs> Definitely. Shall we sit down, Mr. Hammer? The sooner we settle our business, the sooner you can be alone with Jolie. Oh, you know this mutt's name? Know it. Of course, Mr. Hammer, that's why I'm here. Will you have one of these, sir? Turkish blend. Very mild. Never mind cigarettes. What's why you're here? <laughs> Mr. Hammer, I see you're a devoted man. I like that. You do. I really do, sir. A man devoted to his work can be trusted. Now, listen, Baldwin. All right, sir. Why I'm here, you say? The animals. Why I'm here. The dog, Jolie, and her most attractive mistress, Laura Fenton. God rest her soul. God rest her soul. <laughs> devoted, sir. And suspicious. I like that, too. Well, you know, Laura's dead. I do that. Dead, murdered, a knife protruding from her lovely, supple body. You see, I am devoted, too, Mr. Hammer. Keep talking. You're right, sir, and I will. We'll attack the very heart of the matter. The deceased told me to come to you on one condition. That condition being the event of her death. Go on. Should that event take place before Monday morning, I wish to present you with your instructions. Instructions? Precisely the word Miss Fenton used. You're sure you won't smoke? Yeah, I'm sure. Too bad. A really very mild blend. Well, Mr. Hammer, I put this to you man to man. Miss Fenton presented you with a sum of money. One thousand dollars, I believe. Are we together so far? You're carrying the ball. <laughs> Indeed I am. Very neatly put, Mr. Hammer. Oh, please, applause turns my head. And for the sum of money you were to take care of this young lady from tonight until Monday morning. Are we together? We're together. <laughs> In fact, Baldwin, I'm a lap ahead of you right now. Oh? Yeah, if you're here to see whether or not I ducked out on the job, you're wasting your time. When I'm paid for my services, I follow through, corpses or not. <laughs> you're an honorable man, sir. No one would deny it. But I'm not here in the capacity you mentioned. No, indeed. What capacity? I mean, Mr. Hammer, simply to see that you follow out your instructions. And those are that you show Jolie personally. Show Jolie? Show it at home. To whom, sir? Why, to the judges, of course. Miss Fenton didn't tell you? Tell me what. My dear Mr. Hammer, this French poodle is a prized possession. Already she has won over 20 blue ribbons in Europe. Now she's entered in the annual dog show Monday at the garden. She's what? Entered in the best of all breeds class, sir. And you, Mr. Hammer, have now the signal honor of showing her. <laughs> So the dog laughs still on you. But you're not going to take it lying down in the manger. This, uh, Lattimore Baldwin character starts for the gate, but you're not letting him out of the kennel till you growl out a few opinions of your own. It's trying to understand, Mr. Hammer. It is imperative that you show Jolie. Now, uh, you understand. I'm not making a monkey out of myself at any dog show. I'll be there, I assure you, as a mentor to lend a hand to guide you. Now, you'll be there, pal, but I won't. Sir, I quote your own words. When I'm paid for my services, I follow through. Your very own word. Okay, but I'm not eating them right now. I must be on my way. I'll let them know. Your phone, Mr. Hammer. I'm not going to... Good night, sir. I'll be seeing you at the show. <laughs> Definitely. Now, Baldwin. Uh... Yeah. This is Monsieur Hammer. It is. It's urgent, monsieur, that I see you immediately. Laura Fenton asked me to call. That's so? Oui. Well, for your information, sweetheart, Laura Fenton is dead. I know it is. That is why I must see you right away. My life, it is in danger now. Oh, you don't say. It is no joking, madam, monsieur. Do you know where Bedford Street is? What if I do? I am at the number 205 Bedford. Can you be in here in half of an hour? I'll be in bed in half of an hour unless you tell me who this is. Oh, I'm so sorry. It is only that I have been so... Or how you say, upset. My name is your hammer is Jolie. Well, not only are you unhappy about one, Jolie, now it turns out there are two. Well, you parked the cane on one with the super down in the basement, and then you scoot over to Bedford Street. When you jab the doorbell at number 205, you're ready for about anything. Mr. Hammer. Mm. You're Jolie. We oui. Come in, please. May I take your hand? You won't be staying that long. Oh, I was hoping you would. See, I have everything prepared. Mm -hmm. For a little bite. The sandwiches and coffee on the table over there. Oh. Nice place. I am so glad you're poor. And I am so glad you arrived. Yeah? May we? If we are going to be in business together, we would be well acquainted. Is it not so? Oh. 
Now we're going in business together, huh? You're, uh, how do you say, out to do business, are you not, monsieur? Sit down, please. Some coffee? Is that the best you have to offer? It is at this minute. All right, I'll take some. Sugar? Anything but poison. Would I poison you? Would you? You make the talk with me. Now, what are you making with me besides time? Your coffee, monsieur. I changed my mind. Uh, tell me, Jolie, uh, just how much did you plan for us to get acquainted? Oh, I do not know, monsieur. I like to allow things to go their own way, don't you? You won't change your mind again about the coffee? Not tonight. Well, this is, um, uh, how you say... You say cozy. We, oui. oui. or maybe just a little too cozy. Eh? Oui. Of course, the variation is interesting. Coffee instead of liquor. All right, sister, what do you want? Pardon. Come on, all this set up, everything so, how you say, cozy. What do you want? What's the bottom line? I don't believe I follow, monsieur. Oh, sure you do. You follow just fine. In the first place, your name's not Jolie. In the second place, your accent is as phony as a ward heel has promised. And in the third place, you and I could get a lot better acquainted if that clown in the next room would keep his nose out of the door. <laughs> I'd like to right away, Mr. Hammer. I think you got brains. I have, about dames like you. No guy's got brains about women. Okay, Carlos, come on in. Yes, I come. Shake hands with Carlos Rivera, Mr. Hammer. Uh, and the accent's no phony. No phony, I assure you, Mr. Hammer. Okay, no phony. Now about the pitch. You have something Carlos and I want, and we're willing to pay well for it. Gee, very well. Maybe not well enough. Well, there's no sense bargaining. I'll give you our top figure right away. It's 25000 25000 you say? Huh? That's right, and that's top. Is it a deal, senor? It might be if I knew what you wanted. Senor Hammer. Oh, wait, Carlos. You've no idea what we're talking about, I suppose? None. We're talking about the package Laura Fenton gave you in your office today. Oh, that. Give us that package and you'll have 25000 Sorry, no God. You must have it. The package wasn't in Laura's apartment. Having killed her, you know that. You said it, not us. Well, no matter who said it or who has the package, you're both wasting your time. Mr. Hammer, we're trying to do this the pleasant way. Don't push us. Who's pushing? You won't give us the package? You couldn't pay my price even if I did have it. Carlos? Si? Mr. Hammer is having trouble with his memory. Help him. Oh, I wouldn't try, Carlos, believe me. Knives don't go so easy into my bag, so you'd better not... Oh. Oh. You zigged, Carlos, when you should have zagged the dame. You had it right smack in the back of the skull. You wake up screaming. Your head is swimming around like a fish in a ball. And your face feels as wet. Something soft, moist, and mushy is making slobbery laps against your cheek. It turns out to be showy. That French poodle is making a St. Bernard grandstand play for a very amused audience. <laughs> Man's best friend is his poodle. Uh, never stop having fun, do you, Fat? Well, maybe it'll be even funnier when you give me the details. Um... Did you bring me back to my apartment here for this priceless repartee? I found you here. Huh? Got a call from the super. He saw a guy lamb it out of here. Get him? No, but the question now is, does the guy get what he came for? What do you mean? Well, take a look around. Nice mishmash. What was he looking for? How should I know? Look, Mike, I'm warning you. No holding back. I've got no client to protect. She's dead, so why should I hold back? All I know is... The Zephyr package. Which had in it? I don't know. Mike? Where, Pat? But I do know it was worth offering me 25000 bucks for it. And that's all you do know? Oh, except for the woman. Now it comes. What woman? The one who was with the guy who shut this place down. The super said he was alone. Come on, what about the dame? There's nothing more I can tell you, Pat, on it. Then who can? Maybe she can herself. So you take Pat Chambers back to 205 Bedford Street. If you're good and lucky, you figure you'll get both Carlos and the dame. But you only get the dame. And even that isn't lucky. Because the dame is dead. In just a moment, we'll return to that hammer guy. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery that hammer guy. <laughs> Dame looks up at you from the same couch where you sat next to me. And the gape of terror 
terrible shock on her face tells you that her last living moment was the worst surprise of her life. When Pat turns her over, the handle of the blade points like the finger of death. Same kind of knife that killed Laura Fenton. Mm -hmm. In the same spot. What did you say this guy's name was? She called him Carlos Rivera. Then Rivera's our boy, all right. Had a falling out with his partner, figure. Figures. But over what? Could be anything from diamonds to gold. Uh, you're figuring way ahead of me, Pat. Diamonds or gold if this dame was running through the form. Well, you know who she is. Never forget a face I see on a bulletin board. Her name's Rita Shearer. She's wanted on a smuggling rap. Well, so her partner got her first. He can have her now. Well, Mike, there's nothing else you can do. Oh, I don't know. And what's that supposed to mean? That show at the Garden Monday. What about it? I'm going to be there, Pat, to uh, see a dog about a killer. <laughs> Monday, you and Jolie turn up at the garden and meet out of a ball game. For a couple of hours, you don't go upstairs to the floor where the four-legged eyebrows put on the dog. You stay downstairs in the basement where the kennels are. Downstairs, the place has all the sound effects of a deceptive cat's nightmare. It really isn't too bad, Mr. Hammer, once you're used to it. Once I get used to it. Once you walk out of that phone upstairs, a great change will come over you. Now, look, Paul, when I'm no dog lover, believe me, you'll become one. And you'll be very proud of Julie when she wins. Pretty sure she's going to win, huh? Can't lose her. She is gone. Tell me just one thing. Why do they trim her that way with those crazy pom poms? Uh, uh, I'll bet the dog doesn't approve. <laughs> I see you're becoming sentimental over her already. Ah, uh -huh. just embarrassed for her. It'll be different upstairs. Wait for me. I'll be watching you from the stairs. And I guarantee you, sir, you'll be as proud as a peacock. I don't think you'll be watching me, Baldwin. I beg your pardon? What were you doing before? Before? When you uh, sent me upstairs to find the papers for Jolie's entrance. I? Why, you know perfectly well I took her for a stroll. Yeah, but why? Why? Well, because she was skittish. You could see that. I could see you were, too, Baldwin. But you were much easier when you brought her back, weren't you? Sure, I failed to follow you. Yeah, but I didn't fail to follow you when you went for that walk. Huh? And I saw you change the dog's collar, too. The one she's wearing now is worth only a couple of bucks. And what about the one you took off? How much was that worth, Baldwin? Fifty thousand? Hundred? More? Mr. Hammer, you're a gentleman of this man. Baldwin, you're a stinking killer. But that shouldn't preclude us from coming to an understanding. Like what? The diamonds in the car are worth in the neighborhood of 200000 I'm sure we can make some satisfactory arrangements. Uh, but Carlos, where does he come in? He went out. His body will never be found. Took care of all three of your friends, didn't they? Necessary, you know. No, I didn't. No. They weren't friends at all. They all wanted to cheat me out of my share. Well, Mr. Hammer, what do you say to a very generous offer on my part? Uh, I'd like to accept, but uh, what will surely think of me? The alternative, then, is very nasty for you. Perhaps not, but I can't think of any other alternative. Does this stimulate your thinking, sir? Are you trying to kid, Baldwin? You wouldn't use that here. I'm not kidding, in the slightest sense. The shot will turn this place into an even matter bedlam. My escape under such conditions will not be too difficult. I really think you're going to try it, huh? No doubt about it, sir. I'm going to try it right here and... It's Jolie thinking of early season to fall in his leg. You grab this gun fast and then squat him with it across the jaw. Baldwin goes down like a sack of dog wheat. That chambers comes in through the crowd. He looks down at Baldwin while you give the Legion of Honor embrace to one of France's greatest heroes. You were right, Mike. What am I ever wrong? Ah, it's a nice girl. Tonight it's steak for dinner. Nice, nice girl. So all of a sudden you're a dog lover. Now look, Pat, this happens to be the girl of my dream. All right, all right. Come on down to the office, make out your report, and then you two can be along. Uh, you'll have to wait for the report, Pat. Why? Well, uh, Jolie and I have a date upstairs on the floor. And, pal, a week on the show. <laughs> You show him all right. Jolie struts around the judging ring as proud as a Republican last election day. And you? Well, you're not exactly heavy footed yourself. Baldwin was right about one thing the big change has come over you. Yep, that little hound has more savoir faire in her than ten queens. And when the judge hands you the blue ribbon, you look down at Jolie and you think, oh, yes, sir, there certainly is something about a dame.
now, here is Larry Haynes as Mickey Spillane's That Hammer Guy. <laughs> mind walking down a dark, lonely street with a guy, but when he stays behind you in the shadows all the way, that's where you draw the line. Why he's picked you to tell, you can't guess. So when the footsteps behind are close enough, you slam on your brakes and wheel around. For a second you think you'd see him, but it's only the wind playing kickball with yesterday's headlines. You start ambling again. As you head for the corner, you keep close to the warehouse wall. The steps stay behind you like an evil echo. And then when you turn the corner, you're sliding close to the building and wait to make your play. Oh, all right, little Sir Echo. Hey, uh, I'll break it off if you try to keep wrestling. All right, all right. All right, up against the wall. What do you want from me? You put the question right out of my mouth. Uh, I don't like being tailed, and I like it even less when I don't know why. I... I don't understand what you're talking about. Oh, I may be bouncing your head off the wall a couple of times. I'll help you understand. Oh, wait, please. Oh, I detect a note of understanding in your voice now. All right. All right, I was following you. Why? I need a protection. Why? It's the truth. You were the only person around, so I thought if I stayed close to you, nothing had happened. Nothing like what? Look, I can't stay here. He'll get me if we do. Who? The one who got the assignment. Okay, Mr. Bones, I give up. What assignment? This isn't a minstrel show, and I'm not crazy. I'm talking about the man who was assigned to kill me. You look into the little guy's pasty face and you can see he's not kidding. He's as scared as a seven-year-old lost in a graveyard at night. In your kind of business, you develop a sixth sense. And it's telling you right now that you and the little guy are a target that are a blindfold pacifist couldn't miss. You take him to a diner down the street. After you order a couple of cups of java, he tells you his name is Pete Morrison. And the counterman slides the coffee in front of him. He huddles over it like it's the last cup of soup in a snowbound igloo. Well, I'm chilled to the bone, Mr. Hammond. All right, drink your coffee, Morrison. <laughs> I wish I was home in bed. If you stayed there in the first place, maybe there wouldn't be anybody gunning for you. Go ahead, have some more coffee. No, I can't. I, I had enough. Thanks. Why is this guy hunting for you, Martin? I'd rather not talk about it now. Okay, I'll talk to you about it when we get home. Where do you live? Look, I don't want to bother you anymore. Thanks. What's the matter? That man. Mm -hmm. Over there, looking in the window. He's the one? Yeah, I'm sure. He's coming in. All right. Reach over for that pepper shaker. Get back to what I tell you. Hurry up. Now take this paper napkin. Unscrew the cap of the shaker. Pour the pepper into the napkin. Go ahead. Now keep the napkin in your hand. Look. He came in, I told you he would. He tries anything, toss the pepper in his face, and then just get out of here fast. I'll take care of it. Where'll I go? My place. 867 East 75th Street, apartment 3B. Here are the keys. You got the address? 867 East 75th Street. I don't know how to thank I'll think of a way. I'll... Hey, wait a minute. What? The guy who just came in, I've seen him around. You have? You bet I have. He's a plain clothesman on this street. Now, come on, Morrison. What's the idea? I'm afraid the idea is this. What? Morrison slings the pepper in your face. Your eyeballs feel like they've been skinned, salted, and put on a frying pan to burn. The counterman and the cops help you get your sight back, but when you have it, what you don't see makes you want to turn in your head for new parts. Morrison is gone. And you're the prize sucker in a game that nobody but him seems to know how to play. After you shake off the cops' questions, you head for home to bathe your smarting eyes. You get the pass key from the super. When you walk in, you find the place lit up like a Hollywood drugstore grand opening. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Hammond. And all the lights in your brain flash on when you see Morrison sitting in your easy chair. Honest. I'm sorry about what happened. Oh, you've no idea how sorry you're going to be. Look, I had to do what I do. Oh, sure, sure. And I'm going to have to do what I'm going to do to you. Oh, please. Let, let me explain. All right, you got all of three seconds. You really did help save my life. You can forget that stuff. Since when a cop hiring themselves out as gunsels. Believe me, I had to get away from there. Oh, sure, I believe you. I didn't have to come here and tell you this. Why do you think I did? Well, you tell me, Morrison. Because I feel you're the one person I can trust. Uh-uh. That's not good enough. You're too full of tricks. I'm sorry if that pepper hurt your eyes. Yeah. 
They hurt me more from seeing you here. I just had to get away in a hurry. And the only way was to make a stir in that diner. You had to get away from home. The one who was assigned to kill me. Oh, we're back to that routine. I'm telling you the truth. You still haven't told me who had the assignment. I don't know who he is. I just know what he looks like. And he was in that diner. Now, now don't tell me about that cop. I didn't mean the cop. He was already in the diner when we got there. He was sitting in the booth just behind us. Okay, so why did he get the assignment? I don't know. Who gave it to him? I don't know. Maybe you mean you're not telling. Well, I... I can't tell you. Well, that's more like it. Maybe later I'll, I'll tell you the whole story. Maybe later it'll be too late. Well, I'll just have to take that chance. All right, so you won't tell me. I can't help myself. Maybe you'll tell somebody else. Who are you calling? Somebody who can help you help yourself. Hello, uh, let me have Captain Chambers in the side. Tell him it's my reason to this. All right, why not? Please hang up. I can't hear a word you're saying. You've got to put that phone down. That is a bet. You've been very nice to me, but I'm warning. Relax. You'll last much longer this way. I'm sorry, Mr. Hammer, but you asked for this? No. Oh. Hello, Mike. Hello. Hello, Mike. Yes? Hey, that's not Mike. No, sir. Who are you? Mr. Hammer can't come to the phone. What's this about? Where's Hammer? He can't speak to you. Why not? He can't speak to you because he's either unconscious or dead. <laughs> Back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. You're neither unconscious nor dead. You've been expecting the crusher from Mars, and so when it comes, you roll with it like a kid tumbling over in a playpen. You've decided to go along with Morrison's game to find out what the score adds up to. After he takes off, you spring to life and start tailing. He leads you downtown to the village and finally ducks into an old, broken-down apartment building. You get inside fast enough to see him take the stairs to it and clip a knock on the door at the top of the flight. After the door closes behind him, you start up for that apartment. You're putting your foot on the last step when... Where do you think you're going? The big load of lard with the gravel voice steps out from the shadows and roadblocks you with a pair of hairy meat hooks that look like they've just been taken out of the smoke room. You know what? What? I don't like you. You're in my way. People I don't like get me mad. Well, be my guest. Be my analyst. They'll cure that. And when I get mad, I get physical. So? So? What? When I get physical, I throw things downstairs. Things like you. <laughs> if I go down, I'm having a guess. Why not? You know what? I don't like you either. I'm not getting physical. Go You're right down to the landing where the gorilla lies twisted like a soggy pretzel that's been floating in beer too long. You pull a mean looking rod out of a shoulder holster. The trigger is scratched with and shaved for fast action. You break open the gun and empty it of the snub nosed slugs. Then you shove it back in the holster and go back to that apartment. The nameplate on the door says Pete and Lenore Russo. Well, now at least you know Marsden's real name. You keep your finger jammed into the doorbell, but you get no results from that. You try the door, no results from that either. It's different with a back door that leads into the kitchen. The apartment is as empty as the feeling in the pit of your stomach. You plop into a living room chair and light a smoke. And just as you're settling back for a few black thoughts, the front door opens. Who are you? What are you doing here? She's a slight whisper, a woman plain as a farmer's Sunday suit, and there's a sad prayer in her eyes. Who do you want? Why are you here in my apartment? Where's Pete? Who? You know who your husband. I haven't seen him. I followed him here. I don't know where he is. But you do know who he's running from. Why don't you leave him alone? He wouldn't let me alone. He was in a spot and I was around at the time. He asked me for help. You're Mike Hammer? That's right. 
Please tell me about you. We owe you thanks. Now, never mind the thanks. I'll take an explanation instead. I can't explain. I don't know myself. Well, try anyway. I can't understand any of it, Mr. Hammer. Pete never harmed anyone before. All our life we've been decent, quiet people. And now this... It's like a nightmare. Pete couldn't have done what they said he did. Maybe you want to believe that. You met him. He's kind and gentle. He never touched guns. He was held up twice driving his cab and never lifted a finger. He had to make the money good to the company, too. Mm. Well, he could have gotten mixed up with the wrong people. It happens. Guy can go through his whole life playing it straight, and one day a fast idea hits him. Not my husband. I only know what I see. And the people who so I saw was running from the kind of thing you don't get if you keep your nose clean. I told you I don't know anything about that. Look, there was a guy outside when I came up the stairs. You could tell the kind of business he was in by the gun he carried. What do you mean? The polite word for him is assassin. Petey? Yeah, Petey. And if I don't find him before that gunsel does, you'd better think of buying a few black dresses. <laughs> Lenore Russo doesn't have anything else for you besides tears, so you leave a pouring them into a wet handkerchief and go back down to your car. Just as you're about to open the door, you see that someone's sitting behind the wheel. The last report on you was you were either dead or unconscious. Pat Chambers watches you get in beside him like you're the prize exhibit in the snake farm. What's the gag? Gag? Uh, what are you doing here? I was just about to ask you the same question. For me? Well, I'm sitting here talking to a guy named Pat Chambers. How about you? You're as funny as a last meal on execution night. I want straight answers from you, and right now. Oh, now, Pat, that isn't very friendly talk. I don't feel friendly. If I know you at all, you're mixed up in a deal that can get you in a lot of trouble. Official trouble. Are you talking about Pete Russo? I'm talking about Pete Russo. I want to find him. So do I. The line forms right behind me. And I intend to find him before he does any more harm. Oh, now, Pat, what kind of harm can a mild guy like that do? You sound like you don't read the paper. I look, Pat. All I know is that somebody's after him. He used me for protection and then got away before I had a chance to find out what it's all about. So that's all you know, that somebody's after him. Right. And you don't know who it is. Got any ideas? <laughs> you're breaking me up. Big joke. Listen, Mike, if you're serious about I this... I wouldn't kid you, Pat. What's the story about this guy? You sure you're not trying to pull a block? Now, come on, what's it all about? Remember Johnny Farrell? Uh, how could anybody forget that two-bit gangster? He's a three-time loser. One more strike and he's out for life. Yeah, you picked him up on a manslaughter rap a couple of weeks ago. I thought that was it. It was until a murder gun was brought in, and guess who showed up with it? Not Pete Russo. None else. And with an airtight story about how he shot the guy with it during a fight. Mm -hmm. And that got Johnny Farrow off the hook. Should have made him a bosom buddy. What'd they give him? Three to five years, and you thought Russo was running from some killer. I don't get it. Well, if you're serious about this, I have news for you. Yesterday, Pete Russo escaped from custody. And the people he's running away from are the police. You tell Pat everything you know, and he finally lets you go after he wants you to lay off. You've got nothing on your mind but a merry-go-round full of spinning questions. So you go up to your place to sit around and try to think them through. You're batting a big fat zero when the phone call comes. I'm calling for Pete, Mr. Hammer. He decided that he wants to see you. You want to hang the phone back up in Lenore Russo's face, but the sight of her wringing the tears from her handkerchief keeps you from doing it. We decided we can trust you, Mr. Hammer. You're the only friend we have. What does he want to see me about? I don't know. It's something he won't even tell me. Where do I meet him? He'll meet you at your apartment in exactly two hours. You want to call Pat Chambers and tell him about it, but the big holes in the story need filling out. So you decide to see Russo alone first. The two hours can be an awful long wait, so you go down to a nearby bar to break up the monotony. Just when you get comfortably settled, you smell her perfume cutting into the liquor you're raising to your lips. Mm. You think it's safe? I bet you don't go for thrills. She's an invitation to a dream in blue, from her clinging sheath of a dress to her sleepy, smiling eyes. You can put it back on. Hey, what? Your hat. Then the stool next to you will be empty so I can sit down. Well, nothing would make that boy stool happier. Thanks. I, um, hope you don't mind my talking to you like this. Why not? You're my idea of company. Well, that's very good. Can I buy you a drink? I have one, thing. Have another. On me. Oh, would you hand me my bag? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I'll take a rain check on your offer, if you don't mind. I like men with strong attitudes. But this is an occasion, so why not celebrate? 
Oh, your birthday. <laughs> we women like to forget our birthdays. Let's say the occasion is just for it. The first time we've met. My name's Rita. What's yours? My camera. What about that drink? Ah, uh, sorry. I gotta meet somebody in a few minutes. Oh, I'm jealous. It's a man. You know when? You're very hard to resist. Well, then you buy me a drink. Sorry. I thought you said I was hard to resist. Not that hard. You know what's in my purse? An invitation. For you. Okay, let's have it. Not here. That is unless I have to. Meaning? It's a gun. And when I squeeze the trigger with my finger, there's hardly any resistance at all. In just a moment, we'll return to That Hammer Guy. out of the bar and into the car. She directed to the other side of town and into a room that's furnished in the best of taste. The best, uh, that is, except for the occupant. Thanks, Rita. You don't have to be told your host's name. You've seen Johnny Farrow's face before. It's made across plenty of newspapers. He found me very hard to resist. Sit down, Hammer. You're going to be here for quite a while. What do you want with me, Farrow? You know what? I don't like you. Oh, neither did one of your boys. He's got good taste. I'd like to give you a taste of my fist in your face like I gave him. Tough boy, Johnny. I could tell the way he took his drink. Shut up. Don't be a boor. I said shut up. I like you, Mike. We ought to have that drink someday. If he lives that long. Oh, now, look, if you brought me here to witness a family squabble, I've got other important things to do. You want that drink? What I have for him, he won't be able to drink. What do you want from me? I want to know what your angle is, Hammer. Now, who's got angles? I'm not interested in any angles. How about curves? Oh. Just one second, Reed. And just one little take. Take it easy, Farrow. Save your fight with your girlfriend for later when I'm not around, huh? All right, Hammer. I'm more interested in working on you right now anyway. Save your energy. Tell me what I'm supposed to know, and I'll be glad to talk it over with you. You talk. I'll listen. Well... Look, I told you, I don't know why you got me up here. Think a little harder. It'll come to you. You can't squeeze blood out of a stone. Oh, you're not a stone. And I know a few squeeze plays that could make a jackass sing. You thought of a donkey serenade? How about it, Emma? One way or the other. Your phone is ringing. This kind of information I can live without. Keep him covered, Rita. Of course I will. Yeah. You did? What? When? Good. I'll be in touch. Well, how do you like that? The suspense is killing me. Who was it? Rita, why did you bring this guy up here? Mm. The hammer, there must have been some mistake. I can think of a couple that kept you out of a cage. Rita's a foolish girl. I send her out for a pack of smokes, and she comes back with a guy like you. I should be jealous. I don't get it. Full of whims, is all. Rita, I got no reason to discuss anything with Mr. Hammer. But you told me to... Full of whims, up to her eyeballs. <laughs> She drinks, you know. Now listen, John. You mean I'm free to go? As free as the birds, Mr. Hammer. Just as free as the little birds. You're curious about the phone call that made Farrow's attitude change so completely. But you're not taking time to find out what it is. The two hours are up and you want to get to your place to meet Pete Russo. When you get there, you see that Pete got to his appointment early enough. Just in time, in fact, to wind up dead on your floor. You call Pat Chambers and tell him where he can end his search. I want you to stick around, but you've got important business. The kind of business you can only settle with Johnny Farrell. First, you've got a few places to go to. And what you find out makes all the crazy pieces of the jigsaw puzzle come together like... like the broken rock at the bottom of a mountain slide. And when they do, it's even crazier than when they were apart. You try Farrell's apartment, but nobody's there. Your luck is just as bad every place else. And the bad luck holds until you see her again. 
sitting at the end of the bar where she first missed you. Lucky I came back here, Mike. I'm beginning to like you. I was looking for you. Now that you found me. How about that celebration? Do you want to buy me that drink? A big celebration. Just you and me. Uh, what's there to celebrate this time? Hmm. You got any ideas? The kind I have, you can't print. Well, then whisper them to You me. can't whisper about murder, Rita. It screams all over. For me, honey, you're strictly murder. I'm talking about the real thing. It can be the real thing with us. Even if it's for a little while, Mike. Uh, you don't seem to know what I'm talking about. You can't fool little Rita. You can't resist me. Oh, what gives you that idea? Oh, it takes courage to go up against Johnny Farrell for a woman. Real courage. Lots of guys tried it. How'd they make up? Lots of guys. Now I could have my pick. Why'd you settle for a bum like Farrell? He gives me everything I want. And you don't care how he gets it. Could you give me everything I want, Mike? Everything that's coming to you. And give me a drink. So we can celebrate. Not here. You're going to take me to Johnny Farrell. Why him? He bores me. Come on, let's go, Rita. You know where he lives. I took you up there. Remember? He's not there. But I've got a pretty good idea where he is, and that's where we're going. Where, Mike? Your place, Rita. Uh Uh-huh. No sale. Remember what you said about me not being able to resist you? Well. Well, this time the tables are turned. That uh, bulge in my coat pocket is a gun. And uh, the trigger squeezes just as easily as yours. All the way up to her apartment, she keeps looking at you with her sleepy eyes like you're the first date she ever had. But your business with Sparrow comes first. So when she lets you in the door, you're disappointed to see that the place is dark. She uh, switches on a light and smiles at you again. You see? Johnny isn't here. She sits on the edge of the couch with plenty of room for you. We're all alone. And you know what, Mike? I like it. Oh, Farrell will be back. I can wait. You don't have to wait long, Emma. And put your gun down before you turn it on. Okay, Emma. Where's it on? You're looking for me? Oh, I'm just the advance guard. There's an army of lookers behind me. I can't imagine why. Get to the point. What do you want to see me about? So he gave you everything you want, Rita. No, no fight, boys. The neighbors are unfriendly. Oh, if they knew you kept snakes like this rattler up here, they'd be unfriendlier. A bullet in your windpipe could cut that kind of talk off real fast. Sure, then you couldn't find out what I found out about you, Farrell. I can postpone the shot. Go ahead. Oh, Mike, be a good boy and hand me my purse. My nose is shining. Hey, you take a lousy time to make up. Come on, Hammer. I'm running out of patience. And you're running out of luck, too, Farrell. Meaning? Meaning Pete Russo. He never killed that guy. He confessed. Should I tell you why? That's what I'm waiting for. The cops had you for that shooting. The cops had me wrong. Yeah, but you couldn't afford another trip upstate. It would have been your fourth offense. It would have been life for you. So Pete Russo took the rap for you, right? Okay, you're yeah, right. It was an easy way for him to pick up 15 grand. It was a good deal for Russo. Yeah, but you had another deal, didn't you, Farrow? You got him out of custody. You couldn't trust him. He might have changed his mind in a year or two and talk. So you helped him escape so you could kill him. Kill him? Yeah, that's right, Rita. But you don't care how Farrow makes his money. You don't care about anything as long as you keep sitting pretty. I didn't know Russo was dead. That's what you meant by murder. Murder. But it wasn't hard for your boyfriend. Nothing is too hard when you've got to protect yourself. Yeah, but the protection gets more and more expensive as you go along. How much do you have? Oh, I wasn't thinking of a price. I was. The price is cheap. Just one lead slug. Johnny. You can wait outside, Rita. No. Okay, then stay and watch. I'm staying. But I'm not watching. <laughs> All right, I'll take that gun, Farrell. Oh. It's a pleasure taking advantage of a wounded guy like you, Farrell. Oh. Now get back there. Oh. I couldn't let him do it, Mike. Rita, so help me. You're my kind of guy. Oh, thanks, baby, but I'm still a little particular. No dice for nothing, Rita. You think it's for nothing. You think that's funny, Farrell? Listen to this. I checked with a doctor who took care of Russo. Nobody but he knew why a guy with a sweet wife would be willing to go to jail. You were worried about him changing his mind and talking in a year or so. Well, he didn't have a year to last. What? The doctor didn't even give him six months. Six months? That's right, Farrell. Go ahead and laugh about that. There is Ted DeCorsia in the Mickey's Belaine mystery, Fat Hammer Guy. <laughs> Central is as crowded as a Glasgow department store on Fristdale Day. You're broken feeling it through the sardine packed to your train when you're intercepted by somebody's suitcase parked smack in your path and down you go. 
You sprawled out like a frog on a detective board. Oh, I'm sorry. The somebody who belongs to the suitcase is as slick as a European sports car. She's one of the few dames you've seen with that new short haircut who doesn't look like a refugee from an Italian movie. Well, I hope you didn't injure anything. Uh, just my dignity. I'm really sorry. Forget it. Those things happen. But if I could have gotten a red cap, it wouldn't have. I suppose I just have to manage myself. Oh, wait a minute. Let me handle them for you. Oh, please. I, I don't want to trouble you. All my troubles should be like this. Uh, what train? The key. Oh, my train, too. So it's no trouble at all. Well, it's very nice of you. Yeah, let me take that one, too. Uh, no, thank you. I can manage it. But it's the biggest... No, really, as I said, I can't manage. And she does manage the big piece of luggage all the way to her compartment and with surprisingly little effort. You figure this chick can take care of herself in the clinches. You also figure the trip to Chicago isn't going to be as dull as you expected. Thank you very much, Mr. My camera. And uh, so far, I only know you by the initials on your bag. And I can't go around calling you F.D. can I? The F is for fame, the D for Dorado. Fame? Hmm? It means holy. Fame, nice name. Oh, uh, by the way, my room mat is in the next car. Oh, that's nice. Did I say something wrong? Well, I have no objection. It's just that my husband not. Oh, Mrs. Dorado. Mm -hmm. My husband could be along any moment. He was late. I'm sorry. Well, uh, look, uh, maybe the three of us can uh, have a drink later in the club car. No, it would be better if we should meet again. Pretend you don't know me. Later, you're in the club car, putting your own personal brand on a couple of ponies of bourbon. There are some things about this dame that have made you as curious as a small town gossip. First, that big grip she insisted on carrying herself. Second, the fact that she told you she was Mrs. Dorado and she was traveling with her spouse, when the conductor told you she's Miss Dorado and she's traveling solo. The third thing is the swarthy, chunky guy in the gray snap rim hat. He's tailed you since you left Fane's compartment. And, except to, to order a drink, he hasn't taken his eye off. When the curiosity gets to itch like a rash, you go back to her compartment. Yeah? Is this Fane Dorado's compartment? Try what about it? Well, uh, is she here? She's here. Well, I, I want to talk to her. Oh, go ahead, talk. Huh? I'm Fane Dorado. You said you want to talk to me, so talk. <laughs> For all you know, this dame could be Fane Dorado, but she sure isn't the one you helped, even though they could pass the sisters. Now your curiosity is itching more than ever. You start back to the club car to have a meet with the swarthy guy in the gray hat, but you only get as far as the platform. Every sound has a meaning all its own, and the crack of a gunshot has its own special meaning of disaster. When you get back to the compartment, you find the woman you talked to a minute ago. You find her sprawled out on the seat. This time, she has nothing to say. This time, she's dead. Now the twists start coming as fast as the souped up jalopy. You can't find the swarthy guy. You can't locate the original Fane Dorado. When you get back to your room, that, that big grip of hers is on the chair. When you get it open, you find out that it has nothing but paper in it, but paying paper, the currency of the realm. You don't have to count it, Mr. Hammer. It adds up to exactly 100000 When you swing around, you come face to face with the first Fane Dorado and the nasty nickel-plated automatic she points at. I'm sure I don't have to warn you not to move. I guess so, considering the course in your compartment. If you think I did it, you're wrong. You can't prove it by me. She was killed by mistake. I'm the one who's supposed to be dead. They're after me. You were arranged for her to take your place, is that it? Yes, but I didn't think they'd kill. I was just playing for time. To uh, get away with his dough? That should be obvious now. It should also be obvious you're going to have a tough sledding from here on in. Maybe impossible without help. Meaning? You've been around. You don't need a floor plan. Now, why should you help me? We're what you might call kindred souls. Two minds with but a single thought. The money. Like I said, you don't need a floor plan. And I can use 50% of that bill. Well, you're asking an awful lot. You don't think your life is worth 50000 I guess this is no time to bargain. A deal? All right, a deal. I suppose you want to know where the money came from. Well, partner, they shouldn't keep secrets from each other, should they? I'm uh, sort of a traveling woman for the syndicate. My job is to make certain stocks and deliver cash. For payoff? Yes, but the work started to bore me. And you figure there's no reason for all that money to go to other people. It could just as well be yours. You pick one big killing in your sack. You come to the right conclusions quickly. Uh, how else would I get along? And after the big killing, it's going to be safe in sunny Mexico for you. How'd you know that? The Mexican visa in the grip. 
You get around. Like I said. I know. How else would you get along? You didn't tell me what your business is ordinarily. Ordinary business. Odd jobs here and there, depending on how much they interest. This uh, $50,000 caper is very interesting, I think. It can be more dangerous than interesting, Mr. Hammer. Well, every business is a gamble, I figure. And as long as we're in this business together, suppose you call me Mike and I'll call you Pink. Call me anything you like, just as long as we dissolve our business at the Mexican border. Anything else on your mind? Yeah. Now that we have a good understanding, uh, one more thing. Which is? Get that gun out of my face. thing I got between us doesn't make for a very sound or trusting partner. <laughs> You're in it up to your ears, and you're staying in until the bottom line is with There's a killer, Lou. You figure he's not stopping until he gets that hundred thousand man named Dorado. And now you're at it, Louis. Really. The swarthy guy in the gray hat, the guy you pinpointed the killer, doesn't show up again. From Chicago, you and Fane fly to Brownsville, Texas. No sign of the swarthy guy at the Brownsville airport, either. But Fane is as jumpy as a gun-shy hound on a firing range. Mike, you're positive he didn't follow us here. Absolutely. But he could have. Look, will you stop worrying? We're okay. He couldn't have. Hey! Uh, what? Hey, honey. Well, of all the folks to run into in this little old corral. What? Now, don't tell me you don't remember old George. Uh, George Mitchell. No, no, honey. Oh, long time no see. Huh? How many years has been? Oh, ten. I know. Oh, you're looking pretty in there, man. Come on, you talk about a small world. Yeah. <laughs> How's the family? Your brother Fred and your partner? They're fine, George. Just fine. Oh, yes, uh, yes, a small world. Just happen to be here to see an old friend of mine. Who do I run into but you? Now, this gentleman couldn't be your husband, could he? Uh, no, George. This is Mike Hammer, business associate. Well, pleased to meet you, sir. Mighty pleased to meet you. Thanks, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, just call me George. Everybody calls me George. Friendly state this Texas. Well, you know, might have friendly in the union. Yeah, I've heard. Well, nice seeing you, George. You've got to be going. George? We have a reservation at the hotel, and there's some business we have to take care of. <laughs> now, honey, that ain't no kind of business that can't wait. Well, this can't, can it, Mike? Oh, all the time. Now, you look yeah. here, Fainter. I don't know a friend of mine is going to be holed up in any hotel room. No, sir. Not while I got that big empty house of mine. But, George, no, I... No, but... Uh, we're only staying overnight. I got a house big enough to hold a rodeo in. So you're not betting down in any hotel, even for just one night. No, sir. It's very nice of you, George, but... Look, I want to show off to you, Fainter, honey, and show you what a mistake you made ten years ago when you turned me down. Maybe you'll change your mind now, huh? <laughs> Just wait till you see that house of mine. Just you wait. Well, I'd really love you, George, but Mike wouldn't hear of it, I'm sure. Oh, Bane, you just don't turn down Texan hospitality. But the reservation. Ah, don't you worry about that. George Mitchell will take care of everything. You just leave everything to old George. Huh? He knows how to handle things. I wouldn't bet against it. You sound like a guy who gets along. <laughs> well, I gotta admit, I'm eating pretty regular. And you know how I did it, Bane, honey. You'd never guess. All right. That's how little old George did it all with fine art. You paint? <laughs> Me paint? Well, I can't even draw a straight line. I've got myself an art gallery five years ago, and it's the biggest in the Southwest now. You know anything about art, Mike? Well, you've got to see this here collection of mine. Maybe it ain't 57th Street, New York, but it's got a fast turnover, and that's what counts in any business, huh? <laughs> Every time. <laughs> oh, by the way, Fane, what's your line? Well, uh, uh, luggage, George. Uh, Fane and I are very much in luggage. <laughs> George Mitchell's joint is big, all right. It's all Texan and a hundred yards wide. You're surprised the floors aren't carpeted with wall-to-wall -wall money. Like the rest of the place, your bed is king-size and comfortable, but you can't enjoy the plushiness of it. You keep thinking about the thin slab other people might be sleeping on. People like that dame who was killed on the train. The dame sleeping permanently on a morgue slab. Early the next morning, you knock on Thane's door. When there's no answer, you walk in. She's not there. And you don't have to take a second look around to know that she didn't even sleep there. In, in just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey's Belaine mystery, Fat Hammer Guy. You go to his art gallery to wait for him and you browse around. Like everything else, the gallery itself is oversized. You're only there a couple of minutes when this guy is up to you. Now that, that is what I call a picture. He's gawking at a Renoir. Ain't she a beaut? She's all right. All right. You're blind or something? Not when it comes to that picture over there. That Latrec character? Nothing. Well, like the man said, everybody do his own taste. That Latrec had taste in his mouth with those pictures of beat-up bags he all the time painted. No class, just dance. Dance all bimbos. Well, uh, how come you're such an expert? How come? 
Well, you know how it is. With some guys, it's living vows. With others, it's the bank tale. Me, I'm the sensitive type. My pals don't call me Van Gogh for nothing, you know. And uh, if the artist didn't paint women? They all paint Van's friend, the good ones. Only some of them really got the know-how. Such as Renoir. Such as. None of this modern Picasso stuff. All skin and bones and three heads. Give me the old-fashioned girls every time. The classic type. Every time. You gotta remember, taste like mine has to be cultivated. It don't grow on trees, you know. It just don't happen all by itself. You gotta get around, see things. You just remember that, friend. When he gives you that final piece of advice, you remember something, but not about art. You remember this guy. He isn't wearing any gray snap brim hat now, but he's the swarthy guy who tails you on the train. See any art annual, friend? You tail him when he walks out. He's standing on a corner waiting for a light to change. You're in the middle of the block getting set to cross over. You're just stepping off the curb when from out of nowhere this car comes at you like a shot out of You jump back and scramble up on the sidewalk. You have the satisfaction of getting the plate number of the car. But when you look around, the swarthy guy is as scarce as an air conditioning salesman in a new car. You do a checkout on the license plate number. It's in the name of a Walter Hill. You go to the address on Beaumont Road. The car's in a garage in the rear of a dilapidated shack. The auto is a hot rod. The garage floor is lousy with tools. The red-headed guy is working on the motor, handling it like a mother handles a new baby. <laughs> Your name Hill, Walter Hill? Yeah. I want to talk to you. Can't you say I'm busy? Come back some other time. I'm busy. You were even busier an hour ago downtown on an El Paso Boulevard. What are you talking about? I'm talking about your driving, your fast driving. Okay, so I drive fast. I like it. What's so wrong about that? It was too fast for my comfort. That's my hobby, cuz. Nothing I can't make a car do. You know, some people think cars are for when it's too far to walk. Look. Some people don't know what it means to get behind a wheel or really live. Man, that's something. You know, I mean, really something. Just to zip along. Is that something? But you weren't just zipping along. You were aiming. You know, you take one of these small jobs and really super up. 65 in a second I can do on this cut down, Lizzie. <laughs> Man, talk about your living. I'm talking about dying. You were aiming to get me. Now tell me why. <laughs> tell me. Let go. Tell me. Let go, will you? I'm just a hot rodder. Tom's loaded with him. Go bother one or the other. You bothered me. Now tell me who put you up to it. Look, mister, I, I didn't see you step off the curb. Not much, you didn't. You swung in from the other side of the street. Now, do you want to talk to me, or would you rather talk to the cops downtown? Okay. Okay. But if I tell you, you won't turn me in. I'll think about it. Let's have it. Well, this guy gave me ten bucks. What guy? I, I don't know his name. I, I just got his telephone number. I was supposed to call him when I finished the job. What's the phone number? Look, I got it right here in my pocket. <laughs> here. This is a number, Hammond. This rod. Another kind of hot rod with six hot cylinders on it. And this time, I'm not missing you're doing this for dough. That guy with the car bugs got expenses. You think these tools don't cost an arm and a leg? You can afford to tell me who the guy is now. <laughs> what good will it do you to know now? You're a sucker, Hill. You have to pay the price tag on this one all by yourself. I'm not afraid to take chances. I get caught, that's my tough luck. But nobody's going to catch me anyway. It's going to look like another hit and run accident. You're going to get hit and I'm going to run. <laughs> You're doing the driving. I'll tell you where to go and when to stop. You slide in behind the wheel. <laughs> Man, am I going to have a ball? A hundred bucks. One hundred dollars. Now you know what you're worth on the open market. This is my best day. You're worse. Hill starts to get in next to you, but he doesn't make it. <laughs> he falls like a piece of cut string, and he's as lifeless. For a second, you don't know who to thank for your life. Then he comes around the side of the car. He wouldn't have enjoyed the ride anyway, Hammer. He's the guy who tells you on the train. The guy you talk to in the art gallery. The same swarthy guy, except for his manner of speech. Is something bothering you? Well, I guess I shouldn't look a gift life in the mouth, but uh, the way you talk oh, now... Oh, that, that, that was just a pose for fame to ride on a friend. I discovered just a while ago, Hammer, that you really weren't one of those friends. Well, how come you know so much? I guess this potential card of mine will answer your question. Detective Sergeant Fred Gallix, Los Angeles. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've been on St. Dorado's tail ever since she made the request for the Mexican visa. Well, then you know the whole setup, who she's tied in with. Yeah, I know everything about her and the tie-in with the syndicate, but I don't know who killed that dame on the train. Well, the way I figure, Fane herself is the key to that. Yeah, but go locate the key now. Well, I know she could be over the border by this time. Oh, no, she isn't. I wish I could be that sure. You can. But you don't know where to locate her, do you? Wherever I am, that's where she'll turn up eventually. I guarantee it. You tell Fred Gallux you're going back to George Mitchell's house. He can reach you there. 
Mitchell's maid tells you that Mitchell hasn't come home yet and that she hasn't seen Fane at all. So you go up to your room to do some waiting. The second you open the door, though, you know that you won't have any waiting to do. One more step, Mike, and I'll blow your brains out. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey's Filet Mystery, Fat Hammer Guy. And now, back to the Mickey's Filet Mystery, Fat Hammer Guy. Just as you figured it, Fame Dorado came back. And even though that nickel-plated gun of hers is shoving its nose in your face, you give out with a big, broad smile. You'll be smiling on the other side of your face. You're right, honey. I figured you'd have caught up with me hours ago. Never mind the jokes. Just start digging, and you know what I want you to come up with. Gee, honest, you got me there. Stop stalling. I'm in a hurry. Let me have that visa. Oh, that. I'm waiting. The visa. Now, is that a way for partners to act you pointing a gun at me? Just where it's going to stay until you hand over my visa. Well, you don't think I'm chump enough to have it on me. Then where is it? Well, like all good investments, I put it in a safe place. And that's where it's staying, Payne, until I get my share of that dough. Well, partner, what do you say to that? What's that to say? Well, you can show your complete understanding by shoving that gun back in the bag. Satisfied? Couldn't be happier. You know, Mike, I gotta hand it to you. Oh, you will, honey. Every cent of my hat. That all you think about? Money. The gun didn't work. Nothing else will either. All right. Now, uh, let's have our board of directors meeting to discuss future business. Make it short. Well, it'll only take as long as it takes to put that 50000 in my pocket. You don't have to worry now. You'll get yours. Who's worried? I just want to know when we close the books on this corporation. Tonight, all right? Suits me. Where? And there's a warehouse downtown. I'll tell you how to get there in a minute. But you just make sure you bring that visa. Well, I'll bring it. But do you remember your part of the deal? I wouldn't want to lose any of this newfound confidence in my part. Don't worry. You can count on me, partner. Then Dorado gives you the directions of how to get to your meet with her at the warehouse. After she leaves Mitchell's house, a phone call comes in for you from Fred Gatt. I'm at the Panhandle Hotel, room 456. Got something out of the branding. I get her as fast as you can make it. You rush over to the hotel to meet Fred Gallick, but you don't make it fast enough. By the time you get to his room, he's there all right, but sprawled out on the floor, an ugly slug hole in his back. When you roll his body over, you spot the pencil stub and magical cover clutched in his hand. On the inside of the cover, he's managed to scrawl something. The writing is uneven and interrupted, but its meaning is clear enough. It makes you more itchy than ever for that payoff meet with Fane Dorado at that deserted warehouse. Come on in, Mike. I'm sorry I'm late. I hope you didn't worry too much about me. I knew you'd come. It's real nice when two partners understand each other like we do. Let's get on to business. Well, now, don't rush on my account. I'm not on your account. Anxious to get going to Mexico, huh? If you don't mind. Why should I? After all, this partnership of ours will be dissolved when we complete this deal. So let's complete it. Okay, but you know what they say about haste makes... You have the visa? Sure. Feels the deal, isn't it? All right, then give it to me. Now, it's not that I don't trust you, honey, but there's that 50000 that's supposed to be handed over to me. I haven't got it. What? But it's here. Huh? She means I got it, Hammond. Oh. I got it right here in the suitcase. Mitchell. Life's full of little surprises, isn't it, Mike? Like I said, the airport's a small world. Huh? You insisted on holding out on my visa. Oh, can you hate me for protecting my interest? I can kill you for it. Now, that gun looks real familiar, Fane. You know what they say, familiarity breeds contempt. Mitchell here is sure to find that out, too. <laughs> Don't worry your little old head about me. Walt Hill, you hired him to get me. He didn't, so I saved a hundred dollars. And that gallery of yours. Just the front, Hammond. I know, for the syndicate. But Fane and me are through with the syndicate, aren't we, Fane? That's right, George. Fane and me, we're going into business for ourselves in little old Mexico. If you make it across the border. Now, don't you worry about us. We'll make it. You may have to kill others. I don't think so. Just you, Hammond. Maybe you'll get away with it, but uh, killing a cop, that's a hard rap to beat. So, so you know about Gallux, huh? You're not the only one who gets around, Mitchell. Yeah, but you're through getting around. In a rap, Fane. That's absolutely right, George. Right. You see, him? How about that dame on the train? Still a small world. I was on that train, too. If the syndicate thought Fane was dead, it'd give us time to skip to Mexico. <laughs> Couldn't need a little plan, huh? You know what they say about the best laid plans of mice and men? I mean, rats. Oh, now, is that a nice way to be talking about your ex-partner? Your ex-partner, too, George. Huh? You heard me, George. Stay right where you are. 
Uh, faint, honey. I'll you... make it fast, snappy, and unpleasant. <laughs> Life is full of surprises in such a small world, George. You just got to expect. You them. shut up. I'm the one who gets the last laugh on both of you. Well, fast and snappy, I told you. I'm not splitting the money in that suitcase with anybody. I didn't go through all the trouble to give up any of it. Well, well what's the idea? The idea, George, is to leave you and Mike here. Well, now, Faint, don't be crazy. You won't get away with it. I'll try. I'll tell you that. I'll try. Well, I'll find you. You try this, and I'll find you, and I'll hound you down. A dead hound can't track anything down. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's so funny? Well, the joke's on you, Faye, honey. I'm the one who gets a laugh laugh. You want to die laughing? Go ahead, no, laugh. It's almost worth it. Such a big joke, huh? <laughs> Money in that suitcase that couldn't get you a ride on a Mexican streetcar, all of it together. What? It's phony. Huh? Counterfeit. You're lying. Well, go ahead. Look for yourself. Not worth the paper it's printed on. I made the switch yesterday. <laughs> I was going to meet you in Mexico City next week, huh? I wasn't ever going to meet you again. <laughs> now, I ask you, who's got the last laugh, huh? <laughs> you stop it. Stop it. I'll kill you just for laughing. Oh, no, you won't. You want that money too bad. You won't do nothing. <laughs> A real big joke, huh? Enjoy yourself <laughs> while you can, Mitchell. Well, what's going to stop me now? Fred Garrett? <laughs> what? He's dead and he knows it. You know where he is. What are you talking about? I'm talking about that gun you're holding. Take my advice, drop it. Are you crazy? There are cops at every window. Oh, sure. There's one at that window behind you. Of course. You're right, that window there. To your left. Even though he was dying, Gallic's managed to scribble a note to me about your setup at the art gallery, Mitchell. It wasn't hard for me to put two and two together. So I fixed it for the cops to be here for this final business deal of ours. Now I ask you both, who's got the last laugh? Accident prone. That's the expression psychiatrists use for a guy who goes around getting into one bang up after another. A guy like this can just step off a curb and he breaks a leg. He can just be shaving and he cuts his throat from ear to ear. Well, maybe trouble prone is the word for it. Anyway, it's trouble with a capital T. Anybody else gets into their car around nine in the evening, what happens? Nothing. You? Well, with you, it's different, all right. Take the next plan. What? Don't turn around. Just keep driving. You were late. I didn't know you were waiting. You had your orders. I don't want excuses. You got everything else straight, haven't you? Uh, maybe we'd better go over it again. What kind of a character did Carl get? He said you were reliable. Oh, I'm reliable. Just want to be sure. Okay, I'm going over it once. Only once. Old man's name is Walter Hutt. The address is 45 Cedar Avenue. The rest is up to you. Anything else you want to tell me? I'm leaving the gun here in the back seat. Carl, I'll have the 5,000 ready for you. Just as soon as I'm sure that Walter Hutton is dead. Anybody else gets in that car and what happens? Nothing. Yeah, it's different, all right, with you. Let me off at the corner. Keep your eyes front. You let him off and he ducks around the corner before you get a good measure on him. You pick up the Smith & Wesson special from the back seat and after you make a few phone calls, you head out to the Hutton place at 45 Cedar Avenue. You expect to be greeted by one of those fancy-dressed butlers. Yes? What is it? Well, no butler ever looked like this. It's not only the unexpected that keeps you staring, but every other item. From those encased in smooth nylon up to the slick-featured, smiling face framed by the long, wavy auburn hair. Well, have you uh, come to a decision? Hmm. Oh, uh, my name's Mike Hammer. Mr. Hutton's expecting me. Come on in. <clears throat> That's a very pretty tie you're wearing, Mike. Thanks. Um, uh, Mr. Hutton said he'd be waiting for me in the library. First things first, Mike. And I'm the first thing in your path. Well, I suppose we arrange to have our paths cross later. I don't always find Daddy's call it's worth my time and energy. Yeah, but I'm different. Uh-huh. So am I. You'll find that out. I already have. You haven't even scratched the surface yet. I'll take a rain check, all right? Do you uh, really want to keep that appointment with Daddy? I mean, uh, immediately? Immediately. I uh, have an hour never feeling about it. I'll dally a while, Mike. You will eventually. I hate to inject a note of materialism into this touching exchange, but you're linking my very pretty time. Oh, really? 
There. Does that make up for it? Now, you've been seeing too many cheap movies, honey. Excuse me. Where are you going? See your daddy in the library. It's been charming. Thanks. You, you louse. Fred. Now, don't look now, honey, but your show is slipping. Fred. Brett, come here at once. What's the matter, Gloria? Brett, throw this man out. But He forced his way in and tried to get fresh with me. Oh, he did, huh? Now don't get physical, friend. Okay, you. <laughs> He sidestepped his car and came in under his belt with the right cross, and as big as he was, he was a to handle it. While he stood doubled up, she smoldered, and you didn't know who she was madder with, him or you. While you just leave them, him aching and her smoldering, and make your way to the library. There in a wheelchair, you get your first look at Walter Hutton. He's snow white on top, and his cheeks have the color of a yellow apple, long past ripeness and very wrinkled. Well, you didn't make yourself very clear over the phone, Mr. Hammer. Well, it's still it's clear to me, Mr. Hutton. Uh, the way it looked, someone mistook me for a professional killer hired to murder you. I beg your pardon? I think you'd better. What? I said that's the way it looked, but it wasn't that way at all. It was just a gimmick. I'm afraid I don't follow you. Now, this is the gun the killer was to use. I checked the registration number. Well, Mr. Hutton, you uh, follow me now, don't you? All right, Mr. Hammer. It's my gun. Now, look, I don't like practical jokes, especially when they're not practical. I suppose it was foolish of me, but I, I thought it practical at the time. I needed someone like you, Mr. Hammer. Someone I could trust. Well, I only do business with someone I can trust. I was desperate. I'm willing to pay anything. Now, you're a rich guy, Mr. Hutton. I heard about you. You collect things, but uh, you haven't got enough to collect me. If you'll only listen for just a moment. Please. Please. All right, for just a moment. What have I got to lose? You you see this Florentine beggar? What about it? This is quite an expert forgery, even to the jewel-encrusted handle. The value of the original cannot be determined in mere dollars and cents. Up until last Tuesday, I owned the priceless object. Oh, you mean someone pulled a switch? Yes, and I want the original recovered with the least possible fuss and, and no publicity. That's why I needed you. Someone completely trustworthy. Oh, you figure it's an inside job. I'm afraid it is. Who lives here with you? Well, my chauffeur, Joe Brett, the cook, Mrs. Darren, Miss Wyatt, my nurse. Uh, for the past year, I've been consigned to this wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So far, you mentioned three people. I met one of them on the way in here, Brett. Oh? Yeah, Brett. Uh, oh, and uh, also your daughter. Daughter? Yeah, the good-looking redhead. Uh, Brett called her Gloria. That good-looking redhead is not my daughter, Mr. Hammer. Gloria is my wife. There are times when you have nothing to say. And if you have, you just keep your mouth shut and try not to look too stupid. Won't you please help me, Mr. Hammer? And there are times when you can't say no. Hutton moves the wheelchair you just guided. Outside the library, Mrs. Hutton, personality and all, is gone. As you move toward the rear wing, it becomes clear that Hutton is taking you on a shakedown tour of the whole place. This is Brett's room here. Perhaps you better begin by searching that bureau. Okay, it's your house and your show. Well, nothing that looks like a dagger here. Or here. Then maybe you better try the closet. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how long has Brett been with you? Oh, about ten months. Mm -hmm. And you've been married uh, just a month over a year. Why? Nothing here. Now, what about the nurse, Miss Wyatt? Since the heart attack, just after my marriage. Uh, where's Miss Wyatt now? This is her evening off. Miss Wyatt keeps an apartment in town. Uh, perhaps you should look under the bed mattress. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, okay. Well, Mr. Hammer, there you are. <laughs> really? Just where am I? Why, the original dagger. It's, it's under the mattress. Well, if it is, it's not visible to the naked eye. Wait, it's, it's got to be there. It, it must be. It you... must be. This evening, I put it there myself. Back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, that hammer guy. What 
before the hockey tells you stuns like the bite of a rattler. You're too confused to try any brain work of your own. You wheel him back to the library, and you're ready to dump the whole thing right in his lap. This is terribly shocking. I'm beside myself. Well, oh, that makes two of us. Now, look, Cotton, we started out with a whopping big lie, and I'm halfway to the door right now. But you can't leave. First, you tricked me here with a phony killer routine. Then you want me to trace a valuable dagger you stole from yourself and plant it on someone else. I don't go for shenanigans like all that. All right, all right. I did the foul thing, granted. I admit I wanted to frame Brett. Well, I'm staying just long enough to hear why. I wanted to get rid of him. You could have fired him. But I couldn't. It had to be my way. But now you've got to help. Now the original dagger is really gone. Yeah, well, get yourself another boy. I don't like the way my mouth Now, please, Mr. Hammer. This is now a legitimate circumstance. You've got to forget what happened. With the dagger actually gone, my, my motivation is completely changed. Your time is up. Very well. I won't plead with you any longer. Look, here's some advice, Hutton. Framing bread is no way to solve your problem. On my way in here, I saw what's bothering you. You'd better figure out some other angle to keep that cute wife of yours in tow. After you march out of the library, you spot Gloria Hutton in the front hall. The whole setup is a mud puddle and you don't feel like wallowing in so you duck toward the rear of the house, hoping for a clean, quiet exit. But as you pass Brett's room, you know you won't get one. You hear Brett and the woman talking in there. It's not hard to hear when the conversation gets into the top octave. No. Now, I told you to keep your nose out of my business. Yo, for goodness sake, open your eyes. You're making a fool out of you. Shut up. Certainly end up like the others. Shut up, I said, shut up. What were you looking in here for? Nothing, I told you. You're a stinking liar. The whole place was messed up. What were you after? I didn't touch a thing. I came here looking for you. I thought... Get out. Go on. Get out. Don't ever come... You. What do you want? Don't mind me. I was just passing through. So, who, who is she? Oh, you? Why, at the nurse, I shrewdly deduced that from your lily white uniform, the only unsoiled item in the joint. I owe you something, Hammer. I better Welsh this time, Brett. You'll thank me in the long run. Uh, excuse me. I must attend to Mr. Hammer. Uh, you'll find him in the library, a sadder but no wiser man. Well, so long, Brett. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, give my disregards to Mrs. Hutton, will you? Wait a minute, Hammer. What is this guy? Still tie wrinkling. I still owe you one. And I'm going to bang him. Brett's fistic style hadn't improved since you last go with him. He was still a prime sucker for a right cross. You leave him doubled up and you head for the rear exit, but you never get as far as the door. The screen comes from the library. When you get there, Miss Wyatt is standing in the middle of the room, pointing to Walter Hutton's empty wheelchair. He hasn't walked in a year, but he's gone now. You have the idea you're going to start to look for Hutton, but someone else has another idea. Oh. <laughs> Same white flashes a hammer and an anvil make lace your brain. Now you've had it right behind the ear. When you come around, you feel as sour as the morning after, only there's been no night before to make it worth it. Feeling better, Mr. Hammer. You're on the sofa in the Hutton Library, and Miss Wyatt is doing the Florence Nightingale bit. I had Brett carry you here. Ah. Uh. It was Brett who sent me charging with the light brigade, huh? Yes, I'm sorry. I had no idea. Where is he now? I want to see. Please, I, I've got to talk to you first. Mr. Hutton didn't walk out of here. He couldn't have. He must have been carried. Mr. Hammer, I'll hire you myself. Uh, to do what? To find Mr. Hutton and prove that Brett had nothing to do with the disappearance of that Florentine dagger. Why your very special interest in Brett? We're married. Oh. But, but legally separated. Oh. Fred isn't bad, Mr. Hammer. He's just weak. Weak? Ask my head. And weak enough to be tormented by that that thing Mr. Hutton married. That's the nicest thing you ever said about me. Mrs. Hutton. Well, how'd you reach the keyhole? With a stepladder? Remind me to buy you a snappy new tie. So you can hang yourself. Oh, now, look, it's too late for apologies. In case you're interested, your husband is missing. I know, but he isn't really missing. If you want him, you'll find him out in the garage. On the floor. Face down the blob of grease. <laughs> You find Walter Hutton exactly where Gloria said he was, face down on the garage floor, unconscious but alive. You pick him up, and you'll bet he weighs no more than Gloria does. On the way up to Hutton's bedroom, Brett joins the parade. You're saving what you owe Brett till later. When you put Hutton on the bed, he's still out. His pulse is normal. Really? How nice. All broken up, aren't you, Mrs. Hutton? Oh, terribly. What do you know about this, Brett? You don't have to answer him. He's not the police. Oh, tell him, Joe. You're only harming yourself. Well, I'm Brett, not... 
You don't have such a good memory, do you, Hammer? I was with you. I know where you were. I'm asking what you know. Why'd you ask Helen? Who was there? I'm asking you. You're just wasting time. That carries my husband up and down the stairs every day. He's had every chance to drop him, and he hasn't done it. Doesn't she have all kinds of nice thoughts? She thought of this, you. I wouldn't be surprised if she did suggest that Mr. Hutton be accidentally dropped. Why, you... <laughs> And Helen's strong enough to carry him. Oh, Joe, how can you even think of such a thing? You don't want to waste your dough, Miss Wyatt. I want her out of this house. I want her out of this house now, this minute. I'm going. And believe me, I'm glad to leave. Yeah, and I'm going with you before this crust gets too hard to wash off. <laughs> Helen Wyatt to her apartment, and you have the feeling you've taken a dove out of a cage of vultures. Then you go home, willing to forget the whole nasty mess. But after an eight-hour sleep peopled with ugly but familiar characters, you get a phone call. Oh, I thought the nightmare was over. Don't be mad, Mike. We could make an interesting couple. Nothing could be that interesting. Let's try another number. Have the phone book filled with them. Oh, you must. I never knew what that expression meant. My husband told me how he got to the garage last night. Oh, is that so? It concerns Helen Wyatt. Oh. I'll tell you only that it can mean a great deal of trouble for her. Unless you come out here and soon. So you go, and soon. Something about Helen Wyatt makes you want to help her in case this is on a level. Something about Gloria Hutton makes you want to hate it. Hello, Mike. Where's your husband? Oh, be nice to me, Mike, please. Be nice to yourself. What's it all about? Don't kiss me, Mike. Just once before you go up to all that bedroom. Kiss yourself. I'm here only on business. All right, Sheil, come on. The old man's upstairs, small and lost in the oversized bed. As you make the cross-country trip to his bedside, he orders the new nurse out of the room. Thank you for coming, Mr. Hammer. I didn't come for thanks, Sutton. What's all this guff about Helen Wyatt? It's no guff, as you call it. She attempted to kidnap me. Now, look, she was with me practically every second before you disappeared. Oh, it wasn't she personally. It was that man she let in through the terrace door. A big, burly man. Oh, really? He couldn't have been too big and burly, considering how short a distance he hauled you. He suddenly became frightened. It couldn't be that uh, he was the same guy you hired to pull me in. I admitted to you that that was a trick. This isn't... You have my word. I'm still not fine. Well, then, why not ask Miss Wyatt herself? Maybe I will. But I'm even more concerned with the Florentine dagger. I'm quite willing to forget the rest if that were returned. Please tell that to Miss Wyatt. Why her? Mr. Hammer, if you were to search Miss Wyatt's apartment, I'm sure you would be surprised. Unpleasantly. Hutton seems as certain of himself as a rooster in a hen yard. You leave him and walk out of the house. Strangely enough, you don't have to belt Brett or unlace Gloria's arms from around your neck. You go to Helen Wyatt's apartment. No answer when you ring the bell, so you get the super to let you in with a pass key. You find nothing in the living room. But it's a different story in the bedroom. Walter Hutton pegged it right. You were surprised. And unpleasantly. Oh, put me through the captain chambers, will you? Tell him Mike Cam is calling. Hello, Pat. Yeah, yeah, I got something for you. 987 East 60th Street. Woman named Helen Wyatt. She's in apartment 6B. She's very dead, Pat. a bottle on the night table and a glass clutched in Helen Wyatt's gray white hand. It looks like strychnine poisoning to you. Her body is contorted in the way strychnine contorts. The glass in her hand probably would confirm a very obvious story. There's no sign around of a struggle. 
Well, there's nothing you can do for Helen Wyatt now. She'll leave before Pat Chambers arrives. Oh, you're back. I'm glad. Doesn't anyone ever open the store but you? You look angry, Mike. With Brett. Why? Why is it in this place everybody answers a question with a question? I give up, Mike. Why? Okay, I'll find him myself. No, you won't. He went out ten minutes ago. All right, then your husband will do it until Brett comes back. Wait, I want to tell you something. Tell it to Brett. He won't find my husband upstairs. Look, don't tell me again. Oh, no, nothing like that. Before he went out, Brett brought Walter down to the library. You spoke to Miss Wyatt? No, I didn't speak to Miss Wyatt. But you did find out something nasty about it. Yeah, real nasty. She's dead. Oh, how did that happen? Well, it could be she took her life. Really? Or maybe somebody helped her take it. And that's why you wanted to see Brett? That's why. Well, Mr. Hammer, you're back. Helen Wyatt is dead, Hudden. Oh, well, that is a shock, is it? How did this happen? Suicide, Walter. Well, what else? Cozier for all concerned, if it is, huh? Well, what else? Woman's way out. Know a lot about it, don't you? Well, now, see here, Hammer, what's it going to be? Meaningless chatter or action? Action. The kind that catches a murderer. Then why are you here, wasting your time? If I went anyplace else, that would be a waste of time. You think someone here killed her? What do you think? That's ridiculous. Someone in this house stole your dagger, Hutton, and someone killed Helen Wyatt. You ask me, I'll tell you, I think they're one and the same person. Someone who'd want the money that dagger would bring. Someone who hated Helen Wyatt enough to slip poison into a drink. You're making very wild statements. And you're a very strong candidate yourself. Now, see here, Emma. You can't blame me for this. Maybe, maybe not. She knew about you and Brad. Shut up. It's okay. I'm not speaking out of turn. Your husband knows. Of course, this is a lie. Is it Gloria? Of course. Mr. Hammer likes finesse, but he does speak the truth. Painfully. No, Walter. Oh, come on, Mrs. Sutton. We're all showing our cards now. You'd like to be Brad, wouldn't you, Mike? Gloria. Wouldn't you? And you too, Walter. You'd like to be Brad, too. Gloria, please. I didn't kill her. He can't prove that I did. I'm leaving that to someone else to prove. Where are you going? What are you going to do? I'm going to turn the whole mess over to the cops. Put that phone down, Adam. Oh. I never argue with a gun, Brad. That's smart. Stand real still if you want to keep smart and alive. Brett, what's the meaning of this? You, Mr. Hutton, you just sit in that wheelchair of yours, nice and quiet. Well, now we've got ourselves a quorum, but still no answer to the big question. Maybe there is. Brett, I think we should tie Hammer up. At least bind his hand. You're all going mad. Do you think I'm mad, Brett? Uh-uh. I think you're the smartest one ever, Gloria. I'll use the drapery sash. You hold the gun on him. Here. Stop this immediately. No way. This is for your good, too, Hutton. This guy knows too much about all of us. You're it. insane. Completely insane. He knows nothing. There's nothing to know. You just keep him covered, Gloria. I'll get that sash. Don't bother, Brent. Just stay right there where I can cover you. What? If you're going crazy, seems to be the general topic of the day. Gloria. If you so much as move an inch, I'll shoot your head off. Mike? I'm listening. You really don't hate me, do you? Will it make any difference? You said you didn't like questions answered with questions. We've got a lot in common besides that. Think we could make an interesting couple now? Depends. I'll be a very rich widow. Gloria. Your husband has to be dead for you to be a widow. All I have to do is pull the trick. Gloria. You've broken down excuse for a man. What do you think I married you for? Don't talk like that. Mike, if you were dead and Brett took the blame, we'd be set up for life. Yes, you wouldn't we? It's an angle. And money is an object with you. Same as with you. And we'll have a great time spending it. It's right in the palm of your hand, if you want it. But uh, if you don't... Did I say I didn't? Um, give me the gun. I'll handle things, honey. Here. Ah, Brett, must not move. You'll double-cross you on the end, Hammer, just like she did me. I can't hear a word you're saying. No, I don't have You can't do a thing like this. I didn't think I could either, but when it comes down to the combination of a slick dame and a barrel of dough, I'm as much a pushover as the next guy. Go ahead, Mike. Do it. Now. Now. Okay. But then, uh, close your eyes, honey. Makes an awful mess. No, wait. No, don't, please. Well... You move around pretty well without that wheelchair, don't you, Hutton? But he, he, he got up and walked by himself. Mike, you missed. He's doing it again. Shoot him. All right, knock it off. The game's over. What? Hutton, I was waiting to see you jump out of that wheelchair like uh, that. I fired that shot two feet over well, your head. I, I, I was frightened, so I, I didn't realize that I could get up and walk. It was an involuntary action. Yeah, I'll bet. 
as involuntary as going to Helen Wyatt's apartment and killing her. That, that, that is ridiculous. You got to her apartment just the way you got to the garage last night, on your own two feet. Well, you're not making sense. What, what motive could I have? The original dagger, the one that's worth so much gold, you stole it from yourself. You never planted it in Brett's room. It was for my benefit, so it would look good when I told the story to the insurance company. That's fantastic. Utterly fantastic. All right, save it, Hutton. I looked up your financial rating today. It's lower than your wife's character. That's no proof that I'm a murderer. Helen Wyatt was on to your setup. That's why she was so sure when she told me Brett was in the clear. You had to kill her to cover yourself. He's broke. A dirty lying cheat. She was broke all the time. <laughs> Yes, Gloria. Practically penniless. Yes, I, I bought you with a name and a reputation and a house that I couldn't even afford to live in. You, you were swindled, Gloria. You know, you were... You... You really were... Were cheated. Man, you're a widow now. His heart should have given out sooner. I wasted a year of my life. A whole year. He was broke. How do you like that? You mean? I like it just fine, honey. <laughs> Here is Larry Haynes as Mickey Spillane, that hammer guy. You don't get it. You can't understand it at all. You walk into Pat Chambers' office at Homicide, and the sight you see brings you up short with your jaw bouncing up the floor in amazement. For the love of feet, close your mouth. What's the stare at? What's the stare at? You've read that Captain Pat Chambers was reassigned for special temporary duty with the Crime Commission, but you didn't know it had come to this. Guy feels like dressing up once in a while, Mike. What's so wrong about it? Oh, so that's what it is. I knew there was something strange about you. Hey, this tuck fits all right, doesn't it? Uh, my mistake. I'm sorry. Mistake about what? The disguise, Mr. Holmes. For a moment, I thought you were the head waiter at the Bowery Coffee Joint. Very funny. Any other comments? Yeah, yeah. The sign on your door says homicide. So? Well, you ought to book that shirt you wear in the car. It looks like it's killing you. Hey, it is a little tight at that. Yeah, what's the deal, Pat? Is that formal straitjacket your uniform for the new job? Hey, cut the ribbon, will you, Mike? <laughs> I'm going to help the commission break up Barney Miller's syndicate if I have to wear this monkey suit to his funeral. I'll buy you a drink on that. Not tonight. I got a date with someone who's very interested in my future. And hers. Hey, hey, cut that. You really sound serious. Serious enough to start making plans. Pat, you're kidding. Am I? Listen, Mike, you know Sergeant Ryan out there at the desk? You see the way he looks? How can I miss him? He's as well fed as a prized turkey the week before Christmas. Well, he's got a wife who can cook and four kids and a nice little house in the suburbs. I love that. That's all right for guys like Sergeant Ryan. What's wrong with a deal like that for guys like me? Same thing as with me. We know James too well, Pat. We know how the odds are rigged. Some of them are different. Look, I know you don't want to bet on that. I'll bet on Marie. I don't make sure bets with friends. You know all the answers. When it comes to James, yeah. You know, for the first time, I'm feeling sorry for you. All right, so hold me a benefit. Tell you what I will do. Mm -hmm. I'm meeting Marie at 10. You join us. I want you to see how right I am. No, thanks. But when you find out, old friend, how right I am, give me a buzz. And we'll have a good laugh over this. <laughs> So you leave Pat looking at you like that annoying kid in your grade school class who had all the answers. But you know Pat is only temporarily derailed. You know he's too smart for any day. So you have yourself an evening. Get home around 2.30 a.m. and just as you unlock the door, your phone is ringing. I understand you're a friend of Captain Chambers, Hammer. So? Well, your boy's in a little trouble. Something that'll fix him good. That is, unless you're interested enough to do something about it. What is this, a gag? Do you think it's funny? Where did you hear the tagline? It's kid you. Who is this? My name is Hank Busby. I'm at 943 East 20th Street, apartment 4E. Come on over while there's still time to laugh. This guy Busby doesn't sound funny, so you shove your hat back on and drive downtown to that address. 
He jabbed the door buzzer for over a minute, and finally the door swings back. What do you want? The tall, sleepy-eyed dame is busy tucking herself into a pink cloud of a robe that's as soft and loose as a rippling yellow hair. You know, it's almost three in the morning. I'm Mag Hammer. So take your name and bring it back where it belongs. Three in the morning. Uh, I'm not so fast with the door, sister. I got a call to come here. Well, if you did, this is the wrong apartment. Well, you're Mrs. Busby, aren't you? Hmm? Mrs. Hank Busby? Mrs. Henry Busby. Or Carol Busby. Why? Your husband phoned me. My husband? Now, look, I'm too tired to play games. I spoke to your husband 15 minutes ago, and he told oh, me... Oh, no. That... You couldn't have talked to Henry. He's dead. What? My husband died over a year ago. the door in your face. And you stand there looking at it blankly till the shock of embarrassment wears off. You feel like an April Fool prank that suddenly told it's the middle of summer. So you go back to your place, flop in the bed, and switch off the light. But this isn't the night you're going to get any sleep. The little fat guy leaning against your door looks like he's on his last leg. His eyes are black glazed pools surrounded by a face the color of a flower bag. Please. Please let me in. Who are you? I'll talk to you on the phone. Hey, Busby. What? Please. Please let me in. Not before I find out whether this is another gag. No gag. This is no gag. takes a step, but before your hands touch him, he crumples like an unstarched shirt. You look him over. No marks of violence. No sign of a gun or a knife wound. And he doesn't have the color of a guy who's been given a lethal mickey. You can't put any of it together. Especially that part he told you over the phone about Pat Chambers being in a jam. He goes through his pocket. Nothing but a photo negative in a plain envelope. As you walk over to the table lamp to examine it, you forget the door is still open. But you're reminded of it suddenly when... Please stay right where you are, Mr. Hammer. The voice isn't sleepy anymore. It's as steady as the hand that holds the gun pointed at you. He's dead. Oh, he couldn't be. You said your husband died over a year ago. He is dead, isn't he? Uh, you should know. I didn't kill him. Maybe you frightened him to death. That's impossible. Do I look like the kind of person who frightens men? Oh, I'm scared to death of you. You make me shake all over like a kid in the Model A with his first date. Well, turn your motor off, Mike. You're not going any place with me. Look, what do you want? You should know the answer to that one. Now, you overrate me. I'm a lousy contestant for a quiz show. I'll give you a hint. Now, would that be cricket? The negative. Negative? Look, why don't we talk about something positive, like uh, what this is all about? I'm not here to answer questions. This gun should convince you of that. The negative, please. Now, would you really use that gun? Don't try me. I saw you slip the negative into your pocket. Oh. Why can't your eyes be just beautiful instead of sharp, too? Huh? Turn around. I'll get the negative myself. Yeah, but you be careful. I'm ticklish. Turn around. And no tricks. All right. I'm leaving now. What? Well, not even a kiss goodbye? A kiss. All right, Mike, if you really insist. In just a moment, we'll return to That Hammer Guy. the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. When you come
come to and drag yourself across the floor. The clock leaves 5.30 at you. You feel as gray and sour as the morning light that's seeping in through the window. Busby is still on the floor near the door. He's company you can do without. So you spin the phone to dial Pat Chambers' home number. A fine time of the night you picked to call me. Oh, believe me, Pat, it's not a social call. If you'll hang up real fast, I'll forget the whole thing. It's been a tough night, Pat. My head. Look, I'm not with the AA. Okay, but I'm with a corpse. Huh? Yeah, he's right here in my apartment, a guy named Hank Busby. Some guys see pink elephants? You now, think... this is no gag, Pat. Get over here right away. Okay, I'm on my way. And believe me, Mike, it better not be a gag. <laughs> And with him, the medical attorney. The M.E. gives Pat his report while you boil some coffee on the two burner. After the M.E. leaves, Pat joins you in a cup. Ooh, you still make the lousiest coffee in town. Well, I just could never make the grade in home economics. That's why I was drummed out of Vassar. Uh, it was no gag. I never joked about murder, Pat. It wasn't murder. What? The M.E. said it was heart failure. What'd you say he told you his name was? Hank Busby White. Like your name is Busby, he was Charlie Ferguson. How do you know? How do I know? He's on my list for the crime commission investigation. You mean he's tied up with Barney Miller? He was Miller's errand boy, did the legwork, collections and that stuff. And he wasn't married? What kind of a dame would marry him? Well, there's always a dame, even for a guy like Busby. Still on the dame kick, huh? Yeah, sure, but there's no use talking with you about it, is there? No use, Mike. Wait till you meet Marie. You'll see the difference. There is no difference. Okay, okay. Well, what about the negative? I didn't get a chance to make it out. The dame came in too soon. Must be worth something to have her talk you. Yeah, it'll be worth something for me to catch up with her. I'm sure you will catch up with her. That you can bet on, Pat. Now, one thing I can't figure out. What's that? What Charlie Curtis meant when he said you were in trouble. Trouble? Me? I got everything I want. I like my new assignment. I got Marie. I ask you, Mike, what trouble could there be for me? can't figure out the trouble either, except for the normal kind that a dame can give a guy. Well, after Pat leaves, you change your clothes and go to that apartment on East 20th Street. You find out that Charlie Fergus rented it two weeks ago, but that's all you find out. When you call your phone service that afternoon, there's a message that Pat Chambers wants you to meet him at his address down in the village. Something about Barney Miller. As you press the door buzzer, you wonder what Pat had found out. They're waiting for you, Hammer. Come on in. Well, it isn't Pat Chambers at the door or any other cop. That's the first surprise. Mr. Miller doesn't like to be kept waiting. Come on. And that's the second surprise and the most shocking. What's this about, Miller? I understand words around that Pat Chambers wants to see me. Is that right? Why don't you find out from him? I also understand you're interested in me, too. Is that right? That's your right about. Well, sit down. Why be uncomfortable? Pull up a chair for him, Trask. Glad to be a servant. Well, thanks for the hospitality, but I'm not staying, Trask. Never pass up friendly gestures, Hammer. Sit down. Some hospitality. My attitude towards my guests depends on them. Let's try out on a topic that interests me. Like what? Like the negative that Fergus had. Now, why should a lousy negative make you go through all this trouble? No trouble at all. At least not for me. Where is it now? I don't know. You believe this guy, Trent? Uh Uh-uh, do you? Show him what we think of dishonest people. With pleasure. (laughs) Change your mind, Hammer? I don't find this type of conversation very pleasant. Weak stomach, you know. Yeah, I'm sure. Let's try another topic, like why Fergus wanted you to act as a contact between him and your pal Chambers. He died before I could find out. Too bad. Yeah, you're all broken up, aren't you? Too bad for you. Unless you decide to talk. I don't know what to talk about. All right, Trask, help the poor guy on. Okay, anything you say, not. You feel like an insect pinned to an exhibit board under Miller's cold stare. Your eyes blur with pain. But you're lucky enough to go out before Trask is finished working you over. When you come to, you're alone. Alone with the ache of hate inside that hurts even more than the searing bruises on your face. You get out of there and make a fast phone call to Pat Chambers. 
Sergeant Ryan tells you what restaurant Pat is having dinner at, and he also tells you that Pat is having it with his girlfriend, Marie. When you get to the eatery, you spot Pat and his dame. You didn't know what Marie looked like, but the dame sitting across the table from Pat, and smiling at him with a smile that would sweeten a gallon of vinegar, is the same doll who kissed you with a gun butt and took that necklace. You back off before Pat can spot you, and you wait in your car till they come out. Then you tail him. Pat drops the dame off and then drives to his place. You wait a minute and then jab the doorbell. Come on in, Mike. Glad you dropped by. Have a drink? No, thanks. What's the matter? A dame, that's the matter. Judging from the way your face looks, she's some slugger. What happened? A dame didn't do this. Then who? I'll get to it. How's your luck holding out with Barney Miller? I'm getting ready to sign, seal, and deliver him over to the commissioner. I figured out why Charlie Trigger came to me. You did? Yeah. Because he knew you and I were friends. Oh, you mean he wanted to use you as a go-between? Yeah, that's what I figured. Could be. Anything else you figured? Yeah, plenty. But I'll tell you about it when I'm positive, sure. I'll see you around. You sure you won't have that drink, Mike? Uh-uh. Well, I'll take care of yourself. Yeah, that goes for you, too. So long. Oh, uh, by the way. Yeah, Mike? I saw you having dinner in that restaurant tonight. So? Well, why didn't you join us? Well, I wanted to talk to you alone. Uh, you could have talked in front of Marie. I trust her with everything. You do? Yeah, and as long as you're here, you, you can be the first to know. We decided on it tonight. On what? To announce our engagement next Sunday. Oh. Well, what do you mean, oh? Sound like happiness just came to your worst enemy. Now, you know I'm your friend, Pat. Why don't you behave that way? Pat. The worst thing a friend can do is stick his nose into his buddy's problems with a dame. Problems? I have no problems with Marie. Uh-huh. Where's she from, Pat? I've never seen her around before. Out west someplace. She's been in New York six months. Mm-hmm. What else do you know about her? I love her. That's all I want to know. Well, I'll be on my way. Wait a second. You started something. Finish it. You started something that might finish you. Meaning? Meaning that dame. If you're trying to be funny, it's not coming off. Now, you're a smart cop. Don't you think you ought to find out something about her before you go off the deep end? I don't have to know. She's all right by me. I could tell you a few things. Nobody asked you. Had I know something about her. I don't want to know the kind of things you know. This thing's wrong for shut you. Shut up. She'll use you and throw you to the door. I said shut up. You bullheaded cop. Can't you see that? Get out of here. About that drink. Get out. I didn't want it anyway. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to That Hammer Guy. Uh, 
Barney. I told you not to come back and... Sorry to disappoint you. You, uh... You must have the wrong apartment. Well, the only... The only thing wrong about this apartment is you. And I'm here to set you right. Now, don't try to close the door on me. If you don't leave, I'll call the police. Yeah. Yeah, somebody like Pat Chambers, but you'd better call them fast before they rip the badge off his uniform. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, they come in and explain. Very late. Yeah, for you. Oh, damn, I come in. Well, what have you got to explain? Suppose you start. Things aren't the way you think they are. Oh, you're not at all convincing, particularly without a gun in your hand. If you give me a day or two, you won't need any explanation. The time you're going to get will be a lot longer than that. What are you going to do? Pat Chambers is still a cop with a sharp sense of duty. I wouldn't want to watch his face when he makes the arrest. What arrest? You. No. You can't do that. I can do a lot of things when it comes to black men. You can't do it. You don't understand. Why not? Please. You're touching me. Is it too much to ask for a little more time? I can't afford it. I've been through too much. Look, I don't mind a dame holding a gun on me like you did last night, but when she turns out to be a cheap little blackmailer that's gone for a guy like Pat Chambers, it's too much. It's not what you think it is. You might have convinced me before your friend Barney Miller had his boy use my face for a punching bag, but it took a right cross from Pat to knock some sense into me. He hit you? Who's your friend? It's just a one-way street right now. I'm his friend. Well, I know you won't believe me, but I'm sorry. Yeah, you're going to be even sorrier unless you talk. It's about time I get repaid for my trouble. If I tell you now, it'll spoil everything. I don't care what it spoils. Why did you want that negative? Pat must know. Why not? Promise not to tell him, please. I'm not making any bargains with you. You were desperate enough to kill to get that negative. Why? To help Pat? You got your names mixed up. You mean to help Barney Miller? To help him stop Pat Chambers from breaking his syndicate? You don't have to have a Phi Beta Kappa key to figure that one out. Miller was using you to get inside information, wasn't he? Well, wasn't he? Well, I can't deny that. You bet you can't. But it didn't turn out that way at all. Now, if you'll only listen... I got funny ears. They'll only hear the truth. It's true that Barney Miller was using me to hurt Pat. He wants to stop the investigation, and he hired me to get friendly with Pat so he could set it up. Set what up? Pat's finish. That negative was a picture of Pat kissing me. He's going to release it to the papers. Pat said you were engaged. How could the story hurt him? I see you don't know as much about me as you think. Well, you can throw me in. What's the difference now? You know I'm from the West Coast, all right. And it won't take you long to find out I've spent half my life in jail out there. I'm an ex-convict. What? Well, that was the plan. It's what Barney was paying me for. Oh. After that picture in your record was published, Pat couldn't be a cop in a Keystone Comet. Something went wrong. I... I fell in love with Pat. Sure. Really. I had to get that negative by any means possible to keep him from hurting you. Even if I believed you, a dead punk named Charlie Fergus would call you a liar from his grave. Try explaining that. He took the picture, and then he decided to double-cross Barney. Yeah, to sell a negative to the highest city. Barney's men were out hunting him down. But you got the negative first. I had to. So what's next? Nothing's next. Things will go on just like Pat and I planned. He's a cop. What do you think will happen to him when he finds out he married an ex-con? He never has to know. He'll find out someday. What then? Why don't you leave me alone? Forget about him. Do him the big favor, huh? Let us alone and we'll make out all right. You've got no more chance in a snowball and an incinerator. Please don't interfere. No dice. I've never begged them. No dice. I told you the truth. Don't you believe me? Doesn't make any difference what I believe. The way things are, some things can be, some can't. All right, where's that negative? This is my one hope, my one chance. Where's the negative? That's the one man I'm You'll get over it. You know, I'll tell you something. I believe you do love him. Prove it to me now. The negative is in a public locker at the bus station. Okay, suppose we get it. What fun? Yeah. Suppose all three of us go down and get that negative. <laughs> Miller takes you and the dame down to his car. He has her drive, and he sits in the back seat with the nose of his revolver pressed cold against your neck. Lucky for me, Trask was watching the house. I would have hated missing you, Hammer. I could live without this conversation, Miller. Well, very funny. I bet you're wondering whether you can live with it. I hope Marie's driving doesn't make you uncomfortable. Bye. I hate women drivers, particularly the kind that use double crossroads. Maybe I'm being honest for the first time in my Just life. Just shut up and keep driving. 
Hey, you're going the wrong way. It's the only way. Turn it around, Marie. You're not going to get that. Turn around or I'll let you have go it. Go ahead, car. shoot. What good will it do Take now? Take your hands off that wheel. Let's go. I'm not getting that negative. You're driving me. Look out. Marie. Turn me alone. I wanted to die. Come here, I'll help you out. Go on, and you've helped enough. Miller's dead. I gotta get you out of here. Barney's dead? Yeah. And so's your past, if you want it that way. I owe you a big favor. Anything you want. Any help you ask. Anything? Just name it. And help me get out of this town. Help me do that. As quickly as you can. Anything she wants, she promises. And that's the way it is. You get the bags from her apartment, and then you take her out to the airport and wait there with her till a plane's ready. Look, it, uh, it doesn't have to be this way, Marie. Some things can be in some cats. You said so yourself. I can be wrong. You wanted me to prove how much I cared for him, and I'm proving it now the best way I can. It's going to be rough on him. It would have been rougher the other way. You know I'm right. Yeah. What am I going to tell him? Just the part that will make him forget me. I won't forget No, him. I'm not worth remembering. A plane's ready now. Hurry. Hey, I've been looking all over for you, Marie. What happened? Where are you going? Well, I'm going none of your business. Oh, what's wrong? Marie. Get your hands off me. Oh, what's wrong? You're going to tell your me. Your friend here will tell you. Mike? He'll tell you and he'll show you the negative. Now get your hands off. I hate it when a cop puts his hands on me. I hate it every second when he touched me. Marie. I wouldn't want to miss that plane. So long, cop. Marie. Pat. Get out of my way. i got to find out. I'll tell you, Pat. I'll tell you everything you should know. You go outside with Pat. And as Marie's plane melts into the sky, you tell him only what he should know. Only what Marie wanted him to know. It takes him an agonizingly long time before he can say anything. And when he does, the sickness inside you makes you choke. I should have listened to you right at the start, Mike. You've always known about things. You've always known about things. Yeah, sure. What you found out you don't know about things would fill a book. Here is Larry Haynes as Mickey Spillane's Bat Hammer Guy. A poetic guy, at least you won't admit one of the joints where you hang out. But come spring and the hardcore inside you starts to crack and melt away. And you find yourself rhyming June and June. And like they say, in the springtime a guy's fancy turns to thoughts of light, I think. Right now your fancy is turning to the lightest thing in your life. Your girl Friday Zelda, who's the juiciest looking game to you any day of the week. You've got an hour to flutter before you date with her and you amble through Central Park. You spot the couples and princes, and you're hoping that the warm evening breeze will melt that final wall of resistance felt always high. You're walking along a gym with path, creating exciting fantasies in your mind when you hear the voice. I beg your pardon. The game is sitting in the lawn, almost hidden in the shadow. A voice says a person tickling at that your ear. Naturally, you're curious about the rest of it. You got time, so you walk over to it. My light is in a stubborn mood. Could you help me? You strike a match, and the light wipes away the shadows. You like what you see. You like it so much, you gawk like a hit kid who sees a sideshow dance act for the first time. You would uh, better be careful. Huh? The mask. You burn your fingers. The mask? Oh, the mask. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Anything. Nice man. Very. You, uh... Waiting for somebody? Okay, it's none of my business. No, I'm not waiting for anyone. Why? Some kind of a funny place for a dame like you to be alone. I guess that's none of my business either. I'm not a dame. Well, just an expression I use loosely. Then maybe you'd better tighten up your vocabulary. I'll uh, take that under advisement. I'm sorry, I had no right to be too nasty. Everybody should be that nasty with me. I came to the park because I like it here. Protective coloration, huh? I, I beg your pardon? The black dress you're wearing. And uh, sitting here in the shadows. Protective coloration. I learned about it in biology once. 
Animals use it to hide from other animals to prey. I have nothing to harm. This, like a trick. Thanks again for the light. Grab it, mister. Oh, so long. Oh, wait. Yeah? You, uh, you don't have to go if you don't want to. Well, it wasn't really. I'm pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Well, I've been known to make mistakes. But it might be a big one. I'll take my chances. A gambler? But me, you direct. I like you. You're direct. My name's Martha Bowman. I like you. But you're not direct. I don't know what you mean. I mean, you're lying. What? About your name. Just what are you talking about? Still last name. It's not Bowman. No? Then what is it? You tell me. Just what sort of a game is this? I suppose you tell me that, too. Now, excuse me. Look, I'm I... no cop. I'm not going to blow the whistle on you. You think that... When I lit your cigarette, I saw the monogram on your bag. The initials were M, J, and Bowman doesn't begin with J, even on a loose vocabulary, does it? I'm sorry I was nice to you. No, you're not. You want me here with you. That's the idea, isn't it? Where did you get that silly idea? You want me here because you're in some kind of a jam. Oh, ridiculous. You don't know what you're talking about. You know I do. Why are you sitting here in the dark? Why'd you give me that phony name? That doesn't do the thing. Uh, maybe this will. Uh, you can't go. You just got back to me. I'll scream. Go ahead. Yell your head off. You. Yeah, here's what I was talking about. This gun. A forty-five is kind of big to carry around in such a small purse. Or is that the latest Persian style? Give me that gun. Maybe after we talk. You give it to me or I'll get the police. You do. And you'll have to show them a license. The cops are real fussy about things like that. Now, um, what about that talk? It wouldn't interest you. Try me and see. All right, all right. But do you mind if I light another cigarette, sir? When you hold up another match for her, you see her hand shake like a marble key going over a rough road, and the muscles in her face draw tight. You flick out the match and wait for her to begin. But you don't even hear her get to the first word. <laughs> Something blunt and heavy cracks into the back of your skull. The red flash of pain rips through you, and then you dissolve into black nothing. When you come to, you feel in your pocket for a match, and the first thing your hand touches is a gun, and the steel of it is as warm as light. After you light up the match, you see it's the same gun, the Dame's forty-five, and two shells are missing from the clip. Then on the grass behind the bench, you see the Dame herself, with two circles of blood despoiling the front of her dress. She's dead, all right. And in your hand is the gun that killed her. You start looking through her handbag when you hear footfalls echoing down the walk. You make him out as he passes under a lamp. It's a cop and he's in a hurry. The way things stack, you figure you've got as much chance if you stick around as a bold like a dame in a beauty contest. You get out of there and more of a hurry. Then you phone Zelda from the base station. Don't tell me who this is. Let me guess. Look, Zelda, there's a legit reason for my being late. But of course, something in the way of business came up. Yeah, the worst kind. For you. Will you give me a chance to explain? Why bother? Will you listen? I was walking across the park and I met this dame. Just two ships that pass in the night. Oh, thanks. I just as soon spare myself the details if you don't mind. It's nothing like you think. It was murder. You're telling me. Look, the dame is dead, shot to death, and it looks like I did it. Mike, you're not kidding. I'm not kidding. Now, look, there's something you got to do for me. All right, Mike, anything. Anything. You give Zelda a fast rundown on what happened. Then you tell her to get in touch with your friend Captain Pat Chambers a homicide, but not to let on to it. I'll call Pat right away. You start to feel better after you hang up. You know Zelda can handle Pat okay. You're in a tough spot, but you got a dame on your side who can use her head for something else than a parking lot, perhaps. By the time you get to Zelda's place, she's already talked to Pat. For a moment, you forget all about the jam. All you can think about is this appetizing day, and you can't resist telling it. Don't you know there's a time and place for everything? We've got the place, and there's always time. Oh, what am I going to do with you anyway? Anything you want, you're not. Well, right now, I want you out of this mess. Mike, you never should have run away. Well, I told you, Zelda, the odds were stacked against me. I was a sitting pigeon. You could have explained anything to Pat. He's your friend. He's also a cop. And the way things were, he'd have been as official with me as that badge he wears. Uh, what else did Pat tell you? Just what I told you. Nothing on our identification? They're making a fingerprint check. Are you sure her first name is Marcia? No, but it could be. And according to the monogram on that handbag, her last name began with a J. No idea why she was killed. I told you, I just met her. Well, all right. You don't have to holler at me. Well, you act like you still don't believe me. I want to, Mike. You can. It isn't going to be easy. Believing me? Finding the killer. There's nothing to go on. Just one thing. What? I found this watch in her pocketbook when I yanked out the gun. It was the only other thing in there. Hmm. Women don't usually carry a watch like that. Yeah, but men do. 
And there's this inscription on the inside. The GM was lost from NJ, 1953. NJ, the girl's initial. Yeah. Yeah, it's something, Mike. Well, it could be more. If I can trace it to the store where it was bought. Oh, wait. What? Something I forgot. Pat did say they had some chance of cracking the case. It's lucky you left that gun at the scene of the crime. The serial number? Mm -mm, no, the serial number was filed off. Then? They did find fingerprints on the gun. That should help. Oh, yeah, great help. It'll help lead Pat right straight to me. A hundred to one, those prints on the gun are mine. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. So you're off and running in another rat race, only this time it's yourself you're trying to keep out of the trap. And so far, the only thing that's going to keep it from closing on you is that man's watch you got out of the dead dame's handbag. You and Velda do a tracking job. Two days later, you trace the watch to a jewelry store on Madison Avenue. And from there, the trail leads to the Elms, a roadhouse up in Westchester where the right connections will get you into the back room, where the suckers flip with Lady Luck on the green felt card and dice table. It's 9 in the p.m. when you amble into the joint, and you're greeted by a bamboo blonde who looks like you just stepped down from the G.I.'s pinup collection. Hello. It's the way she says that is intended to make you feel like you're the last guy on earth. Oh, you're alone. Terrible. I'm going to ask you, Peter. Maybe I can help? I wouldn't be surprised, Jonathan. Well, I'm here to help. Do what I can to light my peach in the evening. And uh, pocket work, too? Now, oh, that is a crude enough. Oh, I'm a good cool guy. I, I like a man who doesn't put his country. Actually, I like a dame who can take it. Oh, there is a long time. Only time will tell. I have all evening. I wish I did. You know what hate me. Uh, maybe we'll talk about the pros and cons of that later. Well, there's a cozy table over there in the corner. Why not talk about it now? Because right now, there's some talking I want to do with Ted Beckley, the character who runs this joint. Oh, he's expecting? Mm-hmm. Uh, Ted's busy, I know. Uh, suppose you tell him I've got to see him in place. Well, you make it sound really important. A murder is always kind of important, especially to the one who gets killed. What's this all about? Well, right now, Darby, that's between Beckley and me. And uh, that door over there, Mark, the private, that's uh, Beckley's office. Yeah, you, you come on. I'll take you to the table. Yeah, you wait here, please. Oh. Here, there's someone outside. Oh, who is it, Darby? I don't know. The name is Hammer Beckley, Mike Hammer. Hey, who asked you in here? Can't you read the sign of the door says private? That means strictly. Uh, that's what I'm hearing about, Beckley. Something strictly private. He says it's something about murder, can you? You a cop? Uh-uh. I just keep this hat on because I didn't brush my hair this morning. Come on, what are you? A crude guy by nature, a private investigator by what they call profession. What's this murder stuff about? So that's what I want to find out. You don't talk sense. I will. Get back out front, Dorothy. But I... Do what I tell you. Well, all right, please. Okay, Hammer, let's have it. Who was killing a couple of nights ago in Central Park, a dame? So far, she hasn't been identified. I traced the man's watch she'd bought a year ago to a jewelry store. According to the store's record, that watch was nailed here to a George Norton. Know anything about Norton? George used to be my partner. The dame who bought the watch gave me the name of Marsha Jordan. Know anything about her? Uh, sure, Marsha used to work here. She was George's girlfriend before he took up with Dorothy. The dame who brought me in here. That's right. You see Marcia Jordan lately? No, not for six months. Not since that night it happened. Since what happened? Since that night, George and Marcia went for that car ride. Since that night, the big kill cop found George Norton in that car with two slugs in his head. As you leave Beckley's joint, you drive up to Peekskill and check out his story with a local gendarme. Beckley said it to you straight, all right, right down the line. Then you stop at a gin mill across the street and phone Veldy in town. But now that Mark himself is dead, it, it could mean the police are wrong about it. You know it could mean that. It could mean that she kept herself under wraps for six months to save her own skin. What now, Mike? What now? You feel as useless as a deep freeze in an egg room. You tell Veldy you'll see her at the office in the morning. All right, Mike, but take it easy, Carla. Zelda knows you. She knows the frustration leads you to the bottle. You hang up, not making any empty promises. Then you go over to the bar and order a double bourbon. Mind if I join you? You tell the little guy with a mouthful of gleaming white choppers that you do mind. To be alone, that is bad enough. To be alone and unhappy, that is terrible. Look, if I want my fortune told, I'll go to a gypsy hero. I'm only trying to be friendly. 
I got enough friends. And perhaps enemies too, huh? Do you like that music? A rumba. I put the money in a machine to play that. A rumba. My favorite. I always play that one. For five cents, you can recapture a memory. A song. One song can mean so much in your life. Uh, Look, whatever your name is. Carlos Gomez. And it's a pleasure to know you. That song. A sad memory. Even the moment I recapture is not really mine. She was so beautiful, like a star. But she could never do mine. I danced with her only once to that song. I think inside she laughed at me. <laughs> I was so nervous and so clumsy. But I didn't care if she laughed. I would have done anything for her. Anything she asked, no matter what she thought of me. Beautiful. Like a star. Can you understand what I mean? Yeah, maybe I can, but what's the difference? Oh, it is especially important that you understand. Why me? Because perhaps in a way you can do something for her, which I can. Why should I do anything for her, whoever she is? Because you will be doing it for yourself at the same time. She was Marcia Jordan. What? I follow you here. I overhear what you said in Beckley's place. I'm a waiter there. A waiter, but I'm a man too. None of them, they don't know what a man I am. They don't know nothing about me. Soon I will laugh at them. Out loud I will laugh. The Jordan name. Every time I play that music, I close my eyes. I see myself dancing with her. That one dance. I see myself not clumsy and nervous the way I was. But... Elegant, graceful. You said I could do something for myself. And for her. You mean about getting a killer? Yes. Well, what is it? Tomorrow night I will have what you want. I am sure. Well, what's the matter with tonight? No, no. You will have to wait till tomorrow. There will be no mistake then. You can meet me. You name the place and when, Gomez. The side streets are on the corner. Ten o'clock. You step out of your car, I will come to you. Ten o'clock. All right. I'll be there. Oh, she was like a star. So beautiful. But this time. You go back to town, and all the next day you're haunted by Carlos Gomez's pathetic dream of love, his tragic devotion to a dame as far out of his reach as a star. You're at your place, getting set to drive up to Peekskill for your meeting with Gomez. Hello? Is this my camera? Yeah. Oh, I'm glad I got to you before you left. Who is it? Uh, that's not important. I had to talk to you before you went up to meet Carlos Gomez. Well, how did you know about Don't that? Don't ask any questions. Just listen to what I got to say to you. I just found out what Gomez is going to put on you. He isn't going to give you what you're looking for. Who told you I had an appointment with Gomez? Please, will you just listen? You want to stay alive, don't you? Yeah, I'm sure you still have it now. Well, you won't if you meet Gomez. Believe me, the minute you step out of your car to meet Gomez, you'll get the same as the other cop. Two bullets through you. See ya? You've got a good idea who made that call, but you're not checking back on it just yet. Now, you're not sure what to expect. So, you make ready for any kind of a twist. That warning you figured could have been a gimmick to sidetrack you, and then again, it could have been legitimate. So you get hold of Zelda, and you two work out an emergency arrangement. You drive up to Peekskill to meet Carlos Gomez the way you set it up. The side street is as dark and deserted as a losing candidate's headquarters an hour after the election results are in. You're parked right in the middle of the block. You figure the car up ahead is Gomez. You wait a second and then open the door. It won't be long now till you find out just what Gomez's intentions are. You lift the dressmaker's dummy from the seat beside you and push it on the sidewalk. Gomez makes his intentions known just one second later. In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, Fast Hammer Guy. Right after the shot split the air, Gomez's car starts up and fades into the night. You turn your Cooper on and start back to town. All the way back, you keep thinking of those two neat round holes the slug made in the dummy's head. You feel a lot better that they're not in yours. You're in your place for only a couple of minutes when the call from Zelda comes through. I did as you told me, Mike. And? I've been on Gomez's trail from the time his car pulled out of that side street. Believe me, I wanted to go back to you after I heard those shots. Are you all right? Yeah, but you could see that dummy. Uh, where are you, Ellen? I'm calling from a bar up in White Plains, a place called the Onyx. It's on Central Avenue. Gomez goes straight there? Mm -hmm. He's sitting in a booth in the rear. He's looking around as if he were expecting someone. Okay, honey, I'm on my way up. <laughs> You get in your coupe and go up the West Side Drive, cut into Central Avenue and stay on it until you get to the Onyx and White Plains. Zelda well, is to wait for you at the phone in the front part of the journey, but she isn't there. You're starting to get some black, unhappy thoughts about her when you spot her waving to you. 
in the rear. Oh, Mike. Am I glad you're here? I thought you'd never get here. What's wrong? What? I, I didn't know what to do, Mike. It's an awful spot. Fire, what are you talking about? What happened to Gomez? Where is he? Well, that's what I'm talking about, don't you? Well, come on, come on. Where is he? Just where I found him after I phoned you. I didn't know how it happened. Well, the way you make sense, what happened to Carlos Gomez? Where is he? Just where I found him, here in the booth, under the table. What? Look for yourself, Mike. He's dead. <laughs> You look for yourself. Gomez is dead, all right. He's rolled up in a ball under the table, and the brown handle of a knife is sticking out between his shoulder blades. Mike, what are we going to do? There's only one thing for you and Velda to do. Get out of there and pass. You can feel her trembling as you take her arm on the way out. Oh, Mike, I never was so glad to see anybody in my life. You tell her you're going to make a prove of that later on when there's time. I'm going with you. I've gone this far. You tell her she's gone far enough. From here on, you're playing at the key. After you put Velda in her car and send her off, you drive over to Beckley's Roadhouse. Ted Beckley isn't any healthier this time. Dorothy Peters is conspicuously absent from the joint. You find out where she lives and go over to her place. Yes? Oh, you. The way she says that is intended to make you feel like you're the last guy on earth. It's the last guy she wants to see. What do you want? First, I want to thank you for lightening my evening. I know what you're talking about. I'm talking about that phone call you made to me before I left for my appointment with Gomez. Phone call? Gomez? You're not making sense. According to the switchboard record downstairs, I'm making a lot of sense. You made a call to my number. So the least I can do is to thank you for my life. I'm curious, uh, why did you bother? Yes, Dorothy, why did you bother? <laughs> Go ahead in, Hammer. This time I'm inviting him. I don't see how I can refuse your invitation, Beckley. Well, I don't see how either. Well, it's in great than it's 45. Inside, both of you. But you weren't feeling well tonight, huh, Dorothy? Sick. So you couldn't come to work. Dad, You're going to be even sicker. I followed you here, Hammer. Failing me has turned out to be a sort of a national sport. I followed you because you gave me sort of a shock when you showed up at my place alive. You know what I mean? I can guess. Dorothy, he doesn't have to guess. She knows. Don't you, Dorothy? Well, no, Don't I... she does, Hammer. She knows I had you tabbed for the same place I sent George Norton. I had it set up nice and neat. Carlos Gomez was going to put on another shooting session for me, just like he did on Norton. But somebody tripped up me and Gomez. And it's a good thing Gomez isn't alive to hear about it. He'd be awfully disappointed. Gomez is... Dead. Didn't break my heart. I figured I didn't need him anymore. I had somebody pay him off at the Onyx Bar over in White Plains. Now to you, Dorothy. Somebody tipped Hammer off. That somebody was you. Oh, no, Ted, I wouldn't do anything like that. Guys, how would I know? You didn't tell me. Nobody knew about the deal I had with Gomez except you. But, but you didn't tell me, Ted. That's right, I didn't. Well, then how could I know? I tried to figure out how Hammer got wise, and then I remembered. I remember you were standing outside my office last night when Gomez walked out. And you had your ear to the door. You heard what we said. All right. Did I hear it? Well, I can say thanks again anyway, Dorothy. Why did you do it? Why? Martha Jordan. What? You wasn't a bad kid. You promised me, Ted, you wouldn't keep after her. You promised me as long as you kept the mouth closed about George Norton, you'd let her alone. What was she to you? Nothing. Just a nice kid. Too nice to get what she ended up with. What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? I set up a nice spot for us. I get Norton out of the way so the club is mine. Ours. And then you go full of rotten, lousy trick like that. I couldn't help it, Ted. You can't go on killing. I had to stop you somewhere. I just had to stop you. No wonder you didn't call the cops. I just wanted to stop you, that's all. And she did, Beckley. Not yet, Hammer. But still you. And her. You won't get away so easy this time. I'll take my chances. Now get over there with her. Go on, get over there. <laughs> You move over next to the dame. You can see she doesn't feel any way about it. But with you, it's different. Like I said, I'll take my chances. And you'll take yours. You don't know just how, but you do know you don't have much of a choice. But when the door buzzer starts to cough, you get an unexpected choice. Strictly take his eyes off you for an instant, and in that instant, you take off with a flying leap head first. You hit him with all you've got, and the wind hisses out of him like gas is going from a jet. He goes down and starts to roll on the floor like a lopsided apple. The guy's still in his hand, and he can still make a lot of trouble for you. So you bend over him, and with a back of your hand, back him right behind the ear. From then on, he's a sleeping rabbit. The buzzer is still sounding off. You go to the door and open it. 
Do you find out the twist starting finish for this evening yet? Well, it took you long enough to answer. Zelda glares at you like the schoolgirl that finds her boyfriend carving another kid's initials on a tree. I followed you because I thought you might need me, and what happens? I find you in another woman's apartment. You tell her you've never been so glad to see anybody in your life. You're going to have a job proving that. Everything is proven for you when you bring her in and show her back. On the way back to town, she tells you how sorry she is. I am right. I'm so sorry for you said to me. But the way things stack up, you're not a bit sorry. Because that final wall of resistance, all that keeps between her and you, starts to crumble into beautiful dust. <laughs> And now, here is Ted DeCorsia in the Nicky Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. <laughs> You're not a poetic guy, at least you won't admit to it around the joints where you hang out. But come the spring and the hardcore inside you starts to crack and melt away. And you find yourself rhyming June and moon. And like they say, in the springtime a guy's fancy turns to thoughts of light, I think. Right now, your fancy is turning to the lightest thing in your life. Your girl Friday, Zelda, who's the juiciest looking game to you any day of the week. You've got an hour to slutter before you date with her, and you amble through Central Park. You spot the couples in clinches, and you're hoping that the warm evening breeze will melt that final wall of resistance felt always high behind. You're walking along a dim lit path, creating exciting fantasies in your mind when you hear the voice. I beg your pardon. The dame is sitting on a bench alone, almost hidden in a shadow. A voice says a pleasant tickling effect on your ears. Naturally, you're curious about the rest of it. You got time, so you walk over to it. My light is in a stubborn mood. Could you help me? You strike a match, and the light wipes away the shadows. You like what you see. You like it so much, you gawk like a hick kid who sees a sideshow dance act for the first time. You would uh, better be careful. Huh? The match. You burn your fingers. The match? Oh, the match. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Anything? Nice match. Very. You, uh, waiting for somebody? Okay, it's none of my business. No, I'm not waiting for anyone. Why? Some kind of a funny place for a dame like you to be alone. I guess that's none of my business either. I'm not a dame. Well, just an expression I use. Look. Now, maybe you'd better tighten up your vocabulary. I'll uh, take that under advisement. I'm sorry, I had no right to be so nasty. Everybody should be that nasty with me. I came to the park because I like it here. Protective coloration, huh? I, I beg your pardon? The black dress you're wearing and uh, sitting here in the shadows. Protective coloration. I learned about it in biology once. Animals use it to hide from other animals to prey. I have nothing to hide. This, I can see. Thanks again for the light. Glad to miss that. Now, so long. Oh, wait. Yeah? You, uh, you don't have to go if you don't want to. Well, I wasn't really. I'm pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Well, I've been known to make mistakes. Well, this might be a big one. I'll take my chances. A gambler? When the art direct. I like you. You're direct. My name is Marsha Bowman. I like you. But you're not direct. I don't know what you mean. I mean, you're lying. What? About your name. But what are you talking about? Their last name. It's not Bourne. No? Then what is it? You tell me. Just what sort of a game is this? Well, suppose you tell me that, too. Now, excuse me. Look, I'm I... no cop. I'm not going to blow the whistle on you. You think that... When I lit your cigarette, I saw the monogram on your bag. The initials were M and J, and Bowman doesn't begin with J, even on a loose vocabulary, does it? I'm sorry I was nice to you. No, you're not. You want me here with you. That's the idea, isn't it? Where did you get that silly idea? You want me here because you're in some kind of a jam. Oh, ridiculous. You don't know what you're talking about. You know I do. Why are you sitting here in the dark? Why'd you give me that phony name? That doesn't do the thing. Uh, maybe this will. Oh, Dad, you can't let go. You do that back to me. I'll scream. Go ahead. Yell your head off. You. Ah, here's what I was talking about. This gun. A forty-five is kind of big to carry around in such a small purse. So is that the latest Parisian style? You give me that gun. Maybe after we talk. You give it to me or I'll get the police. You do, and you'll have to show them a license. The cops are real fussy about things like that. Now, um, what about that talk? It wouldn't interest you. Try me and see. All right, all right, but do you mind if I light another cigarette, please? up another match for her. You see her hand shakes like a model T going over a rough road and the muscles in her face draw tight. You flick out the match and wait for her to begin. But you don't even hear her get to the first word. Oh. 
something blunt and heavy cracks into the back of your skull. The red flash of pain rips through you, and then you dissolve into black nothing. When you come to, you feel in your pocket for a match, and the first thing your hand touches is a gun, and the steel of it is as warm as light. After you light up the match, you see it's the same gun, the Dame's 45, and two shells are missing from the clay. Then on the grass behind the bench, you see the Dame herself with two circles of blood just spoiling the front of her dress. She's dead, all right. And in your hand is the gun that killed her. You start looking through her handbag when you hear footfalls echoing down the wall. You make him out as he passes under a lamp. It's a cop and he's in a hurry. The way things stack, you figure you've got as much chance if you stick around as a bow legged dame in a beauty contest. You get out of there and more of our... Then you phone Velda from the base station. Don't tell me who this is. Let me get Look, Velda, there's a legit reason for my being late. But of course, something in the way of business came up. Yeah, the worst kind. For you. Will you give me a chance to explain? Why bother? Will you listen? I was walking across the park and I met this dame. Just two ships that passed in the night. Oh, thanks. I just assume soon spare myself the details if you don't mind. It's nothing like you think. It was murder. You're telling me. Look, the dame is dead, shot to death, and it looks like I did it. Mike, you're not kidding. I'm not kidding. Now, look, there's something you got to do for me. All right, Mike, anything. Anything. You give Zelda a fast rundown on what happened. Then you tell her to get in touch with your friend Captain Pat Chambers of Homicide, but not to let on to it. I'll call Pat right away. You start to feel better after you hang up. You know Zelda can handle Pat okay. You're in a tough spot, but you've got a dame on your side who can use her head for something else than the parking lot for hats. By the time you get to Velda's place, she's already talked to Pat. For a moment, you forget all about the jam. All you can think about is this appetizing dame, and you can't resist telling her. Don't you know there's a time and place for everything? We've got the place, and there's always time. Oh, what am I going to do with you anyway? Anything you want, you know it. Well, right now, I want you out of this mess. Mike, you never should have run away. Well, I told you, fellas, the odds were stacked against me. I was a sitting pigeon. You could have explained anything to Pat. He's your friend. He's also a cop. And the way things were, he'd have been as official with me as that badge he wears. Uh, what else did Pat tell you? Just what I told you. Nothing on our identification? They're making a fingerprint check. You sure a first name is Marcia? No, but it could be. And according to the monogram on that handbag, her last name began with a J. No idea why she was killed. I told you, I just met her. Well, all right. You don't have to holler at me. Well, you act like you still don't believe me. I want to, Mike. You can. It isn't going to be easy. Believing me? Finding the killer. There's nothing to go on. Just one thing. What? I'm just watching her pocketbook when I yanked out the gun. It was the only other thing in there. Hmm. Women don't usually carry a watch like that. Yeah, but men do. And there's this inscription on the inside. To GN with a loss from NJ, 1953. NJ, the girl's initials. Yeah. Yeah, it's something, right? Well, it could be more. I can trace it to the store where it was bought. Oh, wait. What? Something I forgot. Pat did say they had some chance of cracking the case. It's lucky you left that gun at the scene of the crime. The serial number? Mm -mm, no, the serial number was filed off. Then? They did find fingerprints on the gun. That should help. Oh, yeah, great help. It'll help lead Pat right straight to me. A hundred to one, those prints on the gun are mine. In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. <laughs> Yourself, you're trying to keep out of the trap. And so far, 
the only thing that's going to keep it from closing on you is that man's watch you got out of the dead name's handbag. You and Velda do a tracking job. Two days later, you trace the watch to a jewelry store in Madison Avenue. And from there, the trail leads to the Elms, the roadhouse up in Westchester, where the right connections will get you into the back room, where the suckers work with Lady Luck on the green felt card and dice table. It's 9 in the p.m. when you amble into the joint, and you're greeted by a bamboo blonde who looks like you just stepped down from the G.I.'s spin-up collection. Hello. The way she says that is intended to make you feel like you're the last guy on earth. Oh, you're alone. Hello. I'm Dorothy Peters. Maybe I can help? I wouldn't be surprised, Dorothy. I'm here to help. Do what I can to light my face in the evening. And their uh, pocketbooks, too? Now, that is a crude enough. Oh, I'm a good guy. I, I like a man who doesn't put his punches. Actually, I like a dame who can take it. Oh, then we get along fine. Only time will tell. I have all evening. I wish I did. You know what hate me? Uh, maybe we'll talk about the pros and cons of that later. Well, there's a cozy table over there in the corner. Why not talk about it now? Because right now, there's some talking I want to do with Ted Beckley, the character who runs this joint. Oh, easy, Becky. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ted's busy, I know. Uh, suppose you tell him I've got to see him anyway. Well, you make it sound really important. A murder is always kind of important, especially to the one who gets killed. What's this all about? Well, right now, Dorothy, that's between Beckley and me. And uh, that door over there marked the private. That's the uh, Beckley's office. Yeah, you, you come on. I'll take you to table. Yeah, you wait here, please. Uh. Oh, is it, Darcy? I don't know. The name is Hammer Beckley, my camera. Hey, who asked you in here? Catch you read a son of the door says private, that means strictly. Uh, that's what I'm here about, Beckley, something strictly private. He said it's something about murder to you. You a cop? Uh-huh. I just keep this hat on because I didn't brush my hair this morning. Come on, what are you? A crude guy by nature, a private investigator by what they call profession. What's this murder stuff about? And that's what I want to find out. You don't talk sense. I will. Get back out front, Dorothy. But I... Do what I tell you. Well, all right, then. Okay, Hammer, let's have it. There was a killing a couple of nights ago in Central Park, a dame. So far, she hasn't been identified. I traced a man's watch she'd bought a year ago to a jewelry store. According to the store's record, that watch was nailed here to a George Norton. Know anything about Norton? George used to be my partner. The dame who bought the watch gave me the name of Marsha Jordan. Know anything about her? Uh, sure, Marsha used to work here. She was George's girlfriend before he took up with Dorothy. The dame who brought me in here. That's right. You see Marcia Jordan lately? No, not for six months. Not since that night it happened. Since what happened? Since that night George and Marcia went for that car ride. Since that night the police killed a cop found George Norton in that car with two slugs in his head. If you leave Beckley's joint, you drive up to Peekskill and check out his story with a local gendarme. Beckley's headed to you straight, all right, right down the line. Then you stop at a gin mill across the street and phone Velda in town. But now that Marcia herself is dead, it could mean the police are wrong about her. You know it could mean that. It could mean that she kept herself under wraps for six months to save her own skin. What now, Mike? What now? You feel as useless as a deep freeze in an egg room. You tell Velda you'll see her at the office in the morning. All right, Mike, but take it easy, call it. Velda knows you. She knows the frustration leads you to the bottle. You hang up, not making any empty promises. Then you go over to the bar and order a double burst. Mind if I join you? You tell the little guy with a mouthful of gleaming white choppers that you do mind. To be alone, that is bad enough. To be alone and unhappy, that is terrible. Look, if I want my fortune told, I'll go to a gypsy zero. I only try to be friendly. I got enough friends. And perhaps enemies too, huh? Do you like that music? Yerumba. Yeah, I put the money in a machine to play that. Yerumba. Yeah, my favorite. I always play that one. For five cents, you can recapture a memory. A song. One song can mean so much in your life. Uh, look, whatever your name oh, is. Carlos I... Gomez. And it's a pleasure to know you. That song. A sad memory. Even the moment I recapture is not really mine. She was so beautiful, like a star. But she could never be mine. I danced with her only once to that song. I think in touch she laughed at me. I was so nervous and so clumsy. But I didn't care if she left. I would have done anything for her. Anything she asked, no matter what she thought of me. Beautiful. Like a star. Can you understand what I mean? Yeah, maybe I can, but what's the difference? Oh, it is especially important that you understand. Why me? Because perhaps in a way you can do something for her, which I can. Why should I do anything for her, whoever she is? Because you will be doing it for yourself at the same time. She 
What? Marsha Jordan. What? I follow you here. I overhear what you said at Beckley's place. I'm a waiter there. Waiter, but I'm a man too. None of them, they, they don't know what a man I am. They don't know anything about me. Soon I will laugh at them. Out loud I will laugh. The Jordan dance. Every time I play that music, I close my eyes. I see myself dancing with her. That one dance. I see myself not clumsy and nervous the way I was, but elegant, graceful. You said I could do something for myself. And for her. You mean about getting a killer? Yes. Well, what is it? Tomorrow night I will have what you want. I am sure. Well, what's the matter with tonight? No, no. You will have to wait till tomorrow. There will be no mistake then. You can meet me. You name the place and when, Gomez. The side streets are on the corner. Ten o'clock. You step out of your car. I will come to you. Ten o'clock. All right. I'll be there. Oh, she was like it. Uh, so beautiful. But this time. <laughs> You go back to town, and all the next day you're haunted by Carlos Gomez's pathetic dream of love, his tragic devotion to a dame as far out of his reach as a star. You're at your place, getting set to drive up to Peekskill for your meeting with Gomez. Hello? Is this my camera? Yeah. Oh, I'm glad I got to you before you left. Who is it? That's not important. I had to talk to you before you went up to meet Carlos Gomez. Well, how did you know about that? Don't ask any questions. Just listen to what I got to say to you. I just found out what Gomez is going to put on you. He isn't going to give you what you're looking for. Who told you I had an appointment with Gomez? Please, will you just listen? You want to stay alive, don't you? Yeah, I'm sure you said I have it now. Well, you won't if you meet Gomez. Believe me, the minute you step out of your car to meet Gomez, you'll get the same as the others got. Two bullets through you. You've got a good idea who made that call, but you're not checking back on it just yet. Now you're not sure what to expect. So you make ready for any kind of a twist. That warning you figure could have been a gimmick to sidetrack you, and then again, it could have been legitimate. So you get hold of Delta, and you two work out an emergency area. You drive up to Peak Skill to meet Carlos Gomez the way you set it up. Besides the street, it's as dark and deserted as the losing candidate's headquarters an hour after the election results are in. You're parked right in the middle of the block. You figure the car up ahead is Gomez. You wait a second, and then open the door. It won't be long now till you find out just what Gomez's intentions are. You lift the dressmaker's dummy from the seat beside you and push it on the sidewalk. Gomez makes his intentions known just one second later. In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. <laughs> And now back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, that hammer guy. After the shot put the air, Gomez's car starts up and fades into the night. You turn your coupe around and start back to town. All the way back, you keep thinking of those two neat round holes the slugs made in the dummy's head. You feel a lot better that they're not in your head. You're in your place for only a couple of minutes when the call from Zelda comes through. I did it, you told me, Mike. And? I've been on Gomez's trail from the town his car pulled out of that side street. Believe me, I wanted to go back to you after I heard those shots. Are you all right? Yeah, but you could see that dummy. Uh, where are you, Helen? I'm calling from a bar up in White Plains, a place called the Onyx. It's on Central Avenue. Well, Gomez goes straight there? Mm -hmm. He's sitting in the booth in the rear. Keeps looking around as if you were expecting someone. Okay, honey, I'm on my way up. You get in your coupe and go up the West Side Drive, cut into Central Avenue and stay on it until you get to the Onyx in White Plains. Well, there is to wait for you at the phone in the front part of the journey. But she isn't there. You're starting to get some black, unhappy thoughts about her when you spot her waving to you from a booth in the rear. Oh, Mike, am I glad you're here? I thought you'd never get here. What's wrong? What? I, I didn't know what to do, Mike. It's an awful spot. Matt, what are you talking about? What happened to Gomez? Where is he? What are you talking about, Gomez? Oh, come on, come on. Where is he? That's what I found him after I phoned you. I didn't know how it happened. Well, the way you make sense, what happened to Carlos Gomez? Where is he? Just where I found him, here in the booth, under the table. What? Look for yourself, Mike. He's dead. <laughs> for yourself. Gomez is dead, all right. He's rolled up on a ball under the table and the brown handle of a knife is sticking out between his shoulder blades. Mike, what are we going to do? There's only one thing for you and Velda too, to get out of there and pass. You can feel it trembling as you take her arm on the way out. Mike, I never was so glad to see anybody in my life. You tell her you're going to make a prove that later on when this time. I'm going with you. I've gone this far. You tell her she's gone far enough. 
From here on, you're playing at the keep. After you put Velda in her car and send her off, you drive over to Beckley's Roadhouse. Ted Beckley isn't any help to you this time. Dorothy Peters is conspicuously absent from the joint. You find out where she lives and go over to her place. Yes? Oh, you. The way she says that is intended to make you feel like you're the last guy on earth. It's the last guy she wants to see. What are you on? First, I want to thank you for lightening my evening. I know what you're talking about. I'm talking about that phone call you made to me before I left for my appointment with Gomez. Phone call? Gomez? You're not making sense. According to the switchboard record downstairs, I'm making a lot of sense. You made a call to my number. So the least I can do is to thank you for my life. I'm curious. Uh, why did you bother? Yeah, Dorothy, why did you bother? <laughs> Boy, that in, Hammer. This time I'm inviting him. I don't see how I can refuse your invitation, Beckley. Well, I don't see how either. Well, it's been great on this 45. Inside, both of you. But you weren't feeling well tonight, huh, Dorothy? Sick. So you couldn't come to work. Ted, You're going to be even sicker. I followed you here, Hammer. Failing me has turned out to be a sort of a national sport. I followed you because you gave me sort of a shock when you showed up at my place alive. You know what I mean? I can guess. Dorothy here doesn't have to guess. She knows. Don't you, Dorothy? Well, no, Don't I... Don't you, Dorothy, Emma. She knows I had you tabbed for the same place I sent George Norton. I had it set up nice and neat. Carlos Gomez was going to put on another shooting session for me, just like he did on Norton. But somebody tripped up me and Gomez. And it's a good thing Gomez isn't alive to hear about it. He'd be awfully disappointed. Gomez is... Dead. Didn't break my heart. I figured I didn't need him anymore. I had somebody pay him off at the Onyx Bar over in White Plains. Now to you, Dorothy. Somebody tipped Hammer off. That somebody was you. Well, no, Ted, I wouldn't do a thing like that. Besides, how would I know? You didn't tell me. Nobody knew about the deal I had with Gomez except you. But, but, but you didn't tell me, Ted. That's right, I didn't. Well, then how could I know? I tried to figure out how Hammer got wise, and then I remembered. I remembered you were standing outside my office last night when Gomez walked out. You had your ear to the door, you heard what we said. All right. Did I heard? Well, I can say thanks again anyway, Dorothy. Why did you do it? Why? Marcia Jordan. What? You wasn't a bad kid. You promised me, Ted, you wouldn't keep after her. You promised me as long as you kept the mouth closed about George Norton, you'd let her alone. What was she to you? Nothing. Just a nice kid. Too nice to get what she ended up with. What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? I set up a nice spot for us. I get Norton out of the way so the trouble is mine. Ours. And then you go full of rotten lousy trick like that. I couldn't help it, Ted. You can't go on killing. I had to stop you somewhere. Ted, I had to stop you. No wonder you didn't call the cops. I just wanted to stop you, that's all. And she did, Beckley. Not yet, Hammer. But still you. And her. You won't get away so easy this time. I'll take my chances. Now get over there with her. Go on, get over there. You're over next to the dame. You can see she doesn't feel any way about it. But with you, it's different. Like I said, I'll take my chance, and you'll take yours. You don't know just how, but you do know you don't have much of a choice. But when the dog buzzer starts to cough, you get an unexpected choice. Quickly takes his eyes off you for an instant, and in that instant, you take off with a flying leap at first. You hit him with all you've got, and the wind pulls out of him like gas as you give him a jet. He goes down and starts to roll on the floor like a lopsided apple. The guy is still in his hand, and he can still make a lot of trouble for you. So you bend over, and then with a bag of your hand, back and right behind him. From then on, he's a sleeping rat. The buzzer. Is still sounding off. You go to the door and open it. And you find out the twins aren't finished for this evening yet. Well, it took you long enough to answer. Well, they're glares at you like the schoolgirl that finds her boyfriend carving another kid's initials on a tree. I followed you because I thought you might need me. And what happens? I find you in another woman's apartment. You tell her you've never been so glad to see anybody in your life. You're going to have a job proving that. Everything is proven for you when you bring her in and show her back. On the way back to town, she tells you how sorry she is. I am, right. I'm so sorry for mistaking But the way things stack up, you're not a bit sorry. Because that final wall of resistance, all that keeps between her and you, starts to crumble into beautiful dust. Here's Ted DeCorsia in the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. On the corner of your desk in your old tilted back and relax. It's your
your favorite slant. Not so much because of the load that takes off your spine, but especially because it angles your eyes just right to watch Zelda across the room. Seven o'clock at night and it gives me ten pages to do. You give her back a smug grin and make a note about the pretty curve her neck makes rising from her shoulders. You had to get these forms out like I had to dye my hair green. You'd be the saltiest greenhead on the block. You get salt from sleeping in a salt mine. <laughs> now, you just be a nice office wife and the boss will buy you dinner. Now, wait just one second. Is this a strange left-field plan to tap me into getting sick on spaghetti again? What's wrong with Mario's spaghetti? It wiggles on the plate all by itself. So we'll eat someplace else. Now? Carry on, my dear. Caress those cheeks. Oh, Mike. Saved by the bell. Answer it. Answer it yourself. You me. Yeah. Mr. Hammer? Yeah. I don't know you, Mr. Hammer, but we have a mutual friend. Mm, what do you want? Jim Gordon. I'm calling about Jim. You've got to help him. He's got his back up against the wall, and they're going to... Come... Yeah? Hello? 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 We had a big night all planned out just for you and Velda. But the phone call cuts it out before you can even start. You and Dulder get on the phone and start checking to see what kind of a gag this is. You try the trucking office where your old friend Jim Gordon runs his freight business, but nobody answers. You call Jim's brother, but he's not around. You run out of phone calls just in time. Hello? Mike, I've been trying to get you all night long, but your lousy phone's been ringing busy. You don't like the sound of Pat Chambers' voice, and when you hear what he's got to say, you like what he says even less. Words around, you've been looking all over for Jim Gordon. Well, I'm looking, but what's that got to do with homicide? Plenty, Mike. I found him. Yeah, where? In his office in the freight terminal. So what has that got to do with me? Nothing. Unless you can tell me why he put a bullet through his head. You know all the answers, all right, but not to a question like that. Because you know Jim Gordon, too. And he just isn't the type. You've crawled in the mud with Jim Gordon and watched him fight. And when he got it hanging on the barbed wire, you saw him grab his last ounce of life and slam away until he came back. Nobody like Jim Gordon turns a gun on himself. And it's going to take a long, cold hunk of proof to try to prove otherwise. You take Velda along with you to see a guy both you and Jim knew. He isn't a mutual friend. Well, that's the way the ball bounces, Hammer. Some guys just don't have it. Craig Lawrence has plenty, but he's the kind of a grabber that never thinks he has enough. His favorite method is to buy up the trucking competition, and if that doesn't work, he forces them on. Look, Hammer, we talked enough. Now, how about you and this Jane getting out of my office? Oh, what's your hurry, Lon? I'm a busy man. I run a trucking business, not a quiz show. You're really broken up about Jim Gordon, aren't you? Gordon was nothing to me, just a wildcat punk who scrubs the nickels on short hauls. He wants to knock himself off, that's his business. That wasn't what he told me a couple of weeks ago. Which means? You tell me. What's to tell? How about starting with a reason why you wanted to buy him out? So I offered to buy him out. He also told me you would turn down flat. Nobody turns Craig Lawrence down flat. Maybe the police would be interested in that angle. Look, you two, don't go making something out of nothing. It's more than nothing to me. So he was your friend. That's got nothing to do with me. Maybe it hasn't. If it was really suicide. What kind of a crack is that supposed to be? You've got a clear track with Jim Dead. That is, if you can make everybody believe he killed himself. But his friends know he wasn't the type. He knew better. Look, it was suicide up and down. If you'd have been here before when the cops were around, you'd have gotten the story straight. How straight can a story be without witnesses? You could be wrong about that, Hammer. What do you mean? Maybe there was a witness. Who? Henry Bryant, Gordon's dispatcher. And where is he? How should I know? Oh, nice and pat, huh? Just a little too fat. Okay. Suppose you check with the cops. They're satisfied it was suicide. I don't know what kind of a cop would go for that suicide, Jan. But maybe Captain Chambers will have a different idea. And I'm going down to homicide and talk to him. <laughs> yeah. You do just that, Alan. Because Chambers is just the cop who went for it. Chambers was here. He said it was suicide. <laughs> You drop Veld off on the way down to Pat Chambers' office. 
He always figured pant for a smart cop, but his attitude now could go down in history as a guy bucking for stupid. I only know what I see, Mike. I don't read crystal balls. I work right down the fact road. You're ready to blow your stack. You just can't figure how Pat can swallow a yarn like that. Now, take it easy, Mike. Take it slow and easy. But I told you, a guy called me about him being in trouble. I told you about Lawrence trying to buy Jim up. You know what kind of a muscle man Lawrence is. He's got a reputation that'd make Bluebeard look like a cream puff. Yeah, I know, I know. Then how can you have the gall to call this a suicide and close the book on it? What else can I do? Oh, I don't get you, Pat. For the first time, I don't read you at all. Well, if you think I'm convinced that Jim Gordon killed himself, you better buy some new bifocals. Well, then why? To give him some string right along. When they think they're getting away with it, we'll catch them off base. Where did you get that badge? From a correspondence school? Mike. You've worked the truth out of tougher guys than Lawrence. Why don't you book him on suspicion? Lawrence? Ah, not him. It's the other guy I'm worried about. What other guy? Henry Bryant, the Gordon dispatcher. Oh, come on, Pat. You don't suspect Bryant, do you? Why not? The handlers down at the terminal told me that Gordon and Bryant were given to dispatching each other from time to time instead of the freight. Pat, they're like you and me. Just because we level off from time to time doesn't mean we kill each other. Then where is Henry Bryant? Why'd he disappear? I don't know. But we'll have the answer when we find him. We? What do you mean, we? Well, I'm going to help you find him. In a pig's eye you are. Now, look. I'm I... trying to be a nice guy. I'm asking you politely to stay out of this. No interference, get me? Interference? A friend of mine's eyes and you... I'm can't... asking you just once stay out. We'll find Henry Bryant our own way. The city pays us to do that, not you, understand? Pat, I can't hear a word you're saying. All right, then I'm through asking you nicely. Now I'm telling you, lay off. If I find you sticking your nose in this, it goes down to my book as obstruction of the law. In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. Obstruction of the law. You've been as thick with Pat Chambers as frozen glue. And now, when you want to help him get the guy you're both looking for, he tells you to lay off. <laughs> you lay off, all right. You lay off like a desert rat lays off water in an oasis. You pick Veld up just in time to keep her from going to sleep. Don't let it get you, Mike. She tries to find the words, but everything she says makes the steam bubble inside even more. You can't blame Pat for trying to work things out his own way. Well, that isn't good enough for me. To him, it's just another job, another file in his office. But you know Jim was more than that for me. Yes, I know. But there's nothing you can do now. There's plenty I can do. Sure, plenty. Like getting into trouble, like risking your life. And... I know, Velda, but... I just can't help it. It's a chance I gotta take. So you take the chance. The chance of locating Jim Gordon on your own. Zelda finds Henry Bryant's address in a phone book for you, and then you both head up there. You figure maybe somebody in the house can give you a lead. Mike, you're just raking over dead ashes. The police must have been there already. They must have questioned everybody. Sure, but sometimes even the cops don't get all the answers. It's in this block. Now, remember, I'm going to say I'm Brian's cousin. All right. Hey, hey take it easy. Why try testing your brakes now? Look up the block there, that parked car. What about it? That's Lawrence's Nash convertible. What? Are you sure? Positive. He had it in the loading dock at the freight terminal. Hey, maybe your hunch was right. Hold it, Dalton. What now? Look, that guy running down the steps. A guy with his hat pulled over his face. He's got his car. There they go. And we're going to tail him. Who is he, Mike? I couldn't see his face with a hat pulled over it like that. Why do you think he had it pulled down? Well, I'll bet all the stays in your grandma's court that that guy under that hat was Henry Bryant. <laughs> the car is going, it doesn't waste any time. You break a few speed laws across the town and then follow it across the bridge and out into the country. It slams north onto the main highway for 25 miles and then suddenly cuts over into a side road. That side road turns out to be bad luck for you. Mark, I don't see the car. Honey, I'll like that for luck. I lost them. 
<laughs> Maybe they took the turn at the fork a few miles. Ah, they came this way, all right. Oh, this is great. I keep on their tail for over 30 miles, and then I have to lose them out here in the middle of nowhere of all the lousy breaks. Well, at least we know in which direction they were headed. We can notify Pat Chambers. Oh, sure, Pat. You know what he'll say about me cutting in. Obstruction of the law. Mm -hmm. Well, I just have to take the chance and tell him. And your license will go with it. Yeah. And hey, there's a building off the road up ahead. Yeah, the only one. I'll phone Pat from there. And while I'm there, I'll take a look around. Wait, there's a sign. Wearing sanitarium. Yeah. Maybe Pat will let you off easy. Well, don't bet on it. You wait here. I'll be out in a minute. May I help you? Uh, the name's Mike Hammer. I want... I'm Frank Waring, the administrator of this sanitarium. How can I help you? Well, you can help me by letting me use your phone. I have to call the police. Anything wrong? No, I get these crazy impulses from time to time to let them know I'm still alive. The police. Of course, Mr. Hammer. This way, please. I assume it's very important. Yes, yeah, sort of. I, uh... been trying to track down my cousin, Henry Bryant. Henry Bryant? He's your cousin? You mean he's here? Why, uh, yes. Mr. Hammer, how did you know? Well, I followed him here from the city, and then I lost the car on the way. But I wasn't sure he came to this sanitarium. I got to see him right away. No, oh, I'm sorry. It may not be wise to disturb the patient. Patient? What are you giving me? Mr. Bryant is in a very serious mental state. Now, hold on, Waring. Somebody's giving you a routine. There's nothing wrong with Bryant. The guy he worked for was killed early tonight... And he was there when it happened. Early tonight? Why, that's impossible. You see, Mr. Hammer, Henry Bryant hasn't been out of the sanitarium since he was admitted at 5 o'clock last night. When your jaw stops bouncing off the floor, Waring takes you to his office and shows you the records. The report states that Henry Bryant was admitted to the sanitarium at 5 o'clock the evening before. But you're not satisfied at all. The whole setup reads as phony as a set of aluminum teeth. You're in for a bigger surprise when Waring tells you he has no objections to your seeing the patient. Mr. Bryant is in the room up ahead. He leads you down the corridor to a corner room. This is the door. Now, please remember, do not excite him unduly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Bryant, huh? You have a visitor. This gentleman, Mr. Hammer, claims he knows you. <laughs> His name isn't that. He's lying. I never saw him before. Please, don't let him hurt me. Henry, you remember me, Mike Hammer. No. I no. came to see you about Jim Gordon. Jim! You wanted a spy. Jim sent you to. Henry, Henry, Jim's dead. Oh. He's a saint. Mr. Waring, he's come to kill me. Please don't let him kill no, me. No, 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 Mr. Bryant. No one is going to harm you. Please don't let him kill me. Please don't let him. I, I don't want to die. Please don't let him do it. You'd better leave now, Mr. Hammer. Well, maybe you'll quiet down a minute, then I can ask I'm him. I'm sorry. I can take no further risk with the patient. Please wait for me in my office. <laughs> You don't bother to wait. You get back out to your car in Belva. You wait till you get out to the main highway before you fill her in. He sounded like he was insane. Well, uh, Henry Plant's no crazier than I am. But I'll tell you one thing for sure, he's scared stiff. What do you mean? Uh, I just can't put my finger on it, but Brian is really frightened. It wasn't part of his act. Would you think he knows something about Jim Gordon's death? Plenty. He was the guy we saw get into Lawrence's convertible. But you told me Mr. Waring said Bryant was admitted to the sanitarium last night. Waring was lying. Bryant was wearing the same suit that I saw on him when he got into Lawrence's car back in town. Then Waring must be in on it, too. Up to his eyeballs. Henry Bryant is being hidden at that sanitarium for a reason. He's only faking insanity. And Waring's tied up with it. Yeah, I got all the answers, but go prove them. Maybe we can prove them, all of them. Okay, Velda, you tell me how. Okay, I will. Take the next turn to your left. That'll bring us to the village of Glendale. Well, what's Glendale got to do with it? Dr. Harris has his office there. You remember him. Harris? 
Oh, yeah, the nice old guy we helped out last year. And now Dr. Harris can help us. Come on, come on, what are you getting at? You want to prove that Henry Bryant isn't insane, don't you? So? So I figure it'd be a good idea for Dr. Harris to have me admitted to that sanitarium as an emergency patient. Uh, and I'll wait. Of course, under an assumed name, like, uh, Jane Barnes. Nothing doing, fellow. Of all the crazy ideas. We're going to talk to Dr. Harris right now. Absolutely not. You're not going to talk me out of this, Mike. If Henry Bryant is as frightened as you say he is, there's a good chance he might confide in a sympathetic fellow patient like, well, poor Jane Vaughn. In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. And now, back to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. You thought you'd be a smart guy and keep Belda late at the office so she'd have to have dinner with you. Instead, you're both on a wild goose chase after a guy who might be a material witness to a friend's murder. Now, to make matters worse, Belda's got the bright idea that she can get the dope you want by having herself committed to the sanitarium where the witness is. Yes, Mr. Waring, that's correct. Miss Jane Barnes. Yes, I'll bring the patient over immediately. You sit in the corner and stew while Dr. Harris makes all the arrangements. The more you think of the deal, the less you think of it. No, that wasn't so bad, was it? Look, Velda, will you please listen to me? Mike, we've been through it all. Everything is settled. Not as far as I'm concerned. You'll feel much better when we get the facts that will make Captain Chambers thank you for interfering. Listen, I'm going to call Pat right now and tell him everything. Oh, no, you're not. Velda, can't you understand that you're walking right into the middle of a nest of rabbits? I can take care of myself. Don't kid yourself. Craig Lawrence is mixed up in this, and Lawrence plays the game for keeps. What happens if you get stuck in there and need help? Oh, I've thought of that, Mike. You stay right here in Glendale. If I do need help, I'll phone Dr. Harris. I'll say, um, I want my brother to come and visit me. That'll be a signal, all right? And I can't talk you out of this. No. Okay, Velda. Or is it Jane Barnes? Now, you remember the signal for help. I want my brother to come and visit me. And now we'd better have Dr. Harris deliver his patient to the sanitarium. <laughs> You wait. You sit at Dr. Harris's phone and wait, but nothing happens. Every time the phone rings, you jump for it, but it always turns out to be a routine call for the doc. He finally takes off on an emergency case, and you flop down on his operating table to wait some more. The night is almost over when the phone rings again. Hello? Dr. Harris, this is Miss Jane Bond. It's me, Bella Mike. Yes, Dr. Harris, I know. Well, Dr. Harris was called out on a case an hour ago. I've been standing by in case you phone. Dr. Harris, I'm very lonely here. I want my brother to come and visit me. Okay, Velda, I'll get Dr. Harris right away and come over and get you. Please hurry, Dr. Harris. Please hurry. <laughs> You don't bother to wait for Dr. Harris. When you swing into the side road leading to the Waring Sanitarium, you change your mind about the direct approach. You leave your car down the road and get to the building from the rear. The basement entrance is open. You come through the lower corridor and head up the stairs. Nobody's around. You head to the door where you saw Henry Bryant and try the door. It swings open. Bryant is lying on the floor, and you have to get down real close to see that he's still alive. Scared. I was scared. You kneel down close to him and beg him to talk. I walked in on Lawrence and Jim. I saw him shoot. Then Jim didn't kill himself. Lawrence, I saw him. They made me come here. Zelda, where's Zelda? Who? The girl that was brought in. They said they'd... Kill me. Brian, tell me, where is she? You me. You know what? What? They 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 did. You watch 
watch Henry Bryan's eyes turn blank as the fear washes away. And it washes over you when you think of what they could have done to Velda. Rather strange visiting hours, brother. You jerk around to see Waring standing against the door jam, pointing a gun at you. Don't move abruptly, Mr. Hammer. I hate the sight of blood. Well, you're a pretty sharp guy, aren't you? Sharp enough to know what's going on in my own sanitarium. I'm afraid your girlfriend is in a much more serious condition than I thought. Meaning? Delusions, you know. She said she called Dr. Harris. So? She couldn't have Hammer. Dr. Harris is dead. What? One of our doctors was called out 20 minutes ago. There was an auto accident down the road, and Dr. Harris was killed in that accident. Now, Mr. Hammer, you will please go down the hall to my study. <laughs> He handled the gun like it was part of his hand. So you head down the hall and wait as he unlocks the door. Well, young lady, you wanted your brother to come and visit you. Here he is. Hello, Bella. Micah, I'm sorry. You're going to be sorry, you haven't. Lawrence! I've been waiting for you with open arms. And this Mike. Gun. You two should have kept your noses out of where they don't belong. Rick, why didn't I listen to you? I've made a terrible mess of things. No, no, no. Take it easy, fella. It was a great idea while it lasted. What about the car, Waring? It's out in the rear, Mr. Lawrence. First make sure Brian's dead. Then get in and bring it around the side entrance. I'll take care of these two. Right away, Mr. Lawrence. Hey, it's handy to have a stooge running a plant like this, isn't it? Mike, what are they going to do to us? I'd rather not ask. You don't have to, I'll tell you. You two and me are going for a ride, but you're not coming back. All right, start walking. Oh, after you, Mr. Lawrence. Wise guy. Huh? Just being polite. You'll just be dead if you try any phony moves. All right, get going. to the door at the end of the hall. I'm sorry, Belle. What I wouldn't give for the sight of Captain Chambers right now. You can double that for me and add a million. If I hadn't been so stubborn, if I... <laughs> Mike! Mike, that shot, I thought you... No, baby, I'm okay, but... How did Lawrence get it? I'm how? Captain Chambers. Pat, where did you come from? I was hiding around the corner of the corridor. I had to clip him because he had his gun on you and he might have used it on you two if he'd seen me. He's wearing... He went for the car. Ah, you just relax. We grabbed him when he came down the hall before. Pam, how the devil do you happen to be here? <laughs> I used a new correspondence school system. Okay, okay, rub it in. Now I had a tale of Lawrence all the time, Mike. When I got word he was on his way out of town, I just made up my mind to see where he was going personally. While I had this sanitarium spotted outside, I uh, happened to see you go in. Huh? You mean, you were outside all the time? Yeah, right. Well, why didn't you stop me right then and there? Stop you? I figure there's only one sure way of stopping you. Lock you up, say, for uh, obstruction of the law. Oh, Pat, you, you wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, would you? I would. If you haven't learned a lesson. Oh, believe me, Pat. I've learned it for the both of us. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Hi, Pat. What's on your mind? Ever heard of A, B, and C? Well, yeah, back in the first grade. Oh, oh look, I'm not talking about the alphabet. I'm talking about an advertising agent. Oh, well, what about it? Well, the A stands for Appleton. Alfred Appleton, 55 years old, and Eastern Trust has his life insured for $100,000. So? It's annuity. It starts paying off at the age of 65, and we'd like to see him collect it. Looks like somebody else has different ideas. What do you mean? He thinks somebody's trying to kill him. Oh, I see. You want me to run down to New York and talk to him? Uh, he's up at his weekend place now, about 100 miles up the coast, overlooking the sea at uh, Skeleton Point. You can talk to him there. Skeleton Point? Now, that's a cheerful name. I know. Johnny, mm. make sure it stays just a name. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, 
Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Trust and Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the 11 o'clock matter. Expense account item one, eight dollars forty cents gas and mileage on my car to Skeleton Point through a drenching rainstorm. The Appleton home, perched high on a cliff at the edge of the sea, was an old weather beaten affair, but right now it looked mighty good to me. Yes. Is this Mr. Appleton's house? This is the Gregory house. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Appleton only leases this house. Oh, I see. Well, is he at home? I believe he's expecting me. You're Mr. Dollar? Yes. I'm Mrs. Gregory, the housekeeper. Come in. Mrs. Gregory had a strong, determined face and dark, metallic, piercing eyes. She took my coat and pointed to a door across the entry hall. I was conscious of her eyes following me as I entered the library to find two men seated in front of an open fire. Johnny Dollar? Yes, sir. I'm uh, Al Appleton. This is my attorney, Grant Hillman. How are you, Mr. Dollar? Well, uh, a little damp, Mr. Hillman. All right, here. Sit down to the fire. Dry out. Oh, thanks. Ooh, feels good. And slightly warmer than the welcome the housekeeper gave you, I imagine. Mrs. Gregory? Well, uh, she did seem a little reserved. Mm, She's a widow. Owns this house. But I love the place, so... Well, anyway, I'm glad you came. I understand there's been some sort of attempt on your life, Mr. Appleton. Well, uh, Mr. Appleton has received several well, crack notes lately. We thought it wise to take what precautions we could. Have you notified the police, Mr. Hillman? No, no, I vetoed the idea, Johnny. Oh, why, Mr. Appleton? I didn't want that kind of publicity right now. My advertising agency's right in the middle of landing a fat new account. Your agency is A, B, and C. That's right. Who are B and C? A C is nobody. Hmm. Tom Baker and I liked the idea of ABC, but we didn't have any other partners, so C just stands for company. Well, this Tom Baker is your only partner, then? He was. There's some question as to whether he still is. I don't follow you. Uh, Al, I don't think there's any need to go into that now. I guess you're right, Grant. Anyway, I don't want to accuse Tom of anything until I've got a chance to go over the books this weekend. Al, did I hear someone at the door a moment? Uh, This is Johnny Dollar, Laura. Mr. Dollar, my wife. Oh, I see. Um, how do you do, Mr. Dollar? Mrs. Appleton? Uh, Dollar, the crank letters Al has been getting are up in my room. I'll bring them down. Okay, Mr. Hellman. You'll uh, stay overnight with us, won't you, Johnny? Now, haven't you imposed on Mr. Dollar enough, dear? Perhaps he has business back in the city. Nonsense. And with that storm out there, oh, I'll have Mrs. Gregory make a room for him. Well, uh, would you like a drink, Mr. Dollar? No, uh, no thanks. Mrs. Appleton, you seemed rather surprised when you saw me here. Who did I? Almost as though you were expecting someone else. Someone else? Why, no, I... I wasn't expecting anyone in particular. Well, perhaps I just... Wait, hold it. What's the matter? That flash of lightning, there's someone outside that window. Oh, no, you, you must be wrong. Stay right here. I grabbed my coat and went out into the storm. Because of the prowler, sure but also because of Laura Appleton. Because she'd been staring at that same window, shaking her head quickly as though warning someone. But outside in the downpour in the mud, I could see no one, no footprints. Finally, I went back inside to the phone in the entry hall to call the local police. But the phone was dead. Maybe the storm had knocked down the lines. Yeah. Or maybe someone just wanted to make sure we'd have a nice, cozy weekend, undisturbed. And my hunch was... It might be too cozy for comfort. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now for another episode in the life of Sergeant Donald Bellwether, my husband. Donald? Yes, 
there. But much farther is it? Oh, about a hundred miles. You're not getting sleepy, are you? No, no. no. Oh, I'm all right. Now, you just close your eyes, honey, and take another nap. We'll be home soon. Okay. Will you stay awake now? Yeah, I will. Oh, there's still the reason to stop in the hotel. Sleepy, it's on. Let me stop a while. Take a little nap. It's a good idea. So what if we do get home later than we plan? At least we'll arrive in good health. Yeah, you're so right. About 1,800 American drivers lose their lives each year because they fall asleep at the wheel. Mm. Well, I'm just not going to make it 1,801. Have we caught far off the highway? Yeah, we're way off the road, honey. I'll just take a nap for about an hour. I'll be refreshed, and we'll be on our way again, huh? Mm-hmm. All right, dear. Well, sir, I'm not going to make it 1,801. And you're not going to make it 1,802, either. Oh, that's my Donald. That's my doll. <laughs> And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the 11 o'clock matter. Did you uh, see anybody outside, Mr. Dollar? In that rain, Mr. Hillman, I couldn't see 10 feet in front of me. Can you describe the face you saw at the window? Well, it was more of a silhouette. I couldn't even tell if it was a man or a woman. You sure you did see someone, Johnny? Yes, reasonably sure, Mr. Appleton. Uh, Come in. Your partner is here, Mr. Appleton. Tom Baker? Hello, Al. I thought I'd surprise you. I tried to call you earlier, but your phone was out. Well, uh, this is a surprise. Well, I'd like you to meet Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Hi. Tom, you're soaking wet. My car hit a big puddle about half a mile down the road and quit on me. I had to walk the rest of the way. Did you just now get here, Mr. Baker? Well, yes. Why? Uh, Mr. Dollar thought he saw someone outside the window a few minutes ago. Oh, no, I just now got here. Well, I've got some extra clothes up in my room that should fit you, Tom. Let's get you changed before you catch cold. Thank you, Elmer. Oh, look, this rain is getting all of us down. Why, why, why don't we live a little? Huh? Well, how about going down to the beach house, building a fire, playing some records, having some drinks, huh? Uh, yeah, that uh, might be a good idea. Where's the beach house? Uh, down near the bottom of the cliff for the beach. Uh, it's real nice. But uh, in this weather? Oh, there's a stairway leading down. Yes, why don't we go down there? I'm I'm getting the creeps just sitting around here like this. So we went down to the beach house. The rain had let up a little, but nobody seemed to feel much like a party. We just sat there in front of the fire, not saying much. Once or twice I thought I'd detected Laura Appleton and Tom Baker exchanging quick glances. But I couldn't be sure. That's the intercom from the house, Al. Oh, yeah. I'll get it. Yes? Oh, yes, Mrs. Gregory. You can go on to bed. We won't be needing you anymore tonight. You know, bed sounds like a good idea. Oh, it's almost 11 and I'm beat. So, if you'll excuse me. Oh, sure, sure. Well, why don't we all... Al... Could we have our talk now? Oh, okay, Tom, if you insist. Laura, why don't you fix us another drink? All right, Al. How about you, Mr. Dollar? Uh, Yeah, I'm with you, Hellman. Let's go on up to the house. Glad the rain has let up. Yeah. Mr. Hillman, I didn't come with you because I was tired. I wanted to talk to you. I thought as much. Earlier this evening, Appleton said something about not wanting to accuse Baker of anything until he'd gone over the books this weekend. What did he mean? 
Well, I'm not really sure, Mr. Dollar. All I know is that Al seems to think he may have found some irregularities in the books of his advertising agency. Oh? Well, if there is anything wrong, I blame myself partially. How so? Well, I manage most of Al's affairs, but the agency has been running so smoothly, at least so I thought, that... Well... I see. That, that's going to change, as of right now. I didn't come up to go to bed either. I'm going to work on those books. Ought to take me about an hour. Uh, just about 11 now. Will you be up by midnight? Yeah. I'd like to know what you find out. Uh, where is that light switch? I never could remember. Dollar. What is it? There's somebody else in here. Look out. What? Dollar. Dollar. I guess I was out only a few seconds because the clock was still striking when Hellman brought me to. Dollar. Are you all right? Uh, what? What? Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I grabbed at him, whoever he was, but he knocked me loose. By the time I got the lights on, he was gone. Oh. Lucky for you, he only stunned you momentarily. Oh, brother. <sighs> Hillman, did you see where he went? Well, he didn't leave by this front door here, I'm sure of that. Then he must be still in the house. We worked our way through the house room by room. Finally, ten minutes later, we stood by an open window in a back room. Well... Here's our answer. You got out this window. Yeah. What is it? What's the matter? What? Oh, Mrs. Gregory. Yeah, Mr. Dollar was attacked by a prowler. A prowler? What? That's terrible. Where's the intercom to the beach house? We'd better tell Mr. Apple. Uh, right there on the wall. Ah. This button here? Yeah. No answer. Come on, Hillman. Let's get down there. We pounded out of the house and along the path to the edge of the cliff. Then we found her, Laura, standing at the top of the wooden stairway. One section of the railing was broken away. We looked over the cliff. There was a body lying on the rocks down below. It was Al Appleton. <laughs> Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Do you know who said, democracy is based upon the conviction that there are extraordinary possibilities in ordinary people? Those words came from the American religious leader, Harry Emerson Fosdick. From the earliest days of the United States of America, there has been the sentiment that the average person can achieve an important goal if he is given an environment in which he can develop his capabilities to the fullest extent. An environment in which the individual is given the rights and privileges that he needs for development. It is the duty of every American to protect and stimulate this environment. Remember the words of Harry Emerson Fosdick. They are part of your American heritage. The extraordinary possibilities of ordinary people are inherent in American democracy. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the 11 o'clock matter. We stood on the stairway at the top of the cliff looking down at Appleton's body on the rocks below. That is, Hillman and I did. Laura Appleton was in a state of shock, and we couldn't get much sense out of her. We had Mrs. Gregory take her back to the house, then Hillman and I got a flashlight and climbed down the rocks to Appleton's body. Dead, Mr. Dollar. We better not move that body until the police get here. Yeah. Let's see. His wristwatch stopped at 10 after 11. It's 11.30 now. Right. And because the clock was just striking 11 when I got hit over the head in the entry hall... Yeah, so then we must have spent 10 or 15 minutes searching the house for that prowler. Meantime, he or somebody else was shoving Appleton over the cliff. Somebody else? There were a couple of people with Appleton down at the beach house. Laura and... and Tom Baker, I'd forgotten about Tom. Where is he? Right now, Hellman, that's a very good question. We went back to the house. The phone was working now, so I put in a call to the local sheriff's office. But all the units were out on call. They'd send somebody as soon as they could. I started for Laura Appleton's room. Grant Hillman overtook me in the hall. Dollar, I made a preliminary check of the agency records Appleton brought up here with him this weekend. Did you find a shortage? Yes, possibly as much as $50,000. 
I see. Thanks, Hellman. Yeah, I'll see you later. Come in. Oh, Mr. Dollar. I, uh, I'm feeling better now. I'm sorry to bother you with questions, Mrs. Appleton, but I'm afraid I have no choice. Yes, I understand. I want you to tell me exactly what happened. Well, I, I'll try. After you and Grant Hillman left the beach house, my husband and Tom Baker and I sat there a few minutes, and then Tom left. I see. Then, a couple of minutes later, somebody from the house called my husband on the intercom, so he left me. What time was that? Oh, uh... A few minutes after 11, I guess. Uh-huh. What happened then? I, uh, I sat there a few minutes longer. Then I, well, I, I just didn't feel like sitting there alone. So I started up the stairway. When I got to the top, I, I saw that the rail had been broken away. I, I looked over the edge. Okay. Mrs. Appleton, why did Tom Baker come here this evening? I, I, I don't know. I think you do. What? You tried to warn him when I saw his face at the window earlier. His face? A- and the two of you kept exchanging glances all evening. I know you're wrong. Listen, Grant Hillman's in a position to know something about your husband's business affairs, isn't he? Well, of course. Why? Your husband suspected a shortage. Hillman confirmed it a few minutes ago after going over the records. Oh, but surely you don't think that Tom Baker Baker had... was your husband's partner. Maybe he came up here to try to square things with him. Was that it? No. Oh, all right. Tom did come up here to talk to my husband. What about? I was going to ask for a divorce. To marry Tom Baker? Oh, I... I know it sounds sordid now after what's happened, but it wasn't that way at all. Tom and I wanted everything in the open. We wanted to tell Al. But I... But I didn't realize that you and Grant were going to be here this weekend. That's why I tried to signal Tom not to come in. Go on. Down at the beach house, he wanted to talk to Al, but... Well, I guess he couldn't bring himself to it. That's why he went for a walk. And you haven't seen him since? No. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I, I know my story doesn't sound very convincing, but but if you're trying to suggest that either Tom or I killed my husband... Yeah? Uh, Dollar, could I see you a minute? Oh, sure. I'll talk with you later, Mrs. Appleton. What is it, Hellman? Tom Baker just walked in. Baker? Yes, I thought you'd want to talk to him. I sure do. Well, look... Mrs. Appleton claims somebody called her husband at the beach house on the intercom a few minutes after 11. If so, that's what lured him up to the top of the stairway. A few minutes after 11? Well, that's when you and I were searching the house. We ended up at the intercom last, though. Somebody could have had time to make that call. Oh, now, wait a minute. Mrs. Gregory was near that room when we got to her. Yeah, I know. Why don't you question her, Hellman, while I see what I can get out of Baker? <laughs> time, Dollar, I didn't have anything to do with it. I went for a walk on the beach. I didn't even know Appleton was dead until Grant Hillman told me a few minutes ago. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah, well, I'm afraid we'll have to let the police decide that, Baker. Sheriff Station, Maloney. Hello, Johnny Dollar at the Appleton place. I'm still waiting for one of your units. Oh, yeah, I'm well, sorry, Mr. Dollar. We've had a lot of calls on account of the storm. Well, you're not the man I talked to when I called before. No, no, that was Harris. He went off duty at one. He left me a message about your call, and we'll have somebody up there within 15 minutes. <sighs> okay, thanks. That's funny. Well, uh, Mrs. Gregory denies making that call on the intercom, Dollar. Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, okay, Helen. Well, what's the matter? Uh, something that sergeant said over the phone. Hey, wait a minute. What time have you got? Why, ten minutes of one. Yeah? That's what my watch says, too. But according to the sergeant, it was after one. I checked the big clock in the entry hall and the one in the living room. They both agreed with my watch, ten minutes of one. I slipped outside, unlocked my car door, and looked at the clock on the dashboard. It read 10 after 1. When I felt a gun in my back, I realized I'd come up with the answer a little too late. It's a pity, Dollar. I thought I had a foolproof idea. But I hadn't figured on your locking the car. So it was you who hit me over the head when the clock was striking 11. Who called Appleton at the beach house, lured him up the stairway, and shoved him over. Then came back and reset my watch and the clock so I'd hear it still chiming 11 when you brought me to. I thought I'd only been out a few seconds. 
Actually, it was 15 minutes. Yes, but you're the only one who knows. Now get in the car. We're leaving. I started to get in, then kicked at the car door behind me. It swung and knocked Hillman off balance. Before he could recover, I nailed him. Oh! By the time he came to, the sheriff's patrol had arrived. And Hillman, you know, he wasn't one bit happy to see them. Expense account item two, $13 even. Transportation back home. Total expenses, $21.40. And a real bargain, if I do say so myself. Remarks? Hillman's motive was money, of course. It was he who'd taken the 50000 from Appleton's agency. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Today's story was written by Robert Wright. Heard in our cast were Eleanor Audley, Paula Winslow, Larry Dobkin, Will Wright, Ben Wright, and Harry Bartell. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Vincent Price. I'm calling from Hollywood. Oh, sure. My name's Shirley Temple. Now, who is it and what... Really, Vincent Price? Do I sound like Mickey Rooney? Well, no. But now, tell me, Mr. Price. Now, look, the name is Vincent. Okay, Vincent. What can I do for you? Johnny, I have a little problem in connection with one of my paintings insured for $100,000. 100000 you call that a little problem? This painting has suddenly disappeared. Oh, I see. What's the insurance company? Four State Mutual. Oh, well, they have a small branch office right there in Los Angeles. Yeah, I know. But Bert Parker, the man who sold me the policy and should take care of this matter, well, every time I've called him, he's been out. And I learned just this morning that nobody knows where he is. Okay, Vincent, I'll grab the first plane. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Mutual Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the price of fame matter. Expense account item one, 178.50, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Los Angeles. By the time the big silver constellation made its landing at the International Airport, it finally dawned on me that I hadn't arranged with Vincent Price about where and how and what time I'd meet him. But as I picked up my luggage, I discovered a hungry-looking crowd of autograph hounds running about the tall, gracious man I was looking for. Oh, sure, sure. I'm glad to. Look, but just one at a time, would you please? I can't very well. All right, there, there you are. Now I have to oh, meet a friend. Oh, just one more, please. Oh, Mr. Price. All right, if you insist. Here. Best wishes from T. Willie Rocking Horse. Huh? <laughs> How are you, Johnny? <laughs> oh, great, but I didn't Johnny? expect... Johnny? Johnny who? You mean to say you folks don't recognize Johnny Dollar? <laughs> oh, no, wait a minute. a boy, Johnny. Give him all. Uh, I'll wait for you in my car. It's right over here at the curb. Yeah, but look, will you? Hey, right here, Mr. Dollar. No, 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 I'm nobody. By the time I got away from that mob, I felt as though I'd been run through a ringer. But we finally took off in Vincent's car and drove to his beautiful home up in one of the canyons west of Beverly Hills. Nestled among the trees with spacious lawns and well-kept gardens, it's furnished in the most excellent taste. I know expert, but to say that I was impressed by the extraordinary works of art in that home would be the understatement of the week. Engravings, prints, fine sculptures, but most of all, paintings. And even to my unpracticed eye, all of them were, well, magnificent. 
Uh, here's a little thing I picked up in London, Johnny. It's called The Old Man in Red by Goya. Wow. Yeah, I thought original oils by him were found only in the big museum. Well, I've been pretty lucky in getting hold of some of these. Yeah, you've known what you were doing, too. Mm. You like this one? It's called Fright. It was painted by uh, Kenneth McManus. Uh Ah, beautiful. Beautiful. Like all the rest of them. Thanks. How about this one here at the end? Uh, Night Wind by... uh... I'm sorry, Vincent, I can't make out that name. You don't have this one lighted like the rest. No, that's to maintain its somber mood, Johnny. Oh. And that's what made it possible for the substitution of this copy to go undetected. That's a copy? Yeah, and that's my problem. The $100,000 night win by Jean-Baptiste has been stolen. This was left in its place. Oh, I see. It's not a bad copy, probably worth a couple of hundred dollars, but it's hardly a genuine Baptiste. Well, when did you discover this uh, substitution, Vincent? When I returned from a lecture tour early last week. Oh, that's right. You've been traveling all over the country lecturing on art. Well, let's you? call it talking about art. Hmm? Tell me, have you notified the police about this? Well, I suppose I should have. Well, I felt that was Bert Parker's job. And you haven't been able to reach him over at Four State Mutual. Well, I told you on the phone, he hasn't been in his office for some time. Vincent, have you any theories about who might have done this? Yes, I, I'm afraid I have. Well, why do you say it that way? Uh, very few people knew I'd gotten hold of this Baptiste. Only some close friends and a couple of art experts. So? And the place was not broken into during the time I was away. Of that, I'm sure. Well, go on. Well, the family and servants kept very close track of anyone who entered the house while I was gone. You have a list? Yes, I, I do have a list. Here. Good. Alfred R. Hawkinson. That's an electrician who came to do some wiring. He wouldn't know a Rembrandt from a Mickey Mouse. Anne M. Schumann. He's a music teacher. Loves music, hates painting. What about delivery boys, people like that? Oh, they never get beyond the back door. Go on, read on. Hmm? That next one is Ben, the gardener. You can forget about him. And Bert L. Huh? Yeah, Bert Parker. He was here twice. What for? Well, ostensibly to check on some of the paintings he'd insured... The first time, on the 11th, Mrs. Price was with him while he poked around. On the 15th, she had to leave to keep an appointment. And just when he left the house, nobody seems to know. Oh, brother. Are you thinking the same thing I am? Now, look, Johnny, I haven't known Bert very long, and... Well, he seemed like such a harmless little old fuddy-duddy. As for his knowledge of art... Yeah, I wondered about that. Well, he was perfectly satisfied to take my evaluation on the two or three things he'd insured. So... Well, Johnny, I I may be all wrong. Vincent, a thing like this may only happen once in a thousand years. In any event, the company will certainly make good your loss. Well, with a work of art, it isn't really the money that counts. And Johnny, listen. Look, I may have jumped to a completely unjustified conclusion about Bert Parker. Oh, yeah? Sure. Well, let's go down to his office and see. We'll return to Johnny Dollar and the Price of Fame matter. That's Vincent Price in just a moment. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Price of Fame matter. A priceless original oil painting, stolen from the home of Vincent Price, famous radio and picture star. One of the few people who'd had the opportunity was the man who'd sold him the insurance on it, Bert Parker. Together, we went to Parker's office at Four State Mutual in downtown Los Angeles. It was on the 16th that Mr. Parker phoned in to say he wasn't feeling very good and wouldn't be in for a day or two. Hey, it was on the 15th that he was at your house, Vincent. Yes, that's over two weeks ago. And you haven't heard from him since, Miss Pritt? No, Mr. Darling. We've tried calling his apartment, but since there hasn't been anything really pressing here at the office... What's we the weren't... address of his apartment, please? Well, it's out in Westwood, 1308 Pandora Avenue. Look, Vincent, I'm going out there. I'll call you if I find... You're going to need transportation, aren't you, Johnny? Why, the highest price chauffeur in the country? Sure, why not? Oh, uh, b- uh, before you go, Mr. Price, I wonder if... <laughs> if I could have your autograph. Well, why didn't you get Johnny Dollars, Miss Pritt? He huh? loves to give them. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, no, uh, no, you don't, Benson. Let's go. It took a little persuading, but the landlord at Bert's apartment finally led us into his four-room suite. It was empty, except for a few old clothes, and it was obvious that he'd packed and left in a hurry. I rummaged around in the closets, tables, bureau for a clue as to where he might have gone and came up with nothing. You give up, Johnny? 
Yeah, Vincent, I'm afraid so. I poked around that desk some more after you'd finished with it and found this wedged in behind a drawer. Oh. Travel folder. Paris. Yeah, it looks real fresh, too. Minor travel agency, Beverly Hills. Well, what do you think? Oh, uh, pretty much of a long shot, Vincent. But they do pay off sometimes, don't they? Planned a trip for myself, yes, sir. First class all the way. What was the departure date, Mr. Miner? 16th, first class, straight to Paris. Oh, brother, Paris is a pretty big place. Did you make any arrangements for him for after he got there? Only for when he arrived. Reservation at the Louvois. It... What? The hotel, Louvois. <laughs> the Louvois, perhaps. That's what I said. Oh. First class, too. Said he wanted something not too far from the Montmartre. Uh, Montmartre, if you don't mind. That's what I said, yes. Now... Can I fix you gentlemen up with some plane reservations, too? Well, suppose you give me the same flight he took, and I'll stop at the same hotel when I get there. Hey, wait a minute, Johnny. You're not going to leave me out of this. Well, look, I'm still playing a long shot, Vincent, a very long one. What's the difference? Also, I don't know if my expense account will get by the home office. Expense account, forget it. I'm having a ball. Mr. Miner, start making those reservations. Expense account item two, $984 for the plane to Paris. Well, it turned out to be the most interesting flight I've ever made because of the company of Vincent Price. An amazing conversationalist, he could talk about anything, including art. And he has a tremendous sense of humor. So, as he put it, we had a ball from the time we took off in L.A. till the time we sat down in Le Bourget. Item 3, 520 American, taxi into the Hotel Le Bois, where the manager was, uh, well, somewhat helpful. Oh, mais oui, mais oui. The Monsieur Park uh, leave us but only two days ago, after some uh, slight misunderstanding about uh, l'addition, uh, the deal. Eh? Yeah, you mean he was running out of money? Uh, monsieur, I did not say that. That's what you meant, isn't it? You don't want to spend his time around here? Mm, but of course, uh, his business, he say, took him constantly to uh, Montmartre. Where in Montmartre? <laughs> Who is to know? Oh, that's like saying somewhere in Brooklyn. Ah, Brooklyn? Uh, perhaps you know my cousin. Johnny, yeah. he mm. wasn't. Johnny, a... I uh, just got an idea. Sure. Uh, works of art, even very good ones, are sometimes sold in rather, well, rather unorthodox ways. They they go through some rather strange hands. They're not always sold over the counter, so to speak, by reputable dealers. You know what I mean? Yeah, but how to contact the kind of people who might... You got any ideas? Uh, why don't you just go on up to our suite and sit tight for a while, hmm? I'll see what I can dig up. You are keeping something from me, Vincent. Mm-hmm. But, Johnny, there are some things even Funk keeps from Wagnalls. I'll see you later. <laughs> Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the price of fame matter. All of gay, romantic Paris, just outside the door, and time on my hands. So what did I do? Took Vincent Price's advice, went back to my room at the Hotel of Bois, and waited. Two, three, four hours. Finally, shortly after 8 p.m., Vincent came in bearing a couple of packages. Uh, sorry to have made you wait, Johnny, but, uh... I think I'm on the trail of something. Looks to me like you've been on a shopping spree. Props, Johnny. For you. Have you found out where Bert Parker is? No, but I think you will. <laughs> Here, try this on. Huh? What's this all about? A ten-gallon hat. Yeah, I had to guess at your size. Where in ha- where in Paris did you find this? Try it on. Oh, what do you holy what am I supposed to be? A refugee from Texas? Exactly. You made it in oil wells. Your name is Matthew. Huh? You're over here to see the sights, all the wild nightlife you've heard about, the Folie Berger, Rue Blondel, Place Pigal. Here, try on this shirt. Oh, brother. Look, I don't know what this is all about, but hadn't we better get something to eat? Try it on. If you don't take me to one of the world-famous restaurants in this town. Maybe tomorrow. Huh? Yeah, that's good. That shirt's going to be all right. What do you mean, tomorrow? Here, now, stick this genuine simulated imitation diamond-type stick pin in the front. Oh, wait a minute, I'll do it for you. Yeah, what? What the Sam? There you are, and with this big hunk of glass on your finger. There, now, look at you. Oh, you look. I'm hungry. Well, maybe you'll even get food where you're going. Now, where do you think I'm going in this rig? To a little joint on the Rue Blondel called the Bal Macabre. Now, what am I supposed to do there if I go there? Sit around. Look prosperous. 
and see what happens. Oh, Vincent. Remember, you made it in oil. Millions. Yeah, but Vincent... Also, you... you're interested in art, and your name is Matthew. Look, will you? On your way, Johnny. The taxi that's waiting for you out front knows exactly where to take you. The Brown Macabre was really a joint. It was dirty, and the people packed like sardines in it were dirty, too. Characters who made a business of being characters. And everybody screamed at everybody else. Except, that is, for the wormy little man who sidled up to the postage stamp-sized table on which my glass and a bottle of wine were balanced. Who? Calm down. You, you are Mr. Matthews, are you not? That's right. From Texas? No. Oh, uh, yes, sir, partner. The great and glorious state of Texas. Sit down and pour yourself a glass of this here red ink. Who are you? They call me La Chagri. What does that mean? Well, they well, what you call the gray cat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's cuter than the name of my old friend Coyote Bill. Well, do you enjoy the Paris nightlife? Oh, uh, you know something? I'm getting fed up with it. Yeah, I think I'll just buy me a couple of nice pictures and go on back home. What uh, kind of pictures, monsieur? Well, good ones. Oil pictures. Like that Mona Lizzie I seen at the Louvre. You know, good ones, I mean. Well, like a Jean-Baptiste, perhaps? You mean you know where a man could get a hold of a genuine one of them? Well, for a price, of course. Well, listen, I got money and I'll spend it. Well, I offered them $500,000 for that Mona Lizzie, but they turned me down. But if I could get a hold of a genuine Baptiste... Well, partner, you just name the price. Oh, well, I make no promises, mon ami. But I, I do have a friend. And for a slight consideration... Name uh, your price and take me to it. I will be waiting for you at the corner with the taxi. Um, that is what you call okay? Okay. I shall be waiting. I'll be there, partner. You bet I will. And I'd certainly like to know how Vincent set this up. <laughs> The taxi dropped us off at one of the most disreputable-looking apartments in the whole of Paris. My friend, who called himself the Great Cat, looked carefully around before entering the front door. Then we climbed four flights of a dark, musty stairway. No, remember, my friend, you are not to pay the price he asks at first. If you like, I will make the arrangements for you. Now, that would be right friendly of you, partner. But how will you come out on this? Well, all I ask, monsieur, is 10% of what you pay. And maybe a little extra from him for bringing me up here? Oh, monsieur. Oh, now, don't give me that part. Now, I've been around. I'm wise to how you fellas operate. But if I can get a hold of a real genuine Baptiste... You will see. Yes? Who is it? I have brought a friend, Mr. Matthews from Texas. Yes? He would like to buy the night wind by Baptiste. That is, if it's genuine. Genuine? Of course it's genuine. There, on the table. Can't you see for yourself that it's the... Ori- oh, no. Well, well. Bert Parker. Johnny Dollar. That's right. Insurance investigator. Investigate you? Oh, I will. I just remember somebody is waiting for me. That's right, I am. Mr. Price. Oh, no. Well, but, but don't miss you, Price, but I must go. Without he, your fee for he, taking care of Mr. Dollar? Listen. Listen, both of you, please. I'll give you back the painting. I'll do anything you ask. Oh, drop that. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Well, Vincent, there it is. Yep. And it looks like the company has saved a cool hundred thousand dollars. I um, I have a confession to make about that, Johnny. Yeah, like how you happened to know the way to the painting through that squirmy little fellow who brought me here. Oh, well, that's how I got hold of the Baptiste in the first place. <laughs> yeah, it's a lovely thing, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. And Johnny, it is worth a hundred thousand. Oh, I'm sure. But the truth of the matter is, I paid only three hundred dollars for it. You bet. Oh, no. It's a fact. <laughs> well, you've got it back, thanks to your own efforts. <laughs> thanks to your being the front man. If I'd tried to get it back myself, these people would have run like scared rats. Oh, sure, sure. 
Uh, just tell me one thing, will you? Why aren't you an insurance investigator? Well, you know, it's every man to his own. <laughs> well, after all, why aren't you an actor? Uh, uh, let's get out of here. This position of Bert Parker, well, that's entirely up to the company. Vincent, now that he has the painting back, doesn't care one way or the other. However, from the company's standpoint, well, it's not the kind of blank eye that's good for you. Expense account total, including incidentals and transportation back to the States, $2,341. Remarks? Well, to Vincent Price, my eternal thanks. Not only for the help on this case, but most of all because it's given me a chance to really know him. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star will return in just a moment. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the heart of sunny southern Jersey in a case that took a very sudden, very strange twist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Junius Matthews, Tony Barrett, Horace Lewis, Howard McNear, and of course, our special guest, Vincent Price. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. For your enjoyment, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum presents from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Good evening. This is Mr. Snell, the secretary. Oh, sure. Hi. I was unable to reach Mr. Snell before he left for the West Coast, but he asked me to outline the case to you and hoped you'd follow him out there. It's quite serious. Oh? What is it? Our company has been carrying the policies on a line of pleasure boats for a West Coast sales agency, the Aerocraft Cruisers. Within the past two weeks, three of them have sunk with no survivors. Bad risks. Yes. There's a liability clause. Next of kin in each case is bringing suit for nearly a million dollars. Edmund O'Brien, in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work, or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Grand East Life and Liability Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during assignment to Millard Snell of your legal department on the investigation of the Arrowcraft matter. Expense account item one, $275 air travel Hartford to Los Angeles and rented car travel from Los Angeles to Newport Beach and... The heart of the trouble. Snell? Millard Snell? Who is it? It's Dollar. Dollar? Hurry up. Get aboard. Now watch it. She's wet tonight. Hey, give me your arm. Come on. Thanks. Didn't think you were going to make it. You talked to your secretary? Yes, that was yesterday from Chicago. Well, I didn't know where you were until I called her from the Los Angeles airport a couple of hours ago. Then when I got here, your hotel told me you just left to charter a boat. What's up? Myers, how long will it be? Uh, Robert should be here any minute, Mr. Snell. Couldn't leave without him. All uh, right, if you can hurry him up anyway, do it. Come on in the cabin, Dollar. Out of this foul night air. Out of this fog. 
I thought it was bad sometimes in Hartford. Another cruise has been reported, Dollar. An arrow craft? Yes. Reported by a private plane between here and Catalina Island. That's 30 miles offshore. The Coast Guard been notified? Yes, but candidly, I hope we see it before they do. Find out what we insured. If we can find it in this fog. Find it? You mean this one is still afloat? Before dark, yes. Barely afloat. Robert, hurry, get aboard. Ah, there he is. The navigator we've been waiting for. I hope he's sober. Tell me, what have you learned so far? What makes them sink? I don't know. The sales agent, Fred Crocker. You'll meet him. Swears by aircraft. Says they're one of the best hulls afloat. Ah, but the fact remains they've been sinking. Uh Uh-huh, and a tragic fact, too. The loss of life so far has been horrible. Three 28-foot boats, 11 fatalities. No trace of the cruisers, even. But a life ring or two. Must have been deep water, then. What about bodies? Seven have been recovered and four still missing. Ah, we're getting started. It was 10 p.m. when we left the quiet resort village. And it was dawn when we saw in the fog what we had been unable to find during a whole night of searching. The arrow craft, without sign of life, was almost entirely awash, bowed down in the channel swell. That's close enough, Myers. Right. We don't want to nudge her. She's allowed to roll over. Well, here we are, but there's nothing we can do about her. How she stays up is beyond me. Any chance of towing it in? Not in that shape. Give her any weight. She'll just take more water and go down. Can you put me aboard? If you want to go, I can put you there, but I don't know what your waiter's going to do. She's ready to roll. What do you think, Roberts? Oh, well, put him over the stern. That shouldn't upset her. We'd better get some of those clothes off, Dollar, while we swing around. All right. You think it's worth it? You're going aboard? Worth it? I'm not going for a night like that without having a look at it. <sighs> Gives me the creeps. The thing awash like that. Looks dead. Yeah. Too dead. Why isn't there anyone aboard? Why isn't somebody hanging onto the side? Okay, Dollar. We'll move into it now. I'm ready. Now get back there on the transom. That's it. Right there. I'll swing you right into it. Right. There you are. Go ahead. Okay. Hey, get off the go. And stay amidships. Look at either side. She'll roll. I'm all right. Anything there? Yeah. Yeah, there's something here. There's a girl in the cabin. Her body floated face down in the flooded cabin, held in there by the narrowness of the passageway. After an unpleasant and ticklish 15 minutes... She was lifted aboard the other boat by three suddenly silent men. There was little else I could do on the derelict but memorize the name and address on the certificate of ownership. So I left it and followed the girl. I didn't bargain for this, Dollar. It doesn't bother me to read about 11 of them, but... But this girl... Why, she can't be over 18. Yeah, I noticed you know, if it was a guy, it wouldn't hit so hard. I can't like this. Beautiful. Myers. Yes, sir? Have you radioed in about this? I waited to find out whether you want to stand by the boat or not. No. We'll start right back. Get word to the police. Ask them to meet us. I think it's a case for them. The boat's registered to a Chester McNeil, Newport Beach address. McNeil, Newport Beach address. McNeil, yes, all right. You want to get us started, Roberts? Right. What'd you find, Dollar? Come here, look at this. See? Behind her ear. You see the bruise? Yeah. Yeah, I noticed it when I was getting her out of the cabin. She'd been slugged? She could have been. There's long black hair. You see here? The water's ruined most of it, but there's still part of a braid. It could have been a hard blow, one that might have killed a man, but her braid might have softened it. I'm looking for an answer to why she was on that boat, alone and dead. It was an answer I never did actually find and prove because in the final analysis, the death of this beautiful dark-haired girl was no more important than any of the rest of them. 
She was taken to the county morgue, and after making my formal statement to the police and giving them my informal theories, I followed her there. Now, I take it that the deceased is not a personal friend of yours. That's right, Dr. Sane. I'm an insurance investigator. I'm in Southern California because a number of people have died in the sinkings of some insured pleasure boats. Oh, yes, the aircraft? Yes, and the death of this girl has become important to me. What's her name? Uh, Caruso, Antonia Caruso. She was identified by her mother. Antonia. Are you planning an autopsy? Why do you ask? I wonder if you noticed a bruise behind her right ear. Yes, I reported it. You're an observant fellow. Dr. Sane, you must have examined some of the other bodies from these sinkings. Were there any indications of violence on them? If there were, I was unable to discover them. The period of immersion in other cases, you must understand, was much longer than in the Caruso case. Water makes it difficult. Why do you ask? On the rest of the sinkings, the boats themselves have been blamed. But after today, it seems to me there's a possibility that something else has caused them, at least this one. The contusions? Yes. There were two other people on that boat, the owner, Chester McNeil, and his father. But the girl's body was the only one aboard. Why? Uh, I didn't know the particulars. I think the girl wore braids, Doctor. If she did, could she have survived a blow that would have killed the two men? Protection? Well, location of the wound would bear you out behind the ear. Could she have been knocked unconscious, been thrown overboard, and then recovered enough to get back on? Could this have happened to the girl? Are you suggesting homicide, Mr. Dollar? I'm not sure. Then I'm not sure why perfectly good boats start sinking without survivors, either. They have to make autopsy examination to determine the degree of concussion. Well, that's why I asked. Are you going to perform one? In the state of California, Mr. Dollar, except in cases of unquestionable criminal acts, autopsy is allowed upon only permission of the next of kin. Now, this contusion, well, it could have been sustained in so many ways. Yes, I know, I know. Matter of fact, arrangements have already been made to move the body to a private establishment. Oh. Um, could you give me her mother's address? Why, uh, yes, I suppose so. But I'd be doing no more than saving you a search of the phone book. What is it you want? Mrs. Caruso, I'm the man that found your daughter. Oh, then why have you come here? You shouldn't know my grief. I do, Mrs. Crusoe, but I'd like to talk with you if I could. Well, what is it there to say? I don't want to see you. There is no room for sympathy. I didn't know anything about your daughter, but I'd like to. I'd, I'd like to hear about her. Why do you do this? Because... Because I don't think her death was accidental. Oh, go away. Why do you say this? My girl, she never did a no wrong. Oh, I didn't mean that, Mrs. Caruso. Please, may I come in? All right. It's in my house. I'm sorry. It's not cared for. There have been so many things today. Well, I won't stay long. She was a good girl. She was going to marry Chester. His father was with them. She was going to marry Chester. Oh, we hoped it so much, Antonia and me, that it would be a good marriage. Mrs. Caruso. We always dream. We were good people, only poor. We give everything so Antonia will be better. She was so beautiful. She was going to marry Chester. I'm sorry to bother you at a time like this, I... Now, she's gone. I saw her. I saw her, too. And I want to learn why she's gone. Now, Mrs. Caruso, is there any reason that you can think of why there should have been trouble on this trip in the McNeil boat? Oh, no. They go many times. They love the boat. They go many times, always with his father to take care of them. He, he loved her, too. My daughter, he called her. She was going to marry his Chester. Be so happy. Please, Mrs. Cole. Oh, my Antonia. Antonia. Please, go. 
You know my grief. Leave my house. Leave my house. I left her house and drove back to Millard Snell's hotel. It was 7 p.m., and I hoped we could get to Crocker, the West Coast agent for Arrowcraft, before the night was out. But I found Snell white-faced when I opened the door and too anxious to show me the front page of the evening paper. I didn't know where to find you, Dollar. For what? And you hadn't heard. Fred Crocker, the Arrowcraft agent. He was killed this afternoon. Oh. It says traffic, hit-and-run victim. But I don't believe it. Look at this. Violence in another form preceded the tragedy, the story said. Crocker's sales office was entered earlier today in a bold daylight strike. The interior was wrecked, but whether or not the entry was for purposes of theft has not been ascertained. The writer didn't make any definite statements. But reading between the lines, you knew that he was exploring the possibility that revenge was at the bottom of both the violence and the tragedy that those who had lost family or friends in the Arrowcraft sinkings had wrecked Crocker's office and then killed him. But remembering the bruise behind the Caruso girl's ear, I didn't believe that either. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you keep going at your best. So for real chewing enjoyment that's refreshing and long-lasting, always keep Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Healthful, delicious, Wrigley's Spearmint Gum will make every day more enjoyable. And now, with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Snell and I drove out to what had been Crocker's sales office. A sheriff's deputy met us outside and took us in. Give me some light if... Uh... Oh, there's a switch. Well, not as bad as it could be. At least the drawers aren't dumped. These are from a file cabinet. We'll start here. What are you looking for? Crocker's sales records. Sales records? The names and addresses of all the people who bought arrowcrafts from him. I don't think we'll find it. I don't get you. We've got a theory. That those boats didn't just sink. That they were boarded. That the people who've been lost were slugged before they were drowned. And that the boats were scuttled. What do you think of it? Why would anybody set out to wreck aircraft? Well, that I don't know. Probably because they're linked to something important. Maybe something or somebody is on an aircraft and somebody else doesn't know which one. Here's the sales folder, Dollar. It's empty, all right. Sure it is. That gives them the location of every aircraft between here and San Diego. Sheriff, nobody has said where Crocker was when this place was entered. They don't know yet. You got a theory? Yeah, that he was here. Yeah, that after the list of names and addresses was taken, he was dragged out of here and killed with a car for the same reason the others have been killed. Because alive, they might have been identifying witnesses. Well, they say everybody's got a right to his own opinion, but that's too crazy for me. Well, I don't blame you. It's too crazy for anybody. Maybe so crazy it'll never be cleared up. Expense account item two, $112 cost of entertainment that same night for as many members of the press as I could get hold of. They listened to my theory, agreed that it was unbelievable, but worth printing on the grounds of sensationalism. The story made the morning editions, most of the papers slanting it towards warning the Arrowcraft owners listed in Crocker's stolen records. But it didn't look so unbelievable because it had a companion piece. A night watchman at one of the yacht clubs lay near death from gunshot wounds after apprehending a prowler aboard an aerocraft. The prowler was being held at the county jail. Who is this guy, Sergeant? Jerry LaBarbe is the name he uses. We put a search on him last night. He's one of those things you call a known hoodlum because nobody's been able to pin much on him. Known to the police in Las Vegas, L.A., and San Diego, to name a few. 
Here he is. I hope you had better luck with him than we did. If you meant that, you'd leave me alone with him for the rest of the day. Sorry. Off the bunk, LaBarber. You got a visitor. On your feet. Stand up. Okay, hero. You got me up. What's the matter with you? What's missing, LaBarber? What? What's lost? What were you looking for on the arrow craft? Come on, who are you working for? I'm out of work. Why don't you save your breath? How many of the other killings were you mixed up in? What are the killings? I get into a scrape with an eager night watchman, and now you talk about pinning other killings on me. What is this? Who are you working for? I'm out of work. You could do yourself some good, you know. I'm not complaining, am I? You were off to a pretty good start. Even if that watchman lives, you're going to be tried for assault with intent to kill. That's a long rap. You might make it shorter by using your head. <laughs> Is that a promise? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. You're a sucker, LaBarber. But this is a promise. I'm going to see you charged for Crocker's murder. Who's Crocker? And I'm going into the business of searching arrow crafts myself. Don't be stupid. Why not put the blame where it belongs? Blame for what? Okay, Sergeant, I've had enough. So have I. I wonder how long it takes to get that way. For what? I could buy and sell you, you cheap tin star. Well, what do you think? He's covering for somebody, isn't he? I think you're right. You shouldn't have tipped your hand so much about searching the boat. Word's going to get out. Out of a jail cell? He called for a lawyer, one of the hot men from L.A. We can refuse him visitors, but not a private session with a criminal who happens to be his lawyer. (laughs) Oh, I'd like to hear that one. (laughs) You should. It's going to put a bigger bullseye on your back than that newspaper story did. There was no trouble that day and no progress. We had time to contact two Arrowcraft owners that afternoon and went aboard their boats. Nothing came of it but a feeling of frustration because we didn't know what we were looking for, how large or small it was, whether to empty fire extinguishers or break and open batteries. That night the news broke that the night watchman had died of his wounds. Snell and I made an attempt at eating dinner and took a bottle of cognac to my room to see what it could do. The phone call came at 9.30. Hello? Hello? Well, this is Dollar speaking. Who's this? I'm in a phone booth, so don't bother trying to trace this call. It's about the boat trouble. All right. What about it? Not over the phone. You have to come up here. Where do I meet you? I've got to be careful. You'll know why when I talk to you. You have to come alone. What else? There's a place called Leeds Bar. It's on Long Beach Boulevard, three blocks up from the beach. You'll see the sign. I'll find it. You can make it in an hour. But you've got to be alone. I will be. All right. Quarter of eleven. What was that? Some girl says she wants to talk about the arrow crafts. Wants me to meet her in Long Beach. Don't be ridiculous. You're not going. Somebody has to do something. Nothing as foolhardy as this. You've been expecting them to make a move. Here it is. You don't for a minute think she's telling the truth. I won't find out sitting here swilling brandy with you. I wasted ten minutes in Newport circling through alleys and side streets to shake any tail that might have been put on me. And then I headed up the coast highway. At exactly 10.45, I was ordering a drink in Leeds Bar. It arrived simultaneously with a metallic nudge in the ribs from a man who had taken the stool on my right. Drink it, Dollar. We've got to go. I was supposed to get a message from a girl. You've had it. Come on, drink up. All right. Now leave. I'll meet you outside the door. Do I get to talk with this girl? She's outside. Okay. This way. Here's a car. No, you, you get him in front with her. I'll get him back. Where to now? Just a little way. You weren't followed? I made it a point not to be. Huh? You wanted to talk. Yeah, I do. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I don't think I care anymore. It's been like I killed all those people who've died. Take it easy, honey. You mean their deaths are your fault? Sort of, yeah. 
I mean, I could have stopped it, but I was afraid to because one of his men would have killed me. And I thought he'd stop me for this. He? Who do you mean? Hey, <laughs> watch what you're going. You better stop when. This is as good a place as any. Yeah. I, I didn't go to the police because I have a record. And he's so powerful, he, he could have made it look like blackmail and it wouldn't have gone any farther. Who is so powerful? George Masterson. George Masterson? Who's he? Oh, he seems like a businessman. He owns a line of furniture stores. I've known him for three years. It was one of those things where oh, every once in a while I'd learn something about him. Until I finally understood what he really was. And he knew I did. What kind of payment do you expect for what you're telling me? Dollar. I, I hadn't thought of money. I swear I hadn't. All right. Go ahead. Masterson's as far outside the law as you can get. Narcotics, jewels and furs, aliens, Mexican gold, anything. He runs the West Coast for a combination that has headquarters in Italy. Who knows this? I do. And I wrote it all down. Ways to prove it. Like the names he uses for all his bank accounts to evade income tax. All of it. That's what he's been looking for on those boats. And well, then he was afraid... Running it down was the only way I could think of to protect myself. He was afraid of me. Because I knew so much about him. He was going to have me killed. We were in Mexico when I told him, Ensenada. When he didn't believe me, I showed him a copy. I told him I'd hidden the original on a boat I'd visited. And that if he killed me, I had a way of letting the police know which one. Which one is it? I was lying to him. I didn't put it on a boat. I was lying. Arrowcraft was only a name I remembered. When he asked me, I said Arrowcraft. You mean there's nothing on those boats and 16 people have died? I know. I, I know I was wrong. I should have. But when you're scared, you only think of yourself. Don't go in, honey. You'll be all right. This paper you say you wrote, where is it? I have it here. I want you to take it. All right, get out, brother. I want to take her home. I didn't fully believe her until I had finished reading her denunciation of George Masterson after they'd left me. But by the end of it, I knew that in my hands was the hottest document in California. I knew that hundreds of rotten lives could be crumbled and millions of dollars in criminal traffic could be stopped. And it did away with the possibility of any suit against Arrowcraft or your company. But it wasn't enough. I should have gone to the authorities with it then. Instead... I took a room for the night and mailed it to the FBI in the morning. Then I went after Masterson. I found him in a plush office in one of his furniture stores. Here. Just a moment, sir. You can't go in there. Mr. Masterson. What's the meaning of this? You're announced before you get in here. Not this morning, Masterson. I'm sorry, sir. Get somebody to throw this man out. What's the matter with you? Who are you? Johnny Dollar, working on the Arrowcraft sinkings. Gwen Thomas. I've read her statement. I don't know what you're talking about. About 16 deaths. The FBI can have you for the rest. But I want you for those 16 deaths. Get away from me. Get away from you. Stay away from me. Get up. Oh, listen to me. Come on. Get up. As far as I was concerned, that was it. The girl was placed under protective custody by the FBI and the district attorney, who had worked out 75 counts on Masterson's indictment before I left. It's too bad that all of the next of kin of the 16 dead can't sit in the jury box. Expense account item three, same as item one. Expense account total, $940.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. 
You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd and David Ellis with music composed and conducted by Leif Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Columbia Pictures production, 7-Eleven Ocean Drive. Featured in tonight's cast were Gene Bates, Howard McNear, Clayton Post, Harry Bartell, Hi Aberback, John McIntyre, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Herbert Lynn, State Unity Life, Denver, Colorado. Mr. Lynn? I wonder if you're free to come out here and see me right away. Well, now, let me see. I hope so. What's more, I can promise you a handsome fee, in addition to your expense account, of course, whether my fears are justified or not. Fears of what, Mr. Lynn? What seems to be the trouble? A murder, Mr. Dollar. Oh? That has not yet been committed. I see, but you think will be, hmm? I must confess that I alone anticipated, or at least an attempt at it, I hope that you can somehow forestall any such attempt. Well, I can certainly try. Fine. I'll grab the first plane. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the State Unity Life Insurance Company, Denver, Colorado office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the old fashioned murder matter. <laughs> Expense account item one $111.45 airfare. The first plane to make the right connections didn't pull out of Hartford until late in the afternoon, so it was close to midnight by the time we sat down at Stapleton Field on the outskirts of the mile high city of Denver. In spite of the time of year, the mountain air was cold, crisp, and clear. It was well after midnight by the time a cab, and that's item two, six hours even, dropped me off at the famous old Brown Palace Hotel. I got myself a comfortable room and hit the sack, then first thing in the morning I dropped in on Mr. Herbert Lynn at the State Unity office in one of the big new buildings in Mile High Center. I suggest you rent a car, Mr. Dollar, because this client of ours lives in Green Mountain Falls. That's a small settlement down just west of Colorado Springs, Manitou Springs, that section. Oh, I know the place well, Mr. Lynn. Oh, do you? Mm Mm-hmm. Back in the summer of, uh, 58, I spent a couple of weeks fishing out of the Lucky Four Ranch with my old pal Ray Schmizny. Uh, Ray, what did you say? (laughs) Schmizny. Believe it or not, that name's a lot easier to say than to spell. I'm sure it is. Now, this client's name is Howard Hartzell. Yes? He's 73 years old, Mr. Dollar, and at one time was quite wealthy which explains his insurance policy for nearly a quarter of a million dollars. And you think somebody wants to murder him? Yes, I could almost say I'm certain of it. Who, Mr. Lynn, and why? One or all three of his beneficiaries, or at least two of them. Want to tell me who they are? Well, to begin with, Clara Johnson, a niece, school teacher in Colorado Springs, 45, I'd say, and about as mean, selfish, and grasping an old maid as I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. When she found out about her uncle's insurance policy... She immediately wanted to know why she wasn't made the sole beneficiary. Mr. Hartzell had quite a time with her. Uh, What does Clara teach? High school chemistry. Uh, Then there's another niece, Bonnie. She's young, smart, good-looking, married to a plumber by the name of Harry Briggs, also lives in Colorado Springs. They have no children and uh, manage to make a living of sorts. Now, you have the addresses of these people? Yes, right here. I've listed them on a slip of paper for you. Here you are. Good. Thank you. And finally, as you see, there's Tony Johnson, a nephew. In uh, Manitou Springs, it says here. Yes. Tony inherited quite a bit of money from his own family. Went through it in less than a year. You know, big parties, expensive cars and girls and so on. And he's now working as a bartender in some cheap saloon there in Manitou Springs. 
lazy, no-good wastrel, Dollar. In other words, if something does happen in your book, you'll be number one suspect. Yes, and I pride myself in having a sort of instinct in such matters. Which of the two girls, the nieces, would you put next? Well, if there were any reason to suspect anyone else, I should say Clara. I'm sure that when you see Bonnie and talk to her, you'll realize that she couldn't even think in terms of murder. <laughs> oh, what's that? Oh, excuse the chuckle. I suppose if all the stuff you read in detective stories means anything, then Bonnie is the one I should suspect. Didn't you hear me, sir? If only because she apparently is above suspicion. You'll see for yourself. But suspect of what? Has there been any actual attempt to murder Mr. Hartzell? Twice, Mr. Hartzell was narrowly missed by a car that bore down on him as he was crossing the highway in front of his place. Mr. Lynn, you're talking about Route 24 mm -hmm. that cuts through Ute Pass there at Green Mountain Falls? I am. Good grief, as I remember the traffic on that main highway. Howard Hartzell is absolutely certain that each time the car tried to run down, and it was the same car each time. Well... Then, early one morning, a small caliber bullet plunged through the window of his living room, missed him by only a couple of feet. Might be a careless hunter. Then there was a mysterious fire at his home. In the middle of the night, Dollar... If a passing motorist hadn't seen it... Even so. And Mr. Hartzell was confined to his bed at the time. He wouldn't have stood a chance. Incidentally, there's another thing. What's that, sir? His health recently. After all, I believe you did say he was 73. But up until recently, as healthy a specimen as you could... Why, if I'm in as good shape when I reach that age as he is, or rather was... What's been the trouble? I tell you, Dollar, that whatever's ailed him has been too all-fired mysterious. Hasn't he had a doctor? That's another thing. That ancient family doctor of his, Dr. Easterday. What about him? Well, if you ask me, his name ought to be Yesterday. <laughs> he should have quit practice 20 years ago. But he's the only one that Hartzell will have. Matter of fact, Doc Easterday is living there with him now. To protect Hartzell, he says. Oh? Yes, and I suppose I must give the old pill pusher credit for that anyway. How do you mean? Well, I'm not the only one who feels that Hartzell's life is in danger, that those things that have happened weren't accidental. Now, that fire didn't come from any greasy rags. Is that what the fire department said? Yes, but I don't believe it. Tell me, is Mr. Hartzell sick right now? Well, right now he's on the mend from this last attack of, well, whatever it is. Liver ailments, says old Easter Day. I think he was poisoned. Hmm. Have these nieces and the nephew been to see him recently? Not since the doc moved in there, believe me. And that's been a couple of months now. He's allowed them absolutely no contact whatever with his uncle. Well, if they've had no contact with him, how could they poison him? That's what you've got to find out, Dollar. And find out which one and bring him to justice. Him, you say? Of course. It has to be that no-account nephew, Tony. But just because there's no reason to suspect her, I suppose you'll go to work on Bonnie. Mr. Lynn, I think you're making a couple of mountains or two out of a molehill. Oh, you do. But as long as I'm here, I'll uh, look in on these folks you've mentioned. Now remember one thing, Dollar. If I'm right, if, and I'm sure I am... Well? Whoever would plan to the murder of the uncle would be only too glad to get you out of the way. Mr. Lynn had given me a good idea, possibly a dangerous one. It was simply to make no bones about who I was, why I'd come out here, why I wanted to see and talk with them. The nieces and nephew, I mean. Then, if one of them did try to make a fast move, get me out of the picture, I'd be on guard. It was a pretty sure way of knowing who was up to something. Item three, a dollar ninety-five worth of phone calls to tell the relatives and the old man that I was on my way to... Item four, fifty bucks deposit on a rental car. I'd like to have stopped off at the uh, U.S. Mint there in Denver, one of the largest in the country, to see if they were handing out any free samples, but instead I headed south on 87 past the big new Air Force Academy into Colorado Springs. Clara Johnson, the older niece, lived in a tiny three- or four-room house badly in need of repair on the side street off Cascade Avenue. Fortunately, for uh, pretty obvious reasons, the interview was a short one. That's ridiculous. That's all utterly ridiculous. Now, Miss Johnson... I mean that Uncle Howard, the old fool, should have included those other two in his will in his insurance. Positively indecent. Well, tell me, does your uncle have much of an estate besides the insurance? No, not anymore. But do you know how much that insurance is? I have a pretty good idea. Nearly $250,000. And do you know what that would mean to me? To me, who's worked and struggled along all these years alone. 
I could give up this miserable teaching of those nasty, unappreciative brats at the high school. I could travel, go abroad, enjoy myself for a change, the way I deserve to after all these years. Now, don't you think that Tony and Bonnie... Oh, look at Bonnie. She had that young husband to take care of her, give her everything she wants, or at least most everything. And she's pretty. She has a nice figure, and... and and do you think that that Tony deserves anything? Miss Johnson. After the way he went through the fortune that his father left him. He does not. Well, nonetheless... The moonkeeper, that's what he is. And always getting into scrapes for those... Those gangsters that hang around that dive where he works. It's disgusting. Miss Johnson. I'm the one who deserves that money. All of it. Clara. If only that old miser would die before it's too late. Before I get too old. <laughs> but he keeps on living just to spite me. Too bad you can't help him along then, isn't it? Well, I don't think I don't wish I could, Mr. Dollar. Believe me, if I could find some way to... to... Oh, 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 no, 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 I, I didn't mean that. Didn't you? Uh, no, no, I, I shouldn't have said such a well, thing. Well, I'm afraid you did. Thanks very much, oh, Miss Johnson. Uh, now, wait. I didn't mean that the way it sounded. Bye. <laughs> My next stop along the way was at Harry Briggs' plumbing shop. Bonnie was there holding down the store while her husband was out on the job, and she was pretty. Although it always kind of stops me a little when I see a girl working on her makeup over a business desk. And I was so glad when you phoned to say that you're here to kind of look out for Uncle Howard. Oh, oh I called Tony and told him you'd be seeing him, too. Here. I look better now? Oh, you look like a million. <sighs> well, thanks, Johnny. <sighs> Gee, you're cute for a private eye. Oh, thank you, ma'am. No derby, no cigar in the corner of your mouth. Just a real good-looking guy. <laughs> Only I shouldn't talk like that, should I? Well, I'm afraid flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> oh, darn. Um, tell me, did you mean that you two have been worried about your uncle? Well, of course, after those cars that almost killed him and that fire at the posterior of his house and the sicknesses he's been having one after the other. Oh, I'm sure that Dr. Easterday is doing all he can for him, but... Much as Harry needs me around here, business isn't too good these days, and I feel I ought to be out there taking care of Uncle Howard, nursing him. It isn't as if I didn't know how. Would he have you? No. No, he wouldn't, Johnny. I'm afraid he thinks that all Clara and Tony and I keep hoping is that he'll die and leave us that insurance. And isn't that true? Should I lie and say no? Of course, we'll be glad to get that money, all of us, at the proper time. Completely forthright and frank, and I must admit I was well impressed. Maybe Herbert Lynn was a good judge of character. He was certainly right about Tony there in the cheap bar and grill over in Manitou Springs. This was a character I didn't like immediately. Short, thin, hair plastered down with nervous hands and shifty eyes set close together. As we stood there behind the bar talking with Tony claiming only undying affection for poor Uncle Howard, another man came in and stood by as though waiting for Tony's signal to rough me up. Yeah, Mr. Lynn was right, all right. I wouldn't have trusted Tony as far as I could throw the Empire State Building. Sure, Dollar. You can figure some way to knock off the old man. Well, I know three of us would be glad to cut you in on that nice fat hunk of insurance. What good is he living out the rest of his days, sick half the time? Maybe you'd like to help him along, hmm? You think I wouldn't, wise guy, if I thought I could get away with it? Don't pull any boo-boos, Tony. Don't worry, buddy. I'm too smart. Or all talk. Hey, Tony, give me a gun. Hey, hey, look, I got to get ready for the afternoon train, huh? Go ahead. Maybe I'll see you later. Sure. Any old time. The usual, Eddie? The important thing now was to see Mr. Hartzell and the old family doctor at Green Mountain Falls. I walked around to the back of the saloon, got into my car, then turned on the ignition. But in that brief moment before the starter took hold, I heard a buzzing under the hood, a sound that I knew only too well. That car had been wired. I jumped out and ran, almost too late. Uh, 
By the time the smoke cleared away from the carefully set explosion, I was blocks away at another car rental agency. I knew that Tony would be even further away, if, that is, he was the one who planted the bomb. So item six is another $50 deposit on another rental job. I sped up to Green Mountain Falls then to keep the date I'd promised over the phone. In answer to my knock on the small two-story home there on the side of a mountain... Mr. Dollar? That's right. Mr. Hartzell? No, I'm uh, I'm Dr. S. today. And thank heaven you've got here. Oh? Albeit, I'm afraid you're too late. You mean something's happened to him? Howard Hartzell is dead. When? Just a few moments ago. Would you like to come in? Yes, I think I'd better. We can, uh, we can sit here in this combination living bedroom of mine. Unless you wish to see him. But there's really no point in it. How did he die, Doctor? It was a severe case of toxic jaundice. Oh, jaundice? Yes, this uh, hemolytic jaundice. A uh, liver condition has been bothering him for quite some uh, just time. Just one moment, Doctor. Yes. Well, Mr. Uh, Dowd. In spite of your uh, rather fancy medical terms, something has just rung a bell. I can't quite tie it down. You're sure... That jaundice is what killed him? Mr. Dollar, after all, I've been practicing medicine some 50 years. Well, maybe that's good, and maybe it's bad. I beg your pardon. When I was out here before on a vacation, I had an infected finger. Well, I failed to see what... Now, the doctor who treated me was a young fellow by the name of, um... Ed Wilson. Where's your phone? What young Dr. Ed Wilson had to tell me was more than a little interesting. That's right, Johnny. Administered at repeated intervals, even minute quantities of arsenic compounds may produce a subacute type of poisoning. Go on, then. Well, a victim may develop a toxic uh, degeneration of the liver. It may progress to an acute or subacute yellow atrophy that's accompanied by an intense toxic jaundice. I see. And that, in turn, can be followed by severe, even deadly, gastroenteritis. And is that sort of poisoning something that might fool an old-time doctor who hasn't kept up with modern developments in medicine? Uh, Johnny, I wouldn't want to go so far as to... Uh, what is all this, anyway? Thanks, Ed. Thanks a lot. Do you mind telling me what that was all about, young man? Doctor, I want you to have an autopsy made immediately. But there was a physician in attendance at his death. I myself, it isn't necessary. Doctor, will you please order the autopsy? Well, very well, if you insist. The result? Arsenic poisoning beyond the least shadow of a doubt. But then came the real problem. How and when was it given to him? More important, how it was given to him in small doses over a long period of time and by whom? I, Mr. Dollar? Well, apparently you're the only one who's been with him all this time. But to think that I might... Oh, it's ridiculous. Well, I hope so, Doctor. I said, yet. Yes? Well? Well, I, I suppose I can't blame you for wondering about me. Ever since I began to worry about him and he began to suspect his relatives of planning his death, I've permitted no one else to see him. As you can see, I have my uh, room and bath here on the first floor. His are on the second. And there is no way anyone could have gotten to him up there without my knowing about it. You always ate the same food he did? Always, and I prepared it myself. The only time uh, during his waking hours when I wasn't with him, watching over him, was when he was in the privacy of his little bathroom up there. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow... Did Clara ever uh, come here to see him? No, no, no. As I told you, ever since I've been here... How about Tony? Well, Tony hasn't been here since the day he... And even then, I didn't let him in the door since the last time he delivered a, a bottle of whiskey. Whiskey? Uh, uh, yes. In the beginning, I uh, I had Mr. Hartzell take a small quantity of it each night as a, as a stimulant. Well, all right, then. Well, that was stopped months ago. Oh. Where's the rest of the whiskey? Oh, I'm afraid... I drank it myself. Oh, well, then that's out. Now, how about Bonnie? Well, I told you, Mr. Dollar. Yes, you told me. Uh, even her husband, when he came to fix the plumbing in the basement. Oh? Uh, that was two months ago. Yes? Even he wasn't permitted inside the house proper. I see. Hmm. You say you did the cooking? Uh, huh? Yes. Who brought him the groceries? I did all the shopping myself. No one could possibly have contaminated them. And I myself ate them. And while you were out shopping? The house was locked, and Mr. Hartzell let no one in. You're sure of that? Absolutely. Because during the past month or so, he was upstairs, unable to come down here. Yet somehow, somebody... Wait a minute. Oh, yes. Posterior. 
a fire in the posterior of this house. Uh -huh. What? That's the way it was told to me, and that's what's going to tie up this case. I'm afraid I don't Not understand. the back of the house, Doctor, but the posterior. Uh -huh. That's what you would have said. You, a doctor. So would a nurse, and a nurse would know all about arsenic, too. Well, of course, but I... Told me that she ought to have been here taking care of him, nursing him, that she knew how. Of course, she'd been a nurse. Mr. Dollar. And her husband is a plumber. Come on, Doctor, let's see if we can find the green telltale that arsenic would leave up there in his bathroom, say, around the nozzle of a water spigot. <laughs> And that's exactly where we found it. And downstairs in the cellar, hidden behind a furnace pipe and hooked up to that cold water line, not the line to the kitchen or the bathroom on the first floor, but hooked up to the line to the second floor was that ingenious, deadly device, a small container half full of an arsenic solution with a valve so that only a drop at a time would enter the pipe that gave Mr. Hartzell his drinking water, the one drop at a time that killed him. Funny. It wasn't the sweet, gentle Bonnie who finally broke down and confessed their little plot. But her husband, the plumber who'd rigged the device, who'd also rigged my car for that explosion. So, once more, it's up to the courts. My only regret is that witless Tony and selfish Clara will share that nice hunk of insurance. Expense account total, including the trip home, 347 85. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also heard in our cast were Leora Thatcher as Clara, Lawson Zerby as Dr. Easterday, Patsy Campbell as Bonnie, John Seymour as Herbert Lynn, Richard Holland as Tony, and William Lipton as Dr. Ed Wilson. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Alan Burns speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. You're the man who was sent here by the Bondi Company, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Who's this? My name is Shade, Pat Shade. I'm a private detective working on the case for the bank. Fine. I didn't know they'd hired one, too. They call me every once in a while, tracing phonies, mostly. Is there any chance that you know the missing messenger? Yeah, I know, Lillis. I had him tagged as a clean, honest kid. I still have what do you think happened then? I'm afraid he was either snatched or killed or, or both. But that's just my opinion. I wondered if you'd like to get together and compare notes. I don't have any notes yet, but I'll be glad to pick up your brain. I don't... Pick up your what? I don't have any notes yet, but I'll be glad to pick your brain any place you say. Edmund O'Brien in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... <laughs> well, we're stopped. Let's go Let's back. Let's take the whole opening again. Bob, uh, I have a little, just a little too much voice. Oh, jeez. You mean I'm screaming? From Hollywood. From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. You're the man who was sent here by the bonding company, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Who's this? My name is Shade, Pat Shade. I'm a private detective working on the case for the bank. Fine. I didn't know they'd hired one, too. They call me every once in a while, tracing phonies, mostly. Is there any chance that you know the missing messenger? Yeah, I know, Lillis. I had him tagged as a clean, honest kid, and I still have. What do you think happened, then? I'm afraid he was either snatched or killed, or, or both. But that's just my opinion. I wondered if you'd like to get together and compare notes. I don't have any notes yet, but I'll be glad to pick your brain. Any place you say. Edmund O'Brien. In another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Great Northern Bonding and Surety Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lillis Bond matter. Expense account item 160... Expense account item 162 dollars and 80 cents airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Chicago. A few phone calls after checking into a hotel bore out the details given me when I was assigned the case. Henry Lillis, the messenger, had left the Golden State Bank at 10.30 a.m. He was carrying $80,000 in cash, and his destination was only a few blocks north on LaSalle Street. He never arrived there. At five that evening, in a bar near my hotel, I met the private detective working the case for the bank. Pat Shade was a puffy, florid man with past 50 beginning to show in his watery blue eyes. I've been in the business for a long time. More years than I like to think. Left the police force and opened my own office in 1931. When Chicago was still the rawest town in the country. Not exactly overdone right now, is it? Quieted down a lot. Just as well for me. I'm too old for the rough work I used to do, and I'm getting older. I'll end up holding the sign of the school crossing one of these years. You younger fellas ought to think about it. Ought to get out of the business before it's too late. There's no future in it. I've heard that said before, but never by anybody who left it for something better. I wish I'd stayed on the force. I'd be on pension now. You know, Scotty Dyer's old man and I walked a beat together. Scotty's a good cop. What'd he tell you? Nothing, really. I just wanted to check in with him, and he gave me a free hand. Tell me about this Henry Lillis. Nothing much to tell. Bright kid, a couple of years out of high school. His father's dead, and he's got a mother to help support. You think you know him well enough to be sure of the honesty you mentioned on the phone? Sure? No. I'm not sure of anything anymore. Anything or anybody. But there's nothing in his background to tell you anything else. He had to have a pretty good record to be bonded by this company, you know that. That's why you think somebody grabbed her, huh? That's my hunch, yeah, I think so. Do you know anything different? No, but it strikes me that a snatch would be pretty hard to carry off in a street as busy as LaSalle at 10.30 in the morning without drawing some attention. Sergeant Dyer tells me none of the people who were near there at the time saw any trouble. It did depend on how it was done. Now, understand, this is only my hunch. I, I don't have the case solved yet. Has anybody talked to his mother, do you know? I think the cops went out this morning. Uh, I guess it'll be all right for me to go out this evening. Worrying about her son, she's probably not going to be in very good shape. Uh, maybe not. But sometimes people who are in bad shape drop a lot of information they wouldn't drop otherwise. Shall we have another round? The Lillis house was a small one in a respectable but not plushy neighborhood. It had been painted recently and its yard was well tended. I noted these things because they made it appear that except for widowhood, Mrs. Lillis and her son were a comfortable and average American family. She was an attractive woman of some 40 years who obviously and with good cause had been crying. Please sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. The police have already been here. I suppose you know that. Yes, I knew they'd come. They didn't say it in so many words, but after they left, I realized they suspect that my son is responsible for this crime, don't they? They aren't sure of anything yet, Mrs. Lillis. It's terribly difficult as a mother to be fair and honest. If Henry did this thing himself, then at least he may be safe and unharmed. And he may come back and and take his punishment. Do you understand? Of course I do. Naturally, my first instinct was to defend him against the suspicion... I couldn't believe it was possible that my son was a thief. But then I realized if someone else was responsible, then Henry had been kidnapped and would be in serious danger. So now, Mr. Dollar, I'm praying that my son is guilty. And if he is, I'll do everything I can to see him brought to justice. I know it's a bad situation for you, but I'll make my part of it as easy as I can. Did your son say or do anything that would have indicated he was planning anything like this? Was he in trouble, or was there anything he wanted to get away from? No, nothing that I noticed. Henry was forced into manhood quite early. He's been without a father since he was nine. He became quite independent, and he shared very little of his outside life with me. He may have wanted to get away from me, however. You mean that he didn't like his responsibility? Yes, he wants me to marry again. I understood that he wasn't your sole support. Well, my husband left me a small income from his insurance. I own this house, but Henry's earnings have always helped. Who are his friends, Mrs. Lillis? I may want to talk to them. Well, he sees hardly any of the friends he made in school. Most of them went on to college. There's one I know of, Raymond Lockhart. He works in a service station on North Michigan Avenue. And you don't know who your son spent the rest of his time with? I'm afraid I don't. Oh, I was very wise. 
I wasn't going to make the same mistake so many widows do with their sons, with possessiveness and too much prying in the name of protection. I let Henry work out his own life and ask very few questions. I was so wise. If Henry is guilty, I'm to blame for it. And he must be guilty and not dead. Thanks, Mr. Sprague. Come in again, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. You caught me in a busy night. I uh, read about this thing with Hank Lillis in tonight's paper. Where's the heard about it? You think he did it? There's one possibility, Raymond. As a matter of fact, I looked you up to ask you the same question. You mean, do I think he did it? Well, if it turns out that way, it'll sure be a surprise to me. The paper said they were looking into the idea that somebody could have forced him into a car. Yeah, every angle is being covered. Yeah, I, I've known Hank for a pretty long time. And I trust him with my paycheck any day in the week. As far as I know, the only trouble he ever got into was uh, kind of his temper. Got him into a few brawls. When did you see him last? Mm, gosh, I don't remember. You see, we used to get out in the town together once every two weeks or so, but we have not for a couple of months. He won't admit it, but I think that he's pretty thick with this girl he's going with. Oh, I didn't know about that. Yeah. Uh, they stopped in here one night to gas up. It's her car. She's pretty all right. Blonde, but I don't know. She kind of struck me as a dish that's been around quite a bit, if you know what I mean. Sometimes you can tell what they can look at, you know? What's her name, do you know? Uh, well, the more I think of it, if Hank is in trouble, I'll lay you ten to one it is his blind. The devil was her name. I talked to him about her. Uh, Lily. Lily or, or Lillian, I think. Oh, what was her name? His mother doesn't know about her, I take it. She didn't mention any girl. No, no, this one is not the type to take home to mother. He said he met her at the bank somewhere. I can check that, then. Yeah. I'll uh, be right with you. Right with you. If her father is some kind of a guard there or something. Guard? A private detective by any chance? Was her last name Shade? Shade, Shade, that's it. Lillian Shade. <laughs> How could I forget a name like that? Go ahead, pour yourself another drink, Shade. I've got an extra bottle in my luggage. Yeah. Did you tell the police about this? Not yet. This will be the end for me if she's mixed up in it. You know where she is? <sighs> Yeah, she told me she was going to spend a couple of days with a friend. Why don't you check the friend? Maybe your daughter is there. She didn't mention any names. She never does. She's no good. She's like her mother was. Uh, you mind? Go ahead. Where is her mother? She ran off with some guy. Lillian was about five. I shipped her off to my sister in Minneapolis, but I, I had to take her back when my sister died. <laughs> she started running wild when she was 13, and I never could stop her. If they pull this together, it's liable to set child psychology back 20 years. The son of a mother who really tried to do the right thing, maybe tried too hard. And the daughter of a guy who didn't try at all. Did you make a point of not mentioning her when we were talking about the Lilith skate earlier? I was waiting for you to ask that. I didn't know there was anything between them. She met him and she dropped in at the bank one morning. I guess I knew they met like that a few more times, but the rest of it, I, I didn't know anything about. Did she have a job? She doesn't work for a few months. When she does work, it's in some cheap bar, so that's worse. Was it your car she drove? No, it was hers. You know the license number? No, but that won't be hard to learn. You're sure it was registered in her name, then? Well, I uh, never noticed the slip. I supposed it was. She said some friend bet some races for her, and she got it with the money she won. I can't see any reason why it wouldn't be in her name. Yeah. Um... Dollar. Huh? It's not decent of you to talk to me instead of going to the police. Instead? I hope you aren't going to ask me not to give this to the police. Oh, no, of course not. But I was going to ask you to let me tell them. It's going to look mighty bad for me if you go in. You know, with Scotty Dyer in charge of the case and his old man and I on the force together in the old days. I don't want it to look like I was holding back information from him. Were you? No, but I won't be able to prove it to you until we find Lillian. She'll tell you I didn't know anything about her and Henry. All right, Shade. You going in tonight? Just as soon as I leave here. And you don't have to do this, but I'd appreciate it if you could forget your calling me down here. It would be better for me if they didn't know you had to tell me about Lillian. All I'm interested in is getting the money back. Doesn't make any difference what I say or don't say. 
You go to the police tonight, and we'll play it as it comes after that. Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Dyer, Dollar. Oh, yes, Sergeant. You're on it early this morning. Anything doing? Henry Lillis just gave himself up. When? This morning? Yep. Hitchhiked in from someplace up the lake. Something about a fight with one of the men in the deal. He messed up some. What about the money? They need some medical work before we can get a decent statement from him. Shock, mostly. I put him in the hospital. Didn't he say anything? And he kept mumbling something about somebody with a name like Saunders. Go on down. We'll talk to him as soon as we can. I think he'll be ready to tell his part of the story anyway. I met Sergeant Dyer at 10 that morning. It was after some 15 minutes of conversation had passed by without mention of Pat Shade that I learned he hadn't reported the night before. I brought up the subject myself and Dyer knew him well enough to automatically reach for the phone and call the bar at my hotel. Shade had stayed there until it closed. Three more calls to his office, his home, and the bank failed to raise him. But right then, it didn't seem too important to the case, since Henry Lillis was in custody. We got in to see him at 11.30. He was a slight, fair-haired kid. By this time, past the feeling of fear. His face was pale and blotched with the disinfectant the doctor had put on some scratches and bruises. You're strong enough to talk now, Lillis? I guess so. This man is from the company that bonded you. You don't look like you had much fun out of that 80 grand, Lillis. No, I didn't. Where is the money? I don't know where it is now, but we took it to a house above Lake Bluff. Who is we? I don't care who it hurts now. Lillian Shade. She was with you then? She was with me or I was with her. I, I don't suppose it makes any difference. We were together. You mentioned hurting somebody. Did you mean her father? Yeah. He talked to me about her once. He... Told me she wasn't any good for me. I hated him then for saying that about his own daughter, but I sure wish I'd listened to him. I wish I'd believed him. None of this would have happened if I had. It did happen, Lillis. We want to know about it, everything about it. Well, I don't know exactly how it started. I, I met her and I was stupid. I'd never known anybody like her before, and it, it sort of seemed as if we were in the same boat. What so do you mean, the same boat? Well, we'd neither one of us had all the things we wanted, and it, Look like we never would. If everybody in that boat turned criminal, there wouldn't be enough banks to go around. Well, I never thought about it before, the, the way she did, but the longer I went with her, the more I began to. She'd done other things, never anything like this. Uh, what but, kind of thing? Well, the way she got the money for her car. She met this man and learned some things from him. She did it so that it could never be called blackmail, and she got the money. A badger game, maybe. I don't think I know quite what that is. Go on. I don't think I have to go through all of it, but, well, one night she kept talking about how I carried large amounts of money all the time and that we didn't have to. I don't, I don't think I have to go through all of it. I don't think I have to go through all of it. Well, one night she kept talking about how I carried large amounts of money all the time and that, that we didn't have any of our own. She said she wouldn't marry me unless we could be rich. So we, we planned this thing. She waited down the street in her car four days in a row until I knew she was... She waited down the street in her car four days in a row until I knew I was making a big transfer. You knew how much you were carrying? Not exactly, but... Well, I'd worked there long enough to know when it was... When it was a big amount, you know, according to where it was going and things like that. So yesterday morning I got into the car, and by the time I was due back at the bank, we were out of town. This house near Lake Bluff where you went, uh, who's it belong to? She said a friend who was on a trip someplace. She had a key. I think it belonged to the Sanders or Saunders or whatever. How'd he fit in? Well, I didn't know anything about him until he showed up late last night. Then I found out that Lillian didn't have any idea of going away with me like she'd said. From the beginning, she knew she wasn't. She was just using me, and, and this man, she'd call him Red. He told me to get out. How much money was your share? None of it. Not any of it. But I didn't even care about that. But Lillian had used me. When this Red told me I went crazy, I guess. There was a fight. That I barely remember. I left the house, but I don't know where I went. And when it got light, I on the highway and started hitchhiking. 
Nobody picked me up because I was all bloody and my clothes were torn. And finally, this man did. He was a minister. We left him after he gave us the best he could in the way of a description. The only thing Lilla seemed sure of was the route to the house near Lake Bluff. The three-state alarm was put out on Lillian Shade and the red-headed man in a green club coop. In less than an hour, the sergeant and I had made our 20-mile trip and were approaching the place on a dirt driveway that stretched some 50 yards of the road. Hey, hold it. It might not be as empty as it looks. A car on each side. I think that might be the girl's service station attendant described it for me. Means they both left in one car, don't you think? Well, probably does. Guess with 80,000, one abandoned car wouldn't mean much. I think the house is empty, all right. Wouldn't make sense for it not to be. Look, through here. Look at the furniture. Where the fight went on. It must have been quite a ruckus. A friend of his told me Lillis packed quite a punch when he got started. Pretty good temper. Yeah, there by the wall. That lamp was thrown. It ought to carry some prints. And we'll look through the rest of it. And I doubt if we'll ever find it. Sergeant Dyer, over here in the kitchen. It's Lillian Shade. She's dead. And so homicide entered the picture and a new alarm was broadcast. Sanders or Saunders in a green club coupe. Wanted on suspicion of grand theft and murder. I had a different idea. I couldn't sell it to the... Sar I couldn't sell it to Sergeant Dyer, but it was one... I couldn't sell it to Sergeant Dyer, but it was one of those things that I couldn't drop. The police laboratory men started combing through the house, and I went back into the city. It was about two in the afternoon, and Pat Shade was in his office. Now, I can explain if you let me. Never mind that. You know that Henry Lillis surrendered to the police, don't you? I uh, didn't handle myself very well last night. I'm not talking about last night. I know. What I'm trying to tell you is that I didn't get around until late today, and I just read about it. Where is Lillian? You know the house she goes to up near Lake Bluff? No, I never heard her say anything about a house up there. Is that where you found her? You were pretty drunk last night. Where'd you go? Yes, I was pretty drunk last night. It's not every day you come to the end of your rope. That's where I got last night after more than 20 years in this filthy business. Where did you go after you left the hotel bar? I went home. What time did you go to bed? I don't remember. Do you remember leaving again after you got home? Where'd I go? Your daughter was murdered last night. But... Uh, what are you accusing me of, young man? I'm not accusing you of anything. I wish I could talk about this later. I don't seem to be thinking very well. I'm afraid we have to talk about it, Pat. Yeah. You asked me if I knew about a house near Lake Bluff because you think I might have killed my daughter. That I... Might have waited until the red-headed man left for some reason and that I went in. How'd you know about the red-headed man? Henry Lillis' statement. Part of it was in the paper. Do you think I killed Lillian? I know that last night you hated your daughter. Yes, I did. I have nothing to lie for anymore so I can be truthful. If I had struck Lillian last night, I wouldn't remember. It may be quite possible that I killed her. I don't remember. I understand you found Pat Shade, Dollar. What do you have to say? Well, I'm not sure what he said because I don't know if his mind was working well or badly. Here, this is the on-the-spot report from the lab men. There are more you can see before we start back. Thanks. Mm. <laughs> this is almost enough, isn't it? Wait till you see the rest of it. I have a tough time squeezing out now. Don't you we go? I 
If you don't mind us busting in like this. Hello, Lillis. Hello. We wondered if you could help us on a few details we're confused on. All right. Are you sure that the only cars that came up to Lake Bluff were Lillian Shades and this uh, Saunders? The only ones I knew about. Were there more? Uh, That's what's confusing us. Now, this fight, uh, it was in the front room and not in the kitchen. Is that right? Well, it's hard to remember, I think so. Uh huh. And after you, you. And after that, you left. And then you caught a ride into town and gave yourself up. Yeah. Why'd you give yourself up, Lillis? I don't know why. It just seemed like the only thing I could do. Because maybe you thought if you gave yourself up on a grand theft charge and told a sad story that we'd never think of you in regard to murder. Murder? That's a dirt driveway, Lillis. The only car that drove up that driveway was Lillian Shade. Looks like there wasn't any red-headed man there at all, doesn't it? Like you messed up that room to make it look like there'd been a fight. Fingerprint men aren't... Three, all right! I didn't mean to kill her. We got out there and we had the money and she got scared. We looked at all of it and she went to pieces. She wanted to take it back and I knew we couldn't. I lost my temper and hit her because I was excited. I thought she was faking, but she wasn't. She she wasn't faking. I I didn't mean to. We can go, can't we, Sergeant? Yeah. I'll come back later for a statement. Expense account item two, $183.30, miscellaneous. Item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $308.90. Remarks? In his next statement, Henry Lillis revealed the hiding place where he'd put the stolen money so the company won't lose. That's more than you can say for the two parents involved, either the deserving or the undeserving. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Herb Butterfield, Jeanette Nolan, Tony Barrett, Tim Graham, and Gil Stratton, Jr. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bob Lamond inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Boys on the kitten. Boys, they were falling down. And you don't know who your son spent the rest of the... And you don't know who your son spent the rest of his time with? I'm afraid I don't. I let Henry work out his own life and tried to ask very few questions. I thought I was so wise. Now, if Henry is guilty, I'm to blame for it. And he must be guilty. And not dead. When did you see him last? Gosh, I don't remember. See, we used to get out in the town together every two weeks or so, but not since we've been going with it. When did you see him last? Gosh, I don't remember. We used to get out on the town together every two weeks or so, but not since he's been going with his new girl. Oh, I didn't know about her. Yeah, pretty all right, a blonde, but she kind of struck me as a dish that's been around quite a bit, if you know what I mean. What's her name, do you know? 
What the devil was it? Uh, L- Lily or, or Lillian, I think. His mother doesn't know about her, I take it. She didn't mention any girl. Well, she's not the type to take home to mother. Uh, her father's some kind of a guard at the bank. Guard? Private detective by any chance? Was her last name Shade? Shade, Shade, that's it. Lillian Shade. <laughs> How could I forget a name like that? Go ahead. Where is her mother? She ran off with some guy. Lillian was about five. I shipped her off to my sister in Minneapolis, but I had to take her back when my sister died. <sighs> she started running wild when she was 13, and I never could stop her. Did you make a point of not mentioning her when we were talking about the Lillis kid earlier? I met Sergeant Dyer at 10 that morning, and it was after some 15 minutes of conversation had passed by without mention of Pat Shade that I learned he hadn't reported the night before. But right then, it didn't seem too important to the case, since Henry Lillis was in custody. We got in to see him at 11.30. He was a slight, fair-haired kid by this time past the feeling of fear. His face was pale and blotched with the disinfectant the doctor had put on, some scratches and bruises. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Nick Walters, Johnny. Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding. Oh, hi, Nick. How's with you? Good and bad, Johnny. Good and bad. Well, I'm sure it's nothing good you've called me about. What's the problem? $58,000. $58,000. Huh. Lost, paid, or stolen? As if I didn't know. Yeah, probably stolen. Ever heard of the old Lang Syne Furniture Company? I have not. Sounds like a gag. It's no gag. Some of the finest traditional furniture in the world comes out of that plant. Really? It's up in northern Massachusetts in a little town north of Pittsburgh, and it's run by a bunch of real characters. Oh, how do you mean? Well, I suggest that when you go up there, you wear a dark blue suit, white shirt, and black four-in-hand tie. Huh? Oh, and suspenders. Be sure you wear suspenders. Are you kidding? Why? Uh, why don't you come over here at the office and let me tell you about it. Yeah, Nick, I think I'd better. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action practice sense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the two face matter. Expense account item one. After shaving, showering, and donning the most funereal clothes I could find, item one, a dollar ten taxi to Nick Weldon's office at Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding. Uh, just remember what I told you, Johnny. The old Lang Syne Furniture Company is run by a bunch of characters. Yeah, that's what intrigues me. That's why I came over here. Oh, they're craftsmen, all right. The old school. May take them a couple of years to make an ordinary straight-back chair. But when it's done, it's the most beautiful thing you ever saw. And the finish they get on the pieces they turn out. Beautiful. And expensive, too, huh? Oh, sure, but worth it. Any piece of furniture they make will last 100, 500 years. Yeah, the real honest craftsman, the kind you don't see anymore. Uh Uh-huh. Well, apparently somebody wasn't too honest with them. So tell me all, Nick. Johnny, it seems one of their lads has run off with some of the company money. Yeah, you mentioned 58,000 bucks. Yep. 58,433 to be exact, and those boys are exact. Well, what did the police have to say? Nothing. They were never called in. Well, why not? I told you, the place is run by a flock of real characters. Oh, brother, they must be. When did this happen? Sometime within the past three and a half years. And you've just found out about it now? That's right. Well, how come? I told you, John. Yeah, that's right. You told me. There are a bunch of characters. But didn't their policy state that any claim had to be filed within 60 days of the loss? Oh, we waived that for them. Struck it from the policy. Why? Because they don't like to be rushed or anything. Rushed? After all, 60 days. And don't forget, they only discovered the loss a bit over a month ago. They even took a month to let you know about it. Yeah. 
And yet you say it could have occurred as much as three and a half years ago. Yeah, 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 I know. But uh, why don't you save the questions for Mr. J. Worthington Teasley? Who's he? Yeah, the senior member of the organization, I guess you'd call him. There, there are no officers, you know, president, vice president, and so on. You mean a company big enough to suffer a cash loss of $58,000? Johnny, I told oh, you. Oh, yeah, I... yeah, that's right, you told me. Yeah. So, will you go up there and see what's what? <laughs> Nick, I'm going up there for just one reason, on expense account, of course. Oh, no, of course. And that is to take a good look at these crazy characters you've been telling me about. <laughs> Item two, 325 for a bus to Fitchburg, Massachusetts, where at the terminal I picked up a local to North Weldon, home of the old Lang Syne Furniture Company. The name was appropriate. Located on the outskirts of the quiet little New England town, it consisted of a huge barn-like building that looked as though it had been standing there since the year one. Surrounded by stately elm trees and a couple of gnarled ancient oaks, it looked, well, very picturesque. A large wrought iron weathercock raced one end of the high peak shingle roof and looked down on broad lawns and well kept flower beds. The road leading up to it was just an old fashioned dirt road, and I kicked the dust as I plodded along. Then suddenly I stopped. For there at the side, instead of automobiles, were, believe it or not, horses. Horses and carriages and a bicycle or two or three. It was almost as though a picture of 50 or 60 years ago had suddenly come to life. And then inside, when I found Mr. J. Worthington Keasley, well, he looked like one of the Smith brothers. And sitting in front of a fine but ancient roll-top desk. Of course we do, Mr. Dollar. Our fathers and their fathers before them all wore full beards. Therefore, we do, too. Would you like a bit of snuff, sir? No. Uh, no, thanks. Yes, it's one of the traditions, sir. The traditions to which we adhere in order that we may continue to fabricate the superlative furniture for which we've become famous over the past 107 years. And I take it, Mr. Keesley, that the same thing applies to the horses and carriages out there at the sign? Yes. They were good enough for our grandparents, so they're good enough for us. Uh, I suppose that's why I should have suspected Mr. Twiller. Mr. Twiller? Roscoe James Twiller, Mr. Dollar. Uh, here, sir. There's a picture of him. In this group photograph taken on the occasion of our 100th anniversary. <laughs> I feel like I ought to yell beaver. I'm afraid his mighty shock of hair and magnificent beard misled me back in 1941 when I hired him. Yes, and I suppose I should have known when he gave up Boston Surrey to drive one of those newfangled motor cars. Should have known what, Mr. Keesley? That he was no longer a man suited to our fine establishment. Is he the one who took off with your $58,000? $58,433.41. Are you sure? I mean, sure it was he? Beyond the shadow of a doubt, sir. He was the only one beside myself who had a key to the vault in which we kept our building fund. And when he suddenly left us three years, five months, and 16 days ago, yes, yes, I should have known. But you didn't discover the loss until recently. It was June 21st at four minutes after 10 that I went down to the vault. For the first time in four years, we had something extra to put aside. And you discovered the money was missing. The vault was empty. Except for this note. Huh? Goodbye, suckers. Hard word. Signed, Twiller. So, you see, Mr. Dollop. Yes, yes, I do. It looks like he's our man. No question about it. And you've no idea where he might have gone? None whatsoever. Well, surely there must be some clue. None whatsoever. But you must find him. But that was three and a half years ago. Exactly three years, five uh, months, yeah, and sixteen. Yeah. So where do I start? Unless your company decides simply to reimburse us for our loss, that, Mr. Dollar, is up to you. Of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Sometimes we may wonder why a football team doesn't quit playing and walk off the field when it finds itself 50 points behind with only a few minutes of play to go. What is that indomitable spirit that fills men with hope and keeps them going in spite of terrific odds? Keeps them going just to play the game according to the rules. Just to get the job done as well as they know how. 
This kind of spirit pervaded the feelings of heavy bomber crews of the 9th Air Force on that day of glory, August 1st, 1943, the day of one of the most secretly planned surprise bombing missions of World War II. The day of the low-level attack on the Romanian oil refineries at Ploesti. More than 170 B-24 heavily loaded bombers took off in a swirl of red dust from Benghazi, Libya, to bomb a highly defended priority target. The element of surprise in the low-level attack was to be one of their greatest weapons. But things went wrong from the start. Three planes exploded during takeoff operations. Eleven more aborted due to engine trouble. Of those that reached the target area, less than one-third returned to home base. The leaders of the mission encountered navigation difficulties and difficulty in identifying specific targets. And due to the loss of that elemental hope, surprise, they also encountered devastating enemy firepower from flak and fighters. The mission was partially successful but a horrifying experience. Five medals of honor were awarded to the heroes of the Ploesti Raid for valorous action above and beyond the call of duty. At any time, the men would have been justified in turning back, but they had a code of conduct that made them want to see the unequal game through to the end. It was a job that had to be done. A... Charge of the light brigade in the air as they flew down the valley of death to glory. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Two Faced Matter. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Keesley, it looks like this man Triller is the one who walked off with the money in your safe when he left your employ. No question about it. And unless you can find him, your company will have to pay the full amount of the loss. Yeah, well, even if I do find him, the chances are he'll have spent that money. After all, three years and a half. Exactly three years, five months, and... Um, you say you have no idea whatsoever as to where he might have gone. With that much money, he could be anywhere in the world. Uh-huh. Where did he live? I don't know, sir. You... What? After all, it was none of my affair. But if he worked for you a number of years... You... I make it a rule never to pry into the affairs of others. Except, of course, where the manufacture of fine furniture is concerned. Well, doesn't anybody in this organization know anything about Triller? Possibly Mr. Bottomley. Who is he? He is presently engaged in creating a hepophyte table in the shop. Come, we shall speak with him. The huge shop dated back a uh, hundred years at least. There wasn't a single power tool, not even a buzzsaw. But some of the tools looked as though they might have been used to build the ark. Eight or ten men, all of them old, all wearing dark trousers, suspenders, and white aprons, were busy turning out fine pieces of furniture, carefully, almost lovingly. And every one of them wore his own distinctive full beard. <laughs> Hooray for tradition. Mr. Keesley led the way to a man who was gently trimming the edge of some kind of a sideboard. Good morning, Mr. Bottomley. Good morning, Mr. Keesley. You must pardon this intrusion, Mr. Bottomley. It must be for good reason, Mr. Keesley. Though you must understand that I cannot afford interruption if I am to finish this credenza by the first of the year coming. Of course. I wish you to meet Mr. Johnny Dollar. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. How are you? He is an investigator, Mr. Bottomley. Come to get us back the money we lost. Then he must find Mr. Twiller. Exactly. Good morning, Mr. Thurston. Good morning, Mr. Keesley. Mr. Keesley tells me you know where this man Twiller lived. He was my neighbor. Lived alone next door to me. Where? And I assure you, sir, I had no idea of his designs on the company building fund. Yes, I'm sure, but now if you tell... Each morning, he drove me to work in his carriage until he purchased that abominable motor car. Oh? I refused to ride in it, sir, and bought myself a bicycle. You did properly, Mr. Bottomley. Good morning, Mr. Woodstone. My name is Keeley. Well, just where is it that Twiller lives, Mr. Bottomley? In the village of North Weldon. East North Weldon. On Peach Avenue. Well, then perhaps the authorities there will be able to give me some kind of a lead. The authorities? Mr. Police, Mr. Keeley? Police? Good heavens. 
I hope not, Mr. Dollar. Surely not, Mr. Dollar. Gentlemen, 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 please. These gentlemen are right, Mr. Dollar. Think of the blot on our good name. Now, look, your loss amounts to $58,000. $58,400. If I don't find this man, my company's going to have to pay off. I know, but the police... Now, look, my immediate job is to find this Roscoe James Twiller. And if I need the help of the police to do it... Who's the chief of police in North Weldon? Well, the, uh, the mayor, Mr. Dollar. What's his name? John Kenworthy Wilkins, Mr. Dollar. Any of you know him? We do not mix with the townspeople, Mr. Dollar. We don't even go into town, Mr. Dollar. That's right. But I do have a picture of the mayor. Here, sir. Bottomley, where did you get this? Uh, he's, he's running for re-election, Mr. Keesley. I found this, this poster in my carriage. Well, get rid of it, man. This is uh, indecent. No, no, wait a minute. Let me see that. Terrible. Disgusting. Huh? Why, it's a disgrace to have such a thing within the world of a fine old company. <laughs> oh, no. No wonder the old boys were shocked. For his honor, the mayor of North and East North Weldon was not only as bald as a billiard ball, but to top it off was clean shaven. Yeah, a picture like this within the walls of the All Lang Syne Furniture Company was real sacrilege. But I still hadn't done my job. I had to find this man, Triller, or let the company pay out 58,000 bucks. How to find him? I hadn't the least idea. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Times have changed, and so has the man. During the 18th and 19th centuries, warfare with its musket fire and cavalry charges and cannonades was a simple, direct, easily understood type of conflict. The undisciplined but sharp-eyed revolutionaries hid behind trees and hedgerows to pick off the advancing British troops. The wild, dashing, hell-for-leather cavalry charges of the Civil War and Custer's encounter with Sitting Bull and the Sioux Indians were, though courageous, simple and direct. But they were far removed from the developments of the Atomic Age, which demands selectivity, skill, and rigorous training. Until recently, the soldier's general level of knowledge determined his job suitability. Today, however, with more and more complex weapons and equipment being used, the military needs large numbers of skilled technicians. To that end, tests have been developed to find men with intelligence and technical aptitude, and to develop in these men the needs of the future. Yes, times have changed. And so has the man. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Two-Faced Matter. I found the mayor of North Weldon sitting comfortably on the shaded porch of his home, fanning himself with an election placard and sipping at what looked suspiciously like a gin and tonic. If uh, you're certain that I can't fetch you a uh, <coughs> limeade, too, Mr. Dollar? No, no thanks, Mayor Wilkins. Yes. Well, now, as I started to say, when I first came here, I did hear something, some rumor about money having been taken from the old Lang Syne Furniture Company. But until they lodge a complaint with me, uh, we see I'm also chief of police. Yes, well, uh, the one I can see, they're pretty slow about things like that. Yeah, yeah, they're slow about everything. But they make magnificent furniture. Mm -hmm, I could see that. Tell me, did you know this Roscoe Twiller at all? No, uh, gone before I came to North Weldon. Oh? But well, that was only three and a half years ago. And I came after that. Yet you're the mayor of the town. Uh, village, really, Mr. Dollar. But lovely place. It, I've always... I've liked it ever since the first time I saw it. And when the people learned of my police record... Huh? I, <laughs> my, my record in police work out in Ohio, why, they insisted that I take over my present job for oh, them. I see. And you have no idea where I could get a lead on this man Twiller? No. No, sorry. He, uh, 
Don't the uh, people at the furniture factory have any ideas about him? None whatsoever. You're sure? I'm sure. Yes. Well, if what you've told me is true about his getting the money, I mean, he is probably far, far away. Yep, I'm afraid so. Just as far as I am from solving this case. Well, we chatted on for a few minutes, and then I left him in the hope of finding some erstwhile neighbor who might be able to give me some help. I headed across town toward Peach Avenue. And as I was about to pass the bus stop... Bang! Bang! Huh? Well, hi there, fella. Cowboy, huh? Sure, I'm a cowboy and a policeman and an artist and everything. Sure. My name's uh, Jimmy Carter. What's yours? Tony, darling. Want to see some of my artistical drawings? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure I do, Jimmy. Just look at this cigarette advertisement here on the phone. Uh-huh. With my own crayons, too. Okay. How's that? <laughs> Jimmy, that's the most beautiful mustache I ever saw on any girl. Sure. My teacher says I'm going to grow up and be a great artist. Oh, sure. But first I have to get a paint set. Sure, sure you do. And see what I've done with this one. Sure, you... Jimmy. That's our mayor. Yeah. He's I... running for re-election. That's why he has all these signs on him. Don't you think he looks a lot better with some hair on his old bald head? And a little child shall leave him. Now I'm going to put a beard on him. <laughs> like, like some of those old men at the furniture factory. Stay with us, Jimmy. Stay with us. Ah, they're funny old men. Like this. Uh-huh. Only they never come in town. They never... There. Doesn't that look like one of them? There. Jimmy, that's so good, I'm going to say that. Really? Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. I sure do. I didn't know I was that good. Jimmy, you'll never know how good you are. <laughs> Back so soon, Mr. Dollar? Mayor Wilkins, or rather, Chief Wilkins. Yeah? I have to ask you to make an arrest. You you uh, mean you've uh, found the man that you've been looking for? If there's any question about it, I'll make a civilian arrest. Well, I, I, I don't understand, sir. Only a few minutes ago... Only a few minutes ago, I was blind as a bat to the most obvious possibility in the world. You showed up in this town a short time after Roscoe Twiller left. Yes, that's true. Roscoe Twiller, with a heavy shock of hair and a thick beard. Well, if I understand, it's all men out at the old Lang Syne furniture. You, clean-shaven, completely bald. Mr. Dollar, I should have realized by the funny pink tint on the top of your noggin that you've been using some kind of hair remover. I beg your pardon, sir. Here, look at yourself. Yes. Where'd you get that? Roscoe James Twiller, alias John Kenworthy Wilkins. Now, now, Mr. Darling... And I'll bet that if I make a search of your house, I'll find the key to that vault in the furniture factory. No, I threw it away. I, I... Yeah. Do you want to make the arrest yourself, Twiller? Or shall I? <laughs> Twiller gave up so easily. I guess it was because I'd caught him completely off guard. He even signed a confession and promised to pay back what he could. So, from here on in, it's up to the courts. And all thanks to a little kid who liked to draw mustaches on billboards. Expense account total, including the finest paints that I could find for my little pal Jimmy. Ooh, hey, wait, I gotta pad this. It only comes out to $9.80. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Will Wright, Herb Vigran, Boris Lewis, Edgar Barrier, Richard Beals, Bill James, and Gus Bays. Be sure to join us, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 
This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. This is Edward Whiteman, Mr. Dollar. I understand that Mr. Soderberry's death brought you here. Yes, thanks for calling back. I tried to locate the constable. Fred Remen, I believe his name is? Uh, yes. I haven't found him, so I thought I'd talk with you. You were riding with Mr. Soderberry when he was killed, is that right? Yes, I was. I'll do everything I can to help you. And as a matter of fact, I just left Constable Remen. Oh? Where is he? I'd like to see him. He thinks he's found the place from which the shots were fired. The roof of Goodwin's store. I left him there less than five minutes ago. If you'll meet me in front of your hotel, I'll show you. Thanks, Mr. Whiteman. I'll be down right away. Edmund O'Brien, in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Britannia Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Soderberry main matter. Expense account item one, $42.45, airfare, car rental, and incidentals between Hartford and Soderberry. I, for one, had never heard of the town, but I found it a few miles from Portland, Maine. First two church spires, and then the small group of companion buildings all set against a peaceful New England background. The first thing I noticed when I drove onto a single business street was that some bunting, a few Amer... The first thing I noticed when I drove onto a single business street was that some bunting and a few American flags were still standing, reminders of the ceremony during which its leading citizen, Gordon Soderberry, had been murdered. His personal secretary and assistant, Edward Whiteman, gave me the details after I met him in front of my hotel. The ceremony? Oh, yes, you wouldn't have noticed entering town from the east. You didn't know about the factory? No, I hadn't heard. You new one? No, Mr. Soder Soderberry... No, Mr. Soderberry built it during the first year of World War II. He won some subcontracts from the shipbuilders and hoped to bring new wealth to the town. The ceremony was arranged this morning because it reopened. No, I'd hardly... It could hardly have been called happy even before the tragedy. Oh, the town wasn't in favor of the factory? Uh, definitely not. Uh, we cross over here. These people are settled in their ways. The factory changed things. Outside men came into work, married local girls, and took them away. The farmers in the section lost the free labor of their sons to wages and had to hire older men. I can see how it would upset a place like this. You think somebody could have been incensed enough over the reopening to have killed Mr. Soderberry? I have no idea. I thought I should mention the feeling of the town. He and I were in the first of three cars driving to the factory. We were in the rear seat. Suddenly, he stiffened. He made this sound that... Well, I couldn't describe it. I, I didn't know what had happened. I, I don't think I heard the shots. He slumped forward. It was all over. Uh, th this, this is Goodwin's store. Here. Where was the car? As closely as I can recall, it was directly in front. Straight out from here. Of course, the chauffeur stopped as soon as he realized what had happened. That'd be about up there, uh, near the wagon. It was a limousine, I hear. That's pretty close shooting. Were the windows up or down? And they were down. Open, that is. How do you get up in the roof of the store? Well, there are stairs in the rear. Fred! Well, Constable Remen! Yes? Uh, who's that? Ed Whiteman. There's a man here who's been sent up from Connecticut to see you. Wants to ask you some questions. I have to go back to the office. All right. What can I do for you? Why did you pick this roof as the place where the shooting was done? Because Mr. Soderberry's auto was just in front. And none of the others, three or four doors either side, have stairs to them. Hmm. That's good enough. Even resting a rifle barrel on the false front would be some pretty fancy shooting. There have been some fair riflemen in the section for a good number of years now, if you know your history. I've been proud of their shooting at some of the matches we've had, but I can't say I'm so proud now. Do you have any idea where to start? There's been a man in my mind. Ben Southern. He had a 16-year-old son killed by a bandsaw when the factory was open before. And now he's got another. Young Ben. He'll reach 16 next week. Mr. 
We walked to the Sutherland house, which was only about a quarter of a mile away, and Fred Remen gave me the background of the town. The Soderberries had been in control of the town and the surrounding country for more than three generations. Always they had been respected as thrifty, honest people, but never had they been well liked. The death of 53-year-old Gordon Soderberry meant the last of the male lineage. The sole survivor was his sister, Beth, many years his junior. The constable didn't seem impressed when I told him that potentially she was some $60,000 richer in cash in view of Gordon's insurance policy. We crossed a bridge to reach Ben Sutherland's house and found his wife waiting for us near the front door. I know why you've come, Fred Rimmin. I heard about the trouble. Mr. Sutherland wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do such a thing. Well, I didn't come to say right out that he did. Where's your husband, Mr. Sutherland? Could we talk to him? Who are you? He's Mr. Dollar. Gordon Soderberry insured his own life. And this man is looking for the one that took it. It'll both do better to go some other place for your question. We'd like to talk to your husband if you'll tell us where he is. He ain't here. And young Ben? Where is he? He ain't here either. Where did they go? We wouldn't come here if we didn't have reason to. The constable told me your husband has made threats against Gordon Soderberry because of the death of your other son. You must have known that. So now you must understand why we're here. Mr. Sutherland's a God-fearing man, and he wouldn't take the law into his own hands. You know that, Fred Grimmin. He called you his friend. I'm nobody's friend now. If you're convinced he had nothing to do with the trouble, why don't you tell us where he is? Because he told me not to. I keep my husband's word. He said, don't tell anybody, so I won't. Well, when did he leave? Last night. He drove his truck. I know the sound of it. And if he'd come through town, it would have woke me. So he went the other way. I know that road. And where he'd pass through. Well, you don't leave me no doubt, Mrs. Sutherland. I'll have to put the state police after the truck. Your business, what you have to do, not mine. Don't you see you're making it worse by trying to hide the truth? Hide the truth? I'm keeping a trust, young man. And if you don't know the worth of a trust, you don't know the worth of anything. I went back with Constable Raymond to his house where he lived alone and which doubled as an office. He phoned the description and license number of Sutherland's truck to his county superiors. And with the typical disinterest, higher echelon seemed to maintain for lower echelon problems... They told him they wouldn't be able to take delivery of Soderberry's body until the following day. That left us with no better than a vague promise as to when we'd get such vital points as the caliber of the murder weapon, the entry angle of the fatal bullet, and the distance from which it was fired. Remen left me and went to talk with some of the townspeople, and that evening, soon after dusk, I went to the Soderberry home, hoping that his sister Beth would be in condition to receive me. Yes? Uh, is Miss Soderberry in? Yes, she's in. I wonder if she feels well enough to see me. Does she know who you are? Not yet. I've been hired by her brother's insurance company to look into his death. Would you tell her that, please? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, won't you come in? Thank you. My name's Taft. I'm a friend of the family's. Taft? My name is Dollar. How do you do? Beth is in the sitting room. I'll leave it to your judgment. That is, I hope that if your visit upsets her, you won't press her. I won't. All right. Beth? Yes, come in, Lawrence. Well, who was... Oh. This is Mr. Dollar. He's from the insurance company. I see. Please, sit down. Thanks. I don't believe I quite understand, Mr. Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, well, of course. Then would you prefer that we talked in privacy? Well, I'll leave that up to you, Miss Soderberry. I think Mr. Taff has stayed out of a sense of duty. No, I haven't. But at least this will give you a chance to leave for a bit, Lawrence. I'll be all right. All right, Beth. I probably should run home for a while. All right. We thank you ever so much, Lawrence. You've been terribly helpful. I'll phone you in an hour. Good evening, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mr. Tan. Now, Mr. Dollar, when did you arrive? About three this afternoon. Then undoubtedly you know more about this, this horrible thing than I do. I'm afraid it's not very much. I've been working with Constable Remen. He wants to narrow it down to one of the local men who is against the factory reopening. But from what I've learned, it refuses to be narrowed very much on that basis. Yes, I'm afraid you're quite right. My brother was not famous for making friends. I say that at the risk of sounding cold and unemotional. Emotion very seldom helps in my work. Which is ferreting out the truth. I think Gordon understood what he was doing. I'm sure he did. 
He knew that our people detest change. They, they, they simply can't cope with it. Yet, yet he forced it on them in 1942. You feel yourself to be apart from your people, Miss Soderberry. Yes, but only by reason of inheritance. Change was forced upon me, too. I was much younger than my brother. I, I was sent to school in England, but I came back and found it quite easy to forget and settle back into this tiny world. I suppose the whole town did during the years after the factory closed. Of course it did. There was one particular man, Ben Sutherland. What do you think of him? I don't know. I suppose his name is in everyone's mind tonight. The death of his son because of the hated factory, it, it had a violent reaction on him. And why not? He knew his son hadn't been born to stand in front of the machine that killed him. What does he say? He can't be located. He left town last night. He took young Ben with him. I hope it isn't he. He suffered enough. Oh, what could be troubling the general? That's your dog? <laughs> yes, it's General Scott. He did an alarm when you arrived, did he? Oh, well, it's the first I've heard from him. Oh, someone else's animal, perhaps. But that seldom happens. He's well able to fend for himself. He's a... a... By the time we got an oil lantern lit and I found the dog, he was moving silently toward the house, trailing what looked like a fractured front leg. I didn't know what to think when I told the surviving sister about it. She didn't seem frightened. But I couldn't help wondering whether her loyalty to her people wasn't misplaced and whether the killer hadn't decided to eliminate all the Soderberries from the town that bore their name. I phoned Constable Raymond as soon as I got back into the house, but it was a needless call. The sound of the shots in the quiet village had aroused everyone, and those who cared seemed to know right where to come. The first to arrive was Edward Whiteman, the dead man's assistant. Less than a minute later, the constable and Lawrence Taft. After we'd made another swing around the house without turning up anything, and after we'd satisfied ourselves that Beth Soderberry was well protected, Raymond and I started back toward my hotel. Tell me about Beth and these others, Whiteman and this man Taft. Which end do you want first? Whiteman. He's not a native, is he? No, he's from Bangor. He came here when Mr. Soderberry commenced to open up. He's not an old friend like Taft, then? Not hardly. Lawrence Taft was orphaned a good deal back. His folks died in the fire. Mr. Soderberry took him in, sent him to school in Brunswick. Taft helped him with the factory last time. He made a smart man out of him. But I wouldn't say a happy one. How come? Unless folks leave town and never come back, they're all mixed up. When they're twixt and between, like Taft is, it ain't natural. That's pretty much what Beth told me. She and him have been sort of flicked off and on. Well, I'll cut across here. You got your direction straight? Yeah. Where was Lawrence Taft this morning, Constable? You mean when the trouble broke out? That's right. With Miss Beth, most likely. Why? I guess we can check that, then. You are thinking he killed Mr. Soderberry, are you? I don't want anything to slip by us. You don't know us, people. We pay what we owe if it takes all our life. The debt that was between them two was thicker than blood. Lawrence Taft would have killed himself before he would have killed Mr. Soderberry. You know them better than I do. That's the truth. I'll see you in the morning. I hope you sleep well. The next day, things moved along a little more according to the book. The county men arrived before noon to remove the body for autopsy and ballistics examination, and soon after they left a report. The county men arrived before noon to remove the body for autopsy and ballistics examination, and soon after they left, a report came in from the state police. Ben Sutherland and his truck had been spotted leaving a town five miles away. A car escorted him to Soderberry, and the constable and I were at his house when he arrived. to you. Ben! Stop your nagging tongue. Go in the house where you're suited to be. I'll tend to your prying when I have a mind to. Yes, Ben. I was only worried. I just got hurt. so horrible. From the look of your face and your clothes, Ben, you've been through one thing or another. Who might you be? My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. He's come to help me defend the laws of the state, Ben. And it's true, Fred, that Mr. Soderberry was shot and killed. That's true. When did you hear about it, Mr. Sutherland? Those men that stopped me, they told me. They told me you wanted to uh, talk to me about it, Fred. That's true. And I don't take to it, because we were friends. You left town night before last, Mr. Sutherland. Where'd you go? Do I have to answer this stranger's questions? It'll be better if you do. 
And that night I made up my mind I, what I had to do. I took young Ben away. That's my youngest son. I should have took my oldest boy. I knew I should have. But I listened to the talk about the factory and wages and such things. So I didn't take him. And that factory did. And I never got him back. And you've blamed Gordon Soderberry for it all these years. No, I blamed myself. I knew what to do and I didn't do it. Didn't you make public threats against him? That was a coward's talk. I talked big in front of my friends. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't kill him, Fred. Where'd you go the other night? I heard the talk start again. Young Ben talking about the factory, uh, what the wages would buy. He'd be careful, he told me. And if he earned enough wages, he'd go to school like Lawrence Taft. Crazy like his brother. And I put an axe handle to him and put him in the truck and carried him away. Where, Mr. Sutherland? He's on a farm where he belongs. Up north, above Brighton. He's on a farm where he'll be safe. How far away is it? More than 20 miles. What time did you leave? After nine o'clock. You got there before midnight, then? We slept in the truck. I left him with Alex Turner. Turner. Then you had time to drive back here before the factory... Then you had time to drive back here before the factory ceremony started. I went to Brighton. Your face is scratched and cut. Your clothes are torn. How did that happen? I fought with the men. What man and why did you fight? I don't know what man. I don't know who. I fought because I was drunk. I went to Brighton to drink and that's what I did. Not for nine years has that happened. You didn't come back here last night and have to fight over dog at the Soderberry place? I was in Brighton. If you were, you'll probably be asked to prove that's it. That's where I was. And you'd better start remembering who you fought or who you were with. That's all for me, Constable. We were involved with approximately 280 people, most of whom were known to each other by sight, at least. The work Constable Remen had been doing without me had alibied most of them. Practically everybody had been on the street during the start of the ceremony and at the time of the shooting. Less than 40 were unaccounted for at 5.30 that afternoon when the county officers called in their report. The point of entry was just below the left armpit. The arm hadn't been touched. The angle of entry still made it look like the killer had fired from the roof of the store. And the murder weapon was identified as a not-too-common rifle, caliber 253,000. In an hour, the unaccounted-for citizens seemed to be trimmed down to four who owned that caliber rifle. Ben Sutherland was among them. It was close to noon the following day before the results of the test firing came back. The murder weapon wasn't among the rifles that were sent in. Well, then I did something wrong. I am no great shakes of trouble like this. It's not necessarily that we did something wrong, Constable. Maybe we just didn't do quite enough. One of those 253,000s got away from us. A man's rifle is no secret here. He's proud of it. What kind of rifle did Gordon Soderberry own? Why? The townspeople hated the factory. That's the motive we've given them. But none of them own the murder weapon. Not even poor Ben Sutherland with a stronger motive than anyone else. Unless he could have bought a rifle with just this in mind and kept it hidden. I don't know. We'll work on that, too. But for now, let's look at the people we've neglected. Edward Whiteman can't be involved because he was sitting next to the victim. You tell me Lawrence Taft is clear. He wouldn't ever kill Mr. Soderberry. Then the sister. She seems to belong more to the town than to the family. She didn't approve of what her brother was doing. I can't hold a thing like that in my mind. We don't kill our kin here. There are some that have. Will you do this for me? Will you get the three of them in here and keep them for an hour? But how would I keep them? I don't know. Write up a statement for them to sign, something about the ballistics reports. You can spend some time over them. Then ask the sister to go into detail about what she's going to do with the factory. I'll try to take less than an hour. I ain't saying I can do it word for word, but, but I'll try. And if you'll write that statement, I'll be obliged. I ain't so good with a pencil. It took me somewhat less than an hour, and what I found didn't make sense for a while. A rifle, well hidden beneath some torn clothes in the closet. The rifle's caliber matched that of the weapon that had killed Gordon Soderberry. I reached his home soon after his sister did. Why, well, yes, he's here, Mr. Dollar. How much do you know what le- How much do you know what lay behind the trouble the other morning? I beg your pardon? If you know who killed your brother, you'd better clear your skirts. Two people are going to tear up any lies you tell. Mr. Dollar, if you know, please tell me. Lawrence Taft. Uh, oh, no. No, he didn't. We've been... Why do you... Why do you say that? You better say that first line again. Oh. Oh, no. No, he didn't. Why do you say that? We've pretty much cleared up... 
We've pretty much cleared the whole town of the murder. You can't do that without having something left over. Oh, but you're wrong. Lawrence wouldn't kill my brother. That's what I've been told. But would you react the same way if Edward Whiteman was dead and I told you Taft had killed him? I... I'm sorry, I don't... Lawrence! Lawrence, come here! I'm here, sir. It isn't true. It isn't true, is it? I heard what you said, Mr. Dollar. What reason would you have to say anything like that? I just left your house. In it, I found a rifle and some clothing that was torn by the dog last night when you evidently came back to overhear what I said to Beth. Lawrence. You didn't have any reason to kill Gordon Soderberry, did you? No. No, I didn't. But you hated Whiteman, didn't well, what you? What reason would I... The factory, for one. You were important last time, but you were left out the other morning. Isn't that right? Oh, always the factory. What difference did it make to you, Lawrence? Renan told me the people... Renan told me you people always paid your debts. Maybe that was it. That an outsider came in and forced him out so he couldn't prove himself. Maybe he was afraid Whiteman would force him out of your life, too. I don't know. Lawrence, you didn't think that I... Yes. You did try to kill Edward Whiteman, didn't you? Yes. And Gordon Soderberry was killed by mistake. Yes. Lawrence, no. I didn't mean to. I know I'm weak and I'm mixed up, but... I don't know where I belong, but I knew he couldn't stay here. Whiteman was taking my place, and I knew people were laughing at me because I failed. I did try to kill him. thought it was for you. I didn't know until later. Later I found out. Later I found out it was Gordon. It was dead. Gordon. I owe him everything. Expense account item two, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $84.90. Remarks? None. Except that maybe the now wealthy Beth Soderberry may have been right. That anybody with generations of background in an insular village like that does take a gamble when he comes out. To say nothing of a half-generation Hartfordian when he goes in. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Robert North, Howard McNear, Virginia Gregg, Larry Thor, Sammy Hill, Herb Butterfield, and David Light. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bob Lamond inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Uh, Johnny, this is Len Walker at Surety Mutual Insurance. Out there in the wild and golden west? Yep. Still holding down a desk out here in San Francisco. Well, how are you, Len? What goes these days? Goes off is more like it, Johnny. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? Three neat, tidy little explosions that have cost us well over a million dollars apiece. Wow. What kind of explosions, Len? Rocket fuel type of stuff. Oh? Yeah. Where? The Bascom Development Company. It's hidden away along the coast a few miles south. Bascom, hmm? So if you want to grab your space suit and pop on out here, well, <laughs> who knows? Maybe they'll oblige by sending you aloft on their next blow-up. You make it sound very attractive, Len. <laughs> I'll tell you this, Johnny. If you can find out the why of this and put a stop to it, we'll pay you enough to let you fly high and wide and handsome for a long time to come. Now you do make it sound attractive. Well, then. Okay. I'll start practicing on the first plane I can get. <laughs> CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
stats account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Surety Mutual Insurance Company, San Francisco office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the top secret matter. Count item one, 199.27. That covers a taxi out to Bradley Field, the hop to New York, and from there, a one-stop flight on out to the West Coast. At New York International, I thought I was the last one aboard before takeoff. But just as the big jet started taxiing out to the runway, a well-dressed gentleman with a well-stuffed briefcase plunked it into the seat beside me. Well, looks as though I just made it. By the skin of your teeth, and you better fasten your seatbelt. Be- hey, George! What? Why, it's Johnny, Johnny Dollar. In person? Well, this is an unexpected pleasure. Well, how's the prosperous businessman? Just fine, and you? Couldn't be better. You on your way up the coast, too? No, just going as far as Chicago to our main plant and office. Oh, it's been a long time, Johnny. It sure has. Tell me, uh, are you still a vice president of that big chemical outfit? I certainly am. Oh, that's good. You're just the man I want to talk to. I want to ask some questions. Oh, Why? Hasn't your company got a hand like uh, all the others in the liquid rocket fuel racket? Certainly has. Or I should say had. Mm Hmm? Well, right now we're in the process of trying to turn down a contract. (laughs) No kidding. How come? Well? Well, I I shouldn't have mentioned it. Oh, top secret? No, not quite. Not exactly uh, top secret. As a matter of fact, it'll hit all the papers in just a few days now. So if you want to find out what it's all about... Now, wait. Yeah? Didn't you used to have a top security clearance? I still have, from OSI, CIA, CIC. You want to see my credentials? Why not? Okay, anything to get you off this big Mysterioso kick? Here, here, and here. Okay? Okay. Now, what's the big secret that's about to hit the headline? A new solid rocket fuel. Well, I thought a lot of companies were working on that. Had even developed some of it. They are, and they have. But, Johnny, we now have a radically different one that was developed in our place through sheer luck. How do you mean? Well, there's a young East German fellow, a scientist. I don't even remember his name. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, he has enough degrees in chemistry from European universities to choke a horse. Yeah. Came to us for just a run-of-the-mill job in one of our labs. But a few months ago, entirely on his own, he came up with this solid fuel formula, handed it over to the company Lock, Stock, and Barrel. Mm. Big boys checked it. Now, thanks to him. Well, Johnny, it looks like we're going to be light years ahead of the hammer and sickle competition. That's good. Well, that's about all I can tell you about it. Whatever you say. Now, why'd you tell me I'm just the man you wanted to see? Because maybe you can tell me something about a company out in the coast that is also in this field. Oh, Johnny, out there there must be hundreds of them ranging from the big important ones like Air Search and Rocket Dine to... Little one- and two-man operations. Uh, Which is it? The Bascom Development Company is somewhere near San Francisco. Bascom, huh? Yeah. What do you know about them? Well? Nothing. You sure? No, Johnny. I'm afraid I've never even heard of them. Oh, you're a lot of help. I'm sorry. All right. What do we talk about now? Politics? Religion? Women? Sex? Or something sensible like fishing? those jets traveled, there wasn't time to talk about much of anything before George got off the plane in Chicago. By the time I had an afternoon snack and prepared to settle down for a nap, we circled and landed at San Francisco International. Item 2, 470 for a cab into Len Walker's office. That's across from the Sheraton Palace and my pals at KCBS. Now, where do you plan to stay while you're here, Johnny? At the Huntington up on the hill. Fine. So grab yourself some dinner, get a good night's sleep... You can take off first thing in the morning. Take off again? Mm Mm-hmm. I'll have a rental car sent around to you there at the Huntington. Len, aren't you going to tell me first what this is all about? Bascom Development Company. Yes, you said that much on the phone. Well, now, look here on this map. Yeah? Now, you go down here on 101, then cut over to Route 1... Then down the coast to here, a few miles south of Big Sur. Wait a minute. If memory serves me right, that highway is chiseled out of the side of a lot of cliffs that rise up out of the blue Pacific. Right. 
So what can be there but a lot of rocks and trees and the ocean? A little well-hidden side road that goes down through the trees to a leveled-off spot on the very edge of the ocean. Hmm. That's where you'll find the Baskin Development Company. Only for security reasons, it's been made to look like a cluster of summer homes. You say they've been having explosions? Three, Johnny. And as a result of them, three dead. That's where we've had to pay off through the nose. Why? Well, the men, they were chemists or engineers he had working for him, all had insurance that Bascom paid for a cool million apiece. And he was the beneficiary? Half to him, half to the families of those men. Oh. It's common practice where people of great importance to a company are concerned. Yeah. Tell me, uh... Just how much do you know about the explosions? I think you'll do better by getting that from Baskin himself. I told him you're on your way. Oh? Yes. Okay, Len. Whatever you say. <laughs> Item three, 1280 for cocktails and dinner at the Fleur de Lis. After all, I was on expense account. Why not live it up? After a good night's sleep at the Huntington, I took off. After passing through San Jose and Salinas, I cut over through Monterey and Carmel and hit California's wonderful one, highway number one. It took me through beautiful wooded hills and forests and then along the edge of the sea. It's a narrow, tortuous road with nothing but high cliffs on the left and a sheer drop off on the right, sometimes for several hundred feet to the ocean below. And it is a beautiful, beautiful drive. At Point Sur, that's S-U-R, means south. The cliffs are almost perpendicular, so the highway goes a bit inland for a stretch. And then I found the sharply slanting little side road that Leonard indicated on the map. I had to make my way down it in low, low gear. And there at the ocean's edge was the group of... Well, Len was right. They did look like harmless summer cottages. But there was an armed guard at the entrance gate. I showed him my clearances, he made a phone call, then directed me to the second building down the road. However, as I started to pass the first one, a small, white, clapboard sort of building, it looked like, I heard a sharp, strange, crackling sound, like timbers breaking. I looked up. The side of the building seemed to bulge out momentarily, and then... I must have reacted purely instinctively, shoved hard on the accelerator. But by the time that explosion really took hold, I was almost past it. Nonetheless, my rental car rolled completely over with me inside. Shook me up a little, but otherwise I was okay. From a building down the line, several intelligent but very angry-looking men came running over, hauled me out as roughly as possible, then shoved me unceremoniously into the next-door private office of Mr. Horace Alderworthy Baskin. Bascom, a slight, gray-haired man of about 60, sat quietly behind his desk, holding a gun on me in a way that indicated he could and wouldn't hesitate to use it if it became necessary, until I produced my credentials and told him why I was there. Then he dismissed the others, shoved the gun back into the drawer of his desk, and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. We're all of us a bit on edge these days, and no doubt Doctors Harvey and Welcome and Young Franklin thought that you had caused the explosion there in Unit 1. Doctors, Mr. Baskin? Of science, chemistry. Best I've been able to find. Oh, I'll tell you this about them. They not only have brains, but muscles. They're all experts in the field of explosives. Are they? The best. I wonder after what just happened. You were very fortunate, Mr. Dollar. Had that explosion occurred just a fraction of a second earlier... I wouldn't be sitting here, would I? Your body and the remains of your car would have toppled over the edge of that narrow spot beside Unit 1 and ended up on the rock some 200 feet below. No question of it. I don't doubt it. But now, aren't you concerned about what's happened to that Unit 1? From this window, it looks like a shambles. 
Yes, like a few others that have gone before it. Do you want to take a look and see if you can figure why it blew up? I know I do. I'm afraid it would take far more scientifically knowledgeable minds than ours to determine the cause of this latest misfortune. And as you can see, Dr. Welcome and some of his aides are looking it over very carefully. Well, I still want to look. Of course. And I sincerely hope you can accomplish something. Thank heaven this time there was no one hurt. We've lost three, Mr. Dollar. Three of our finest chemists during the past three months. So I understand. And each of them, I'm convinced, just when he was on the threshold of a solution to this tremendously important project of ours. Just what is this project, Mr. Baskin? Creation of an uncommonly efficient semi-liquid rocket repellent that will, I am convinced... Semi-liquid? Yes. Yes, an almost unbelievably powerful gelatinous substance with all the energy of the complicated liquid fuels and the stability of a solid. Hmm. If I can develop it, Mr. Dollar, it will be the greatest triumph in the history of space rocketry. And I will have made it. I alone will hold the secret of it. And yet you're not a scientist. Well, in the purely academic sense, no. But without my aims and my ideas, without my money to provide the means for their experimentation, these men I employ could accomplish nothing. And that means that... What's the matter, Mr. Dollar? You are all right, aren't you? Oh, yes, sure. But as long as this last explosion just happened, I'd like to get out there and see if we, or maybe your Dr. Welcome, can pin down the cause of it. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Believe me, if anyone can determine it, Welcome can. But Welcome couldn't, nor could I. In spite of Mr. Bascom's help in combing through the ruins, and we really combed. A lot of theories got aired, but none that led to any definite conclusion. Then, early that evening in his quarters, I talked at some length with Dr. Welcome about not only this, but the three previous explosions. No, no, I don't think so, Mr. Dollar. It's, it's simply that some of the materials, the components used, are so unstable, so highly volatile and shock-susceptible that... And yet every possible precaution is taken, not only in the handling, but in the storage of them. Mm -hmm. So unless someone were setting them off deliberately, as you suggest, might be possible. An awful lot of people don't want to see our national rocketry program succeed. Don't you forget that, Doctor. Yes, but, but someone here in this closely knit organization, no, I, I can't believe it. Another thing, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Williams, Thornbury, and Brenner. Are those the three who were killed? Yes, now, certainly you don't suggest they deliberately caused the explosions that caused their own deaths. Well, it's hardly likely, I guess. Not a bit likely. And, Mr. Dollar, each of them was entirely alone in the laboratory when the accident occurred. You sure of that, Dr. Welcome? Oh, absolutely. Tell me, was there anybody in Unit 1 this afternoon when it went off? Or anywhere near it? No, you were the only one near it. And you sure of that? Absolutely certain. Mm -hmm. Tell me something else, Doctor. If I can, yes. How close are you fellows to this this rocket fuel? Well, Mr. Dollar, I believe that Williams and Thornbury and Brenner were very close to it, each in his turn. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bascom and a couple of the other chaps and I felt they had found it. But now, of course, we'll never know. So, all the rest of us can do is keep on trying. You don't sound very confident. Well, sometimes it's very discouraging. And with the cutbacks in salary we've been obliged to take. But it's a challenge, and challenges are what make a profession like ours worthwhile. They and the opportunity to serve this country. Who sparked this whole idea in the beginning? Oh, I understand it was a young German chap that Mr. Bascom found somewhere abroad. What? Yes. What was his name? Um... Kellerholz. Hans Kellerholz. Kellerholz. I see. All right, Dr. Welcome. Gentlemen. Oh, Mr. Bascom. Well, have you found anything? Anything to indicate what might... No, it, uh, it doesn't look as though we have, Mr. Bascom. Not a thing. Oh. What's back. more, I've suddenly remembered that I'm supposed to be back in San Francisco tonight, so uh, I'll have to run. If, uh, that is, my car is still usable. I understand it isn't. But if you'll wait a moment, I'll bring mine around. Oh, I appreciate that. But your investigation here... Oh, don't you worry. I'll be back. Well, I certainly hope so. San 
San Francisco? No. I drove Mr. Baskin's car out to the highway and headed south to the first filling station I could find. And there, after parking out on the far edge of the highway, I ran up item four, $21 even in telephone calls. And what I learned from them, figuratively, blew this whole case wide open. My first phone call was to George Langley, the man I'd met and talked to on the plane at his home in Chicago. Thanks to his information, the second call was to the young German chemist who developed the solid rocket fuel that they were about to announce. You guessed it. His name was Hans Kellerhaus. What Kellerhaus said to me about his reasons for having left the Bascom Project to work at one of America's big established reputable chemical firms told me more than I'd even hoped for. And then, to top it all, well, let's face it, it was mighty lucky for me that I hadn't taken the drive up to San Francisco. Because when I stepped out of the phone booth there at the little gas station... You know, I sure hope you don't need any more of my small change, mister. No, that was the last call I had to make, and thanks for the use of the phone. Well, it don't belong to me. It belongs to the phone company. Well, thanks anyway. <laughs> uh, say, now, uh, maybe you want to drive your car over to this side of the road and fill her up, maybe? Might not be a bad idea. <laughs> Though why you parked along that edge over there, so close to that drop-off, I'll never know. <laughs> hey, look! Uh, look, you see? I see, all right. Uh, one of the tires must have went, you see? Well, she's rolling on over down the cliff. One of the tires? Oh, no. What'd you say? Did you hear that little explosion? See the way that car sagged over? Uh, well, yeah, I guess I did. It must have had a time mechanism. Huh? If that happened the way it was supposed to while I was tearing up this crooked highway on the way to San Francisco... Nobody would ever have known. Uh, listen. Yeah? Uh, is that your car over there, beside the station? Uh, sure. Look, here, uh... Here, here's a hundred bucks for the use of it just for tonight. Okay? Are you kidding? Sure it's okay. Okay, then. Give me the keys. <laughs> Luckily, the same guard was on duty, and he let me through the gate to Baskin's setup without question, and more important, without announcing me. In the darkness, then, I slipped the lock on the door of Baskin's office, went inside, pulled down the shades, put on a light, and looked around. And I finally found it. A small switch under the sill of the window facing out to where Unit 1 had been. And if those wires on it had led underground to some kind of a detonator there in Unit 1 this afternoon... Dollar. Better come in, Mr. Bascom. Yes, I certainly will. Just sit down there at your desk, anywhere. Well, of course, if you like. Did you break your way in here? You, uh, want to tell me why, Mr. Bascom? Why? Why what? Afraid I don't understand. I want to know your reasons for the explosions. Well, you're implying that I was responsible for them, Mr. Dollar? Entirely. And you honestly think that you can prove a wild assertion like that? Yes, I honestly think I could. Otherwise, instead of sitting here talking with you, don't you think I'd be out and around investigating further? Yes, I suppose you would. Let's look at some facts. Like the explosion this afternoon that nearly killed me because you knew I was coming here. The switch I found under the windowsill... Well? Yes. And your help in combing through the ruins? Help? Or careful misdirection so I wouldn't find the detonator you'd rigged up nor a trace of the wiring from that switch. Of course. Those cutbacks in salaries. You needed money, didn't you, Mr. Bascom? Like all that insurance you collected. Yes, very true. And something you said this afternoon... I and I alone will hold the secret of this fuel. So when you thought that Williams and Thornbury and Brenner had it, to keep it for yourself, you killed them. Is that about it, Mr. Baskin? Just about, I guess. And all because of a young chemist I brought over here. Hans Kellerhaus. Yes. I was supposed to be over there in Germany on vacation. Actually, it was only in order to establish contact with him and hope that I could uh, capitalize on his knowledge of missile fuels. It took a lot of time, a lot of money. Most of it spent in bribes to East German authorities. But I finally got him over here. I see. 
He was so glad to be free for the first time in his life, so grateful for an opportunity to work in this country, that he was willing to agree to anything. Which means what, Mr. Baskin? I was to have complete, complete control of anything he might create and develop here. And what happened? Did he find out you were in this thing only for personal gain? Yes. So he came in here one morning and told me that he was leaving. That he would keep his word, however, and relinquish claim to whatever he had developed here. My demand, he put that in writing. So I let him go. Like an idiot. Why do you say that? Well, I thought he'd completed the fuel, that I could go ahead and produce it and sell it and make millions. Millions, Mr. Dollar. And without having to share with him. But I was wrong. He hadn't finished. Mm -hmm. I hired other men, the best that I could find from all over, in the hope that they could carry on from where he'd left off. But all it did was cost me money. Money, money. And the only way I could think of to get enough to keep going was, was by collecting that insurance. By committing murder? Yes, I know. The first one was very difficult for me. But the second one, I meant another $500,000 to carry on with. And the third... Because all the time I kept hoping, hoping to get that rocket fuel. Uh, I, su I suppose I should have known. I never would. That my misdeeds would catch up with me. Yes, you should have known. Are you ready to leave, Mr. Baskin? I don't have to, Mr. Dollar. Oh? Here in this open drawer beside my hand is a thirty-eight revolver. Loaded. What are you thinking of, Baskin? For you or for me? To make any difference? Would it really solve anything? No. No, I guess it wouldn't. Shall we go? It's almost unbelievable. I mean, the length to which some people will go to promote their own selfish interests at the sacrifice of others. Don't they know that somehow, sometime, there has to be a showdown? Expense account total... Including repair charges on the rental car and the trip back to Hartford, 993.70. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a tale of the problems, at least one of the problems, that go with the owning of a gold mine. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Melville Ruick as Bascom, Court Benson as Dr. Welcome, Frank Campanella as George Langley, and William Mason as the gas station attendant. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hanna speaking. The Hallmark Playhouse, which is heard during most of the year at this time on Thursdays, has nearly finished its summer vacation. Be with us when Hallmark Playhouse returns to CBS four weeks from tonight on September 7th. Now from Hollywood, it's time for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. I'm glad you're in, Dollar. This is Barton, Chief Adjuster at Cosmopolitan All Risk. When can I see you? I hope it doesn't have to be tonight. I'm ready for bed. I'm afraid it does have to be tonight. I just got a call from a city fire inspector. There's a four-alarm place in the Hartford Alliance building. We carry the fire policy. Does Inspector phone you? Does he suspect arson? More than that, they picked up the man who said it. That policy is for over $300,000. I'd like you to sit in while this guy makes a statement. Okay, Barton. I'll meet you there. <laughs> Edmund O'Brien in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Cosmopolitan All Risk Insurance Company. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Hartford Alliance matter. Expense account item one, 250 cab fare from my apartment to the scene of the fire. Hey, Mark, can't you give us any more pressure? I'm feeding four lines now. 
solid. Do we have the chemical holes right over here, Woodruff? There it is, Captain. Watch it there, mister. Oh, yeah. Go oh, here. Yeah. We'll hit it from the third window there. Dollar. Hey, Dollar. Right over here, Barton. Hey, Barton. Here. Oh. oh. Everything outlines against that place. I couldn't see over here. Out of harm's way. Hey, that building was a bad risk. Is there any steel in it? Yeah, maybe a little in the plumbing, but it's no worse than most in this neighborhood. Somebody's got to insure them. Who owns it? His name is Clarence Pickett. I don't know too much about him. I understand the blaze started there in the ground floor corner office. Yeah, that's right. The Hartford Alliance Loan Company. An off-duty policeman saw it start as he was driving by and then grabbed this kid as he was heading it down the alley. A kid? Yeah, about 19 or so. They took him down, but we can question him when they get through. Then, uh... And they're sure he's the one. He huh? was running away. Hey, hey, look at that wall below the second floor window. Yeah, what? yeah, get in. Get out of there. Get back away from that wall. Look at the water. Oh, oh. Expense count item two, a dollar and seventy-five cents. Cab fare to police headquarters where I met Sergeant Broderick, the officer in charge. Uh, this kid's a queer one. I don't know what you'll get out of him. He wouldn't even give us a name to book him under. Nothing on him that would identify him? Nothing. He must have stripped his pockets. Well, the fact that he down near killed a bunch of men might help loosen him up, huh? I wish you luck. Yeah, this is it. Are you uh, all ready, Martin? I'm all loaded, yes. We're going in to talk to him. When we finish, I'll bring him out. He'll be in front of me. Right. What's that for? I'll get a photograph, snap one as he comes out the door. Can't get a halfway natural one any other way. Then we'll have it published and try to find out who he is. Go ahead. All right, son, get on your feet. These men want to talk to you. It won't do you any good to talk to me. I don't want to talk about anything, and I won't. Did you set that fire? Yeah, I set it. Why? It doesn't make any difference why. I set it, and I'm ready to take anything that's coming to me. Have you set any other fires? If you mean am I one of those arson nuts, I'm not. And why'd you set it? Why do you keep asking me questions when I told you I wasn't going to answer any? Your fire almost killed some man a few minutes ago. It may do it yet. I didn't think about that. I'm, I'm sorry. I had to do it. Why? I can't tell you. Leave me alone. Somebody hire you to do it? It doesn't make any difference. Why won't you tell us who you are? Because I don't want you to know. I don't want anybody to know who I am. I don't want a trial or anything. I'll plead guilty to everything, to setting the fire and to killing firemen, everything. Just give me what's coming to me and leave me alone. Let me see your hands. Why? Let me see them. No! Hey, let go, will you? Yeah, let no go! Up, yeah, that's all I want. Uh, what was that for? I wanted to find out what kind of a kid he is. He's not tough. His hands are clean, nails trimmed. There's a mark left by a ring on a third finger, left hand. Class rings, my guess. I've had enough for now, Sergeant. Okay, we're turning him over to the psychiatrist in the morning. All right, son, on your feet. I'm going to put you to bed now. Come on. Keep moving. Hold it now. Hey, give me that. Give me that camera. You can't take my picture. What are you doing? Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Expense account item three, seven dollars. Transportation and general costs the next morning spent while running down the financial condition of Mr. Clarence Pickett, owner of the burned out building. At 1 p.m., I looked for him at his home, and at 1.45, I found him viewing the charred remains of the Hartford Alliance building. Mr. Pickett? Yeah? 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 You were pointed out to me by one of the workmen. My name is Dollar. I'm working for Cosmopolitan and all risk. And I suppose they are as troubled as I am over this. My office was right there, the corner one on the third floor. That's right over the spot where the fire started. Yes, so I've been advised. And I was reminded as to how many nights I've been working there at the hour it broke out. You haven't assayed the loss already, have you? That's not my job, Mr. Pickett. I'm not an adjuster. I'm a private investigator. Oh. Well, I suppose under conditions such as we find ourselves, it'd be reasonable to expect investigation. Who is that strange boy? And why did he do this thing? You've seen his picture in the paper there. I was going to ask you if you knew him. I? Well, of course I... 
What are your insinuations, young man? Look, Mr. Pickett, the conditions, as you call them, are not at all clear. An insurance company feels it has a right to make plenty of insinuations when it's up against a fire of incendiary origin. Go on. I was able to learn this morning that financially, you are not a healthy man. You rotten snoop. You've taken some pretty heavy losses on the exchange in the past few months. I've dealt in stocks, bonds, and property for a long time. When the day comes that I have to burn myself out to recoup my losses... Oh, go away. I don't want to talk to you any further. I'm afraid it can't stop here. Will you come down to police headquarters and face that boy they picked up? I will not. Why won't you? Because I have no reason to. I've never seen him, and I don't care to. On the strength of your refusal, I think a court order could force you to. You, you do that? I certainly would. So you have nothing to lose by coming without one. Very well, Mr. Dollar. And I'll see you choke on your own insults. Uh, sit down, Mr. Pickett. I want you to understand that this is routine procedure and in no way an accusation of any kind. Oh, Ross, a few words to whitewash a violation of my rights. Help yourself to the desk chair, Dollar. Thank you. All right, Dr. Herbert. Will you bring the boy in now? To pick it, Mr. Dollar, our psychiatrist, Dr. Herbert. How do you do, Doctor? Gentlemen. All right, son. Remember, this is serious. Now, have you ever seen this man before? Yes, I have. It what? Tell me who he is. He owns the building. Hired me to set the fire. But that's not true. He gave me $50 and promised me 50 more. But, but he's lying. I've never seen him before in my life. Why would he lie? But how should I know? Because he's insane. He's trying to use me to hide something else. Son, where is the money? I spent it. I didn't get the other 50. But these are bald faced lies. It sounds like a scheme of the police. Well, it'll not be as easy as that. I'll not put up with it another moment. I'll see counsel before I speak to you again. Yeah, I couldn't hold him. We can pick him up later. Either of you want any more with this one? I'll see him later this afternoon. Nothing for me right now. All right, son, come on. We'll go back to that room and talk some more. What do you think, doctor? Uh, there is a greatly troubled and very confused young man. I could do very little to help him. A psychiatrist needs cooperation. He fought me every moment of the consultation. Think he was telling the truth about Pickett? It's hard to say. It could be true. On the other hand, as a falsehood, it could be classed as one aspect of this tremendously strong desire to keep some secret hidden. How would he know that Pickett was the owner of the building? Huh. That would be quite simple. A newspaper was shown to him this morning in an effort to force him to reveal his identity. Yeah, that's right. There's still no key to who he is, eh? None. I've learned only that he seems to be, well, should we say, a well-bred boy, fairly well-educated, who was tortured by something in the building that he feared and hated. The fire started in the offices of the Hartford Alliance Loan Company. Do you think a debt that the boy couldn't pay off would be a strong enough motive to drive him to arson? Uh, unless it were a debt of shame. No. Well, we have to start someplace. The loan company is a better lead than what we've had so far. Say, so you sure the kid isn't making this up, that he's not a psychopathic? The psychopath is only an emotionally immature individual. And two of us can say that we have reached emotional maturity or what it is. After hearing the doctor out to the bitter end, I knew no more about the arson case than I'd known before. Expense count item four, dollar seventy-five, cab fare back to the ruins of the Hartford Alliance building. Only a guard from the fire department was there, and a workman who was busy in the same office I wanted to look over. I wouldn't come in here if I were you. You'll get dirty and it isn't too safe. I'll be all right. What do you want? Well, I got no K from the guards out there. I'm an investigator working on this case. Oh, go ahead, then. This Sloan outfit hired me to bring out this stuff that isn't burned, but it's all mixed up with the stuff from upstairs. You caved in. Yes, fires are a mess. Had a safe from up there fell through, and I can't tell one from the other. I wouldn't be surprised if the whole floor came next, what's left of it. What are you looking for? I don't know. 
What was upstairs? Uh, an employment agency, from what I picked up. Maids and butlers and that kind of thing. Uh, there's the one safe and that's the other. Can you tell them apart? Why don't you take both of them out and open them? Yeah, well, all right. Give me a hand then, will you? Sure. This one's almost covered up. Hey, what's that? Sounds like a timber. Let's move. Hey, stop above. Yeah. Yeah, there's someone up there. Come on, this way. Come on. Hey. Hey, you up there. Hey. Hey. The highest standard of living, the highest wages, and the shortest hours. All this plus the time-honored guarantee of individual freedom. Where else will you find all these advantages but under our American economic system? Help to preserve that system. It has brought more benefits to more people than any other system ever devised. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. This spot, Johnny. How do you feel this morning? Oh, rotten. How about the workman? Bad, still unconscious, fractured skull, and something about his back. Well, I guess I feel better than he does. Hey, Barton. Yeah? That cave-in was no accident. What's that? There was a man on the floor above us. It's one of the last things I remember. He was looking down at us, holding a crowbar. Well, why didn't you say something about it yesterday? I wasn't thinking straight. You don't, after a crack in the head like that... But I began to remember last night. Uh, are you sure of this, Dollar? I guess it'll be hard to prove. There were two safes in there. One from the Hartford Alliance Loan Company and the other from the Hartford Alliance Employment Agency. It had fallen through from the office above. I don't get it. I don't either. But we just decided to move both of them out because you couldn't tell them apart without looking at their contents. And that's when the roof fell in. And you're trying to work out a connection. Oh, I don't know. Say, what about the kid? Has he been identified? Not yet. He still insists that Pickett paid him to set the place. Hard to prove, but I'm following it up. I wouldn't build a case on it yet. I'll try some more coffee and aspirin, and when I can make it, I'll go down and talk to the kid again. What's the matter with you? Oh, get out of here, will you? I'd like to. I wish I'd never heard of you, much less seen you. But it's my job to clean this thing up. That means putting as much evidence as I can get into the hands of the people who hired me. So settle back. I might be working on you until you're middle-aged. Pickett hired me. I told you that. Speaking as an insurance man, I'd like to believe that's true. But I don't think it is. I think something in the building was behind that fire. He paid me to do it. And why would somebody try to kill a workman and me because we were pulling a couple of office safes out of the wreckage? I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Pickett hired me. What does the Hartford Alliance Loan Company mean to you? Nothing. I don't know anything about it. Or the Hartford Alliance Employment Agency? It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Nothing does. I can't tell you anything. I... Leave me alone, will you? I can't tell you anything. <laughs> Please, leave me alone. That afternoon, his silence stopped paying off, and his picture in the paper started to. A woman phoned in to say that she thought she recognized him. And at six that evening, I was standing on her doorstep in the little resort village of Pine Orchard. Mrs. Landry? Yes. My name is Dollar. I talked to you after you phoned the police in Hartford. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. Won't you come in? Thank you. It was just the strangest thing about the way I happened to see that Hartford paper. Nobody out here takes it, you know. But I went down to the drugstore to buy a movie magazine, and something just pulled my eyes to this paper, and there was Billy Brandon. You're sure of it? I've known him since he was a tyke. I worked for his people, you know. That was before Mrs. Brandon passed on three years ago. 
I can't imagine what could have gone into Billy to be in such awful trouble. Is his father still alive? Oh, my, yes. A splendid man. And they live here in Pine Orchard? Only in the summer. They're from Chicago. But they have a huge estate here. Loads of money. Mr. Brandon is in Florida fishing. Poor man, I don't suppose he even knows. Hmm? The police are trying to locate him. Yes, I just don't know what to think of it. How could Billy cause his poor father such shame? Mrs. Landry, do you know if there's anyone on the estate now that I could talk to? Uh, nobody that lives in. Mr. Meek, the gardener, lives just down the street. He told me just yesterday that that woman they kept out there left her job without so much as locking up the house. Who is she? Their maid. An out-of-town girl. From your home, Hartford, some employment agency center. Employment agency? That's what Mr. Meek told me. Mrs. Landry, do you know if it was the Hartford Alliance Employment Agency? The Alliance, yes, that was it. It's their business, I suppose, but there are plenty of good girls right here in town. Mrs. Landry, what was her name, do you know? No, I don't, but Mr. Meek lives just down the street. He'd know. <laughs> turned out to be Bell Muir. And with that information, I pried Sergeant Broderick loose from a friendly poker game after I'd gotten back to Hartford. I met him in the file room at headquarters. Oh, come on in, Dollar. We'll see what we can dig up. Now, uh, give me your theory again, will you? Well, according to your psychiatrist, young Brandon was afraid of something in that building. It would seem that somebody else was afraid to see one of the two safes leave. How sure are you of that? I saw a man pry the wall loose. Did you identify him? Probably not. I just caught a flash. But the fact that the Brandons had hired a girl from the agency sort of falls into place, doesn't it? Don't you smell blackmail? Uh, we'll see. You want to check our files on the girl, right? Both the girl and the manager of the agency, of Benjamin Price. Uh, what's her name again? Uh, Bell Muir. M-U-I-R. M-U... Uh, here it is. Here's a Muir, Adelaide. Ah, how's that for a record? Look at that. They never learn. Mullen, Mullen, Mullen. That's it. No more Muirs. Uh, can we try Price now? Sure. Here's the mail file over here. E R I Price 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 A Adolf Dollar Benjamin. Benjamin L. Benjamin L. Yeah, here he is. What do you know about that? What's on him? 1939, suspected of fraud, no indictment. 1944, suspected of receiving stolen goods, no indictment. Suspicion of fraud again in 48, no indictment. What about young Brandon? Can I talk to him? Won't do any good tonight. He's in the hospital under sedatives. Oh, you can't help feeling sorry for him. At least I can. Especially if it's blackmail. Yeah, I know. His father's due in tomorrow afternoon. Maybe he can do something with him. Well, I'll see if I can get authorization from the bunco detail to follow this through. Tomorrow, we'll look into that setup. Do you care if I go ahead tonight? Where are you going? Bell Muir's. Why start with her? A couple of reasons. With a background of suspicions, but no indictments like that, Price must be smart. And I'd like her to talk to him before I do. Put him on guard and see what his next move will be. Okay, Dollar. There's no way I can stop you. You've been lucky so far. Don't foul it up now. Lucky? Huh. I'll trade you my headache for your poker losses any day. The discovery of Benjamin Price's name in the police file wasn't the only development to take place at headquarters. The desk sergeant had a message, which he passed along just before I left. The workman who had been with me in the office, when the wall had come down on us, had died of his injuries. It wasn't just an arson case any longer. I found Belmure at home. The ground floor apartment, low-income neighborhood. Her reaction when I introduced myself gave me nothing. She invited me in, apologized for some nylons drying on the back of a chair, and invited me to sit down. 
I can't believe that Mr. Brandon would do such a thing. Why would he? I think he was being blackmailed. Oh, a nice young man like him? I don't think he'd ever do anything he could be blackmailed for. He's too nice. Have you ever heard of anybody but people with nice reputations standing still for blackmail? Oh, I can't believe it. And I don't understand about the fire. Why would he do that? To try and stop the blackmailers. Now, you're the only connection we've found between the building and the Brandons. I hoped you could help us. Help? I don't know anything about it. You got your job at the Brandons through the Hartford Alliance Employment Agency? Yeah, I've been signed with them for over a year. Is there any way they could have gotten a hold of any information they could use against the boy? I don't see how. And I swear, I don't know what it could be. Young Mr. Brandon was almost too nice, if you know what I mean. No, just what do you mean? Well, I've had trouble with some of these spoiled rich men's sons, but Mr. Brandon never looked twice at me. Listen, you don't think that I... Why'd you leave your job so suddenly, Miss Muir? I didn't. I'm still employed. But when his father ran off to Florida and young Mr. Brandon said he was going away, I didn't see any use cooling my heels in that place away from my friends. Uh-huh. Sure. I think you're barking up the wrong tree, Mr. Dollar. They're all nice people in the agency, every one. Mr. Price, the manager? He's very nice. He has quite a record of being questioned by the police. I don't believe that. It's true. Well, I never would have suspected it. I don't know what to think of this, Mr. Dollar. I really don't. I don't either, Miss Muir. I won't take any more of your time. Thanks a lot. Well, anything I can do to help, please call on me. I said I would and left the apartment. But I got back to a position outside her door in time to hear a phone dialed and a conversation that started, he was here. <laughs> Proof of blackmail is hard to get without the cooperation of the victim, which is also hard to get. But it looked more and more like that lay behind the trouble. The next morning, I decided to try my luck with Benjamin Price. Yes? Mr. Price? That's right. My name is Dollar. I'm investigating the fire in your building for the insurance company. What do you want from me? I didn't light it. It's funny you should say that. Why? Why? Because in a way, I think you did. You can suspect blackmail all you want. That's one thing, making it stick as another. I guess Belle won't be much of a witness against you, will she? Best kind I can think of. We're going to get married. She's loyal. So why don't you drop it, Dollar? You won't get any place. You feel a little different now than you did when we were moving your safe out of that building. You must have gotten rid of the evidence. I don't get you. Yes, you do. I saw you. Don't you remember? I yelled at you. Don't be ridiculous. The man who was with me, the workman... Died yesterday afternoon. With a blackmail, it should work into a first-degree murder charge. You're going pretty far, aren't you? Not as far as the men from the police laboratory are going. They're looking for marks from a crowbar in that rubble that came down on us. And they're pretty good. Watch where you talk this stuff up, Dollar. I'm warning you, I don't scare easy and I don't railroad easy. And what are you worried about? Watch where you shoot off your mouth. Now beat it. Go on! <laughs> I wish you hadn't gone to him, Dollar. You said yourself he was smart. He is, but he's guilty, too. I recognize him, and he knows it. What about the father? Well, he got in a little afternoon. He's a pretty important man in Chicago, an ex-public defender. Defense lawyer now with one of the biggest private practices there. I'm sure he would be. Yeah, this is the room. We uh, moved him out of the ward. Mr. Brandon, this is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. How do you do? Brandon. Mr. Dollar, I understand that you've done a great deal of work on this situation, and I feel that it's fair to tell you that neither my son or I will make any kind of statement until we take the query under the fullest consideration. That's all right with me, Mr. Brandon. I just left Benjamin Price. You did? Yeah. From his attitude, I take it that the basis of his blackmail is pretty strong. Blackmail? I see no reason for that word to enter the conversation. You're not in the courtroom now, Mr. Brandon. You're in a hospital room where your son has been kept under sedatives because of an almost complete nervous breakdown. Price is convinced that you'll sacrifice your son rather than give us proof that we'll clean this up. 
He threw that in my face. Mr. Dollar is an insurance investigator. What is your interest in this case at the moment? Your son has tried to involve an innocent man. The company that hired me would be liable to slander if they try to build a case on his accusations. And you know the insurance companies. Hmm. I do, indeed. I can promise you that we'll dig into your son's background and your background until we get the answers we want. Dad. Just a moment, Bill. If you let Price get through this one untouched, where do you think he'll stop, Mr. Brandon? Dad, make him go. I can't stand anymore. I don't care about myself, but I don't want... Well, let me handle this. Mr. Dollar, you must realize that my son acted under severe emotional strain. Could I depend upon you to be a witness in his defense? No, you couldn't. He started something that caused a man's death. Dad, don't let him talk anymore. Just leave me alone and I'll take care of it. I've done it all right so far. Sure, you've done a fine job. Bill, I think it's gone far enough. It has to stop sometime. But, Dad! Dollar, my son was involved in a traffic accident in Chicago two years ago. He was drunk. The woman was killed. There was a witness, and I paid him to perjure himself in our favor. Bill was acquitted. Price found out about that? Yes. How? This man, well, his name isn't important now, continued to extort money from me. He phoned at the house in Pine Orchard, and the maid overheard. I didn't know Bill knew about it until today. She didn't know I was there, and I listened to her talk about it. The first one was bad enough, but then with another one, I had to do something. Did you make a payment to the maid? No, somebody else. A man. Did you recognize him? Yes. Would you identify him if we took you to him? Yes. <laughs> rest, as far as I was concerned, came 20 minutes later when Mr. Brandon, Sergeant Broderick, and I stood in front of Benjamin Price's door. Well, Dollar, haven't you caused the... That's the man. Who is this guy? What is this? Get out of here. I think we better come in, Price. No, you don't. I know my rights. You don't come in without a warrant. We got a warrant. What do you want in here? All we want is you, Price. There's a man waiting outside who want to place you at the scene of the murder. You can't do it. I wasn't there. You'll have your chance to prove that if you can. The men want to go through your apartment. Why? To look for traces of soot from the building. All they need is a speck or two. Come on, Price. Let's talk it over. Not me. Oh, you know you don't, Price. Yeah, that does it. Okay, pick him up, Dollar. Don't bother to be gentle. He won't care. Expense account item six, forty dollars, miscellaneous. Item seven, two fifty cab fare back to my apartment. I guess the company won't get far trying to avoid the payment of damages, but all of us might make a moral out of the matter. Maybe somebody has said it before. One sin begets another. In this case, the original conspiracy to perjure a witness parlayed to an arson indictment. The son fraud and murder for Price and Belmuir, and enough charges to put the father out of work for the duration. All I got out of it was a headache. Expense account total, $180. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen starring in the Columbia Pictures production 7-Eleven Ocean Drive. Featured in tonight's cast were High Averback, Ken Christie, Raymond Burr, Gil Stratton Jr., Howard McNear, Ted Osborne, and Peggy Weber. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Perry Jameson, the Paramount Insurance Adjuster, Johnny. Hi, Perry. It's been a long time. I'd begun to think you're neglecting me. Oh, how you talk. Matter of fact, I've just been waiting for a nasty enough case to come along for you. Yeah, you do have a habit of handing me the dirty ones. What is it this time? Four State, out in Denver. Oh, yeah, I've heard of them. Well, they're a small outfit. By contract, all their claims are rooted through us. Damage appraisals, payment dispersals, and so on. So what's happened? Well, we've had to pay a lot of claims for them recently. Too many. 
What's more, they've all been big ones and on fairly young policies. Well, Perry, you know as well as I do that things will average out in the long run. Unless something's wrong. 60000 on one policy, 35000 on another, 70000 and a cool 150000 on one just last week. Shoot. And the beneficiary in each case has been the same man. Then no wonder you... Just leave the door open, Perry. I'll be right over. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yes, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. The Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Denver dispersal matter. Expense account item one, a dollar ten for the cab that took me over to Perry Jameson's office at Paramount. Through to form, the door was wide open for me. Uh, I kind of thought this thing might get you down here in a hurry, Johnny. Sit down. Yeah, thanks. And I took the liberty of calling TWA and getting you a seat on the plane to Denver. Good idea. When? Well, there's one leaving New York at 6 p.m. Okay. And I'll get you into Denver about, oh, 10.30 Mountain Time. Uh-huh. Thinking make it? Sure. Charge your expenses to us. That's the deal we have with four states. All right. And the man to see out there, which is almost a one-man outfit, his name is William Whitney. Got it. Now, look, Perry, I've been thinking on the way over here. Woo-hoo, wonders we'll never see. Thanks, pal. But how well do you know this man, Whitney? Uh, Maybe he's in cahoots with this big beneficiary, this Don Ricardo. Is that his name? Yeah. Such things have happened. No, no, Johnny, you're wrong. Poor old Willie Whitney's a mild, timid, milk toast. His wife, an ex-chorus girl who probably thought he had money. Well, you can be sure she's the one who wears the pants in the family. Well, Willie would cringe at the thought of hurting a fly. Well, it was an idea. I don't blame you, but no, forget it. Well, what makes you so sure something's wrong? Well, I didn't say I was, but 215000 to one beneficiary in a period of only three months. Well, I just want to be sure it's okay. And I called you in because I am willing to pay to make sure. No, don't worry, Perry. You will. Expense account item two, $141 even, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to New York to Denver. Originally Indian country, the Mile High City is now a maze of oil refineries, steel companies, grain mills, chemical and manufacturing plants. A huge downtown shopping area and beautiful tree-studded residential sections. No wonder it's one of the big insurance centers. Item three, two dollars even for a cab into town where I park myself at the world-famous Brown Palace Hotel. Item four, ten cents, phone call to an old newspaper pal from back east who is now working on the Denver Post. Pete Packard. Johnny Dollar, Pete Packard. Okay, what's the story? Johnny Dollar, okay, how are you, Keith? Great, great. You gonna be here long? We gotta get together. Where are you staying? The Brown Palace. Oh, hey. look, you, you want us to dig up a couple of dates? We'll go out on the town. Remember the last time we tied one on together? Ooh, are you kidding? <laughs> I had such a headache the next morning, it hasn't left me yet. Well, hey, listen. Keith, I get away from the desk at 2 a.m. No, you look. Huh? I'm out here on a job, insurance investigation. Did you ever hear of a man named Don Ricardo? Don Ricardo? No. What do you know about him? Well, uh, they say, now mind you, I, I, I don't know for sure, Keith, but don't forget, I did a hitch on the Chicago Sun Times a few years back. What's that got to do with Don Ricardo? Well, it was back in the days of the Capone mob. Oh. And uh, Don Ricardo, uh, well, mind you, nobody was ever able to pin anything on him. Yeah, I see what you mean. Where does he live, Pete? Oh, 20 to 30 miles east, the other side of Golden, a little place called Millville. Uh-huh. Now, now, mind you, Keith, I, I don't want to really say anything against him. I I mean, if I don't seem to be really telling you anything about it... Pete, well, I think you've told me plenty. Well, now, listen, Keith. Thanks, I... and I'll be talking to you. It was late, and I was tired, but I went downstairs to the cocktail bar, and with the help of a big, fat tip for a nightcap, got some more lowdown on Don Ricardo. The bartender talked plenty. Yeah, it seems Ricardo was living the life of Riley in the little town of Millville. Lovely home, expensive cars, threw a lot of big, gaudy parties. And always for people from out of town, mostly Chicago or Miami Beach. Yeah, the bartender talked plenty. 
until he spotted a lean, well-dressed, rather too well-dressed man sitting alone at one of the tables watching him. A man who'd somehow forgotten to take off the light gray hat that shaded his features and slightly narrowed eyes. The bartender clammed up. I paid for my drink as item five and was conscious of being watched closely as I casually sorted out and took the elevator up to my room. First thing in the morning, I looked up the address of Four State. Instead of the striking new mile-high center, as I'd expected, it was a dingy old office building on South Broadway. William Whitney looked a little old and dingy himself. Johnny Dollar, at the special investigation. That's right, Mr. Whitney. Oh, well, well, sit down, won't you? All right, thanks. Just here on a visit? Uh, I'm here because the insurance adjusters are concerned about some recent claims they've had to pay on policies issued by you. We've been very unfortunate lately, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, $215,000 unfortunate. On only four policies. Yes, and all paid to the same beneficiary by some odd coincidence. You sure it was coincidence? Who were the policyholders? Why, some old miners living over near Golden. Old miners insuring for those amounts? Yes, sir. They were all able to pay the premium. Give me their names. Yes, sir. Unless I'm cockeyed, there's something wrong with this whole thing, and I intend to find out what it is. The policies were issued in good faith, and the premiums paid. But I agree with you, sir, and I'm terribly concerned. I'm glad you're here, sir. It will not only save the company a lot of money, but it will take a great load off my mind. Here's the list. Yeah. Do you know the beneficiary, this Don Ricardo? Only through seeing him when I've given him the checks. Hmm. Barno, Mulligan, R. Smith, and J. Smith. Did any of these insured have families? Well, I don't know. You see, the beneficiary in each case... Yeah, uh... I know. Better let me see those policies. Whitney left me alone while I plowed through his files. Satisfied, at least, that the policies themselves were okay, I finally left him, hailed a taxi, and told the driver to head for the town of Golden. As we pulled away from the curb, a small black foreign car in the next block swung around and appeared to follow us. And I wondered... But then it cut off at an intersection, and I decided I was imagining things. Until we pulled up at one of the addresses Whitney had given me in Golden. A ramshackle, unpainted old frame house on the edge of town. I told the driver to wait for me and walk up to the front door. Hey, it looks to me like that house is empty, mister. You sure you give me the right address? Yeah, this is the address, all right. But I guess the... Huh? Hey, that door open by itself? I don't know. Hello? Hello? Anybody? No! Mister! Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Vermont's state flag, in its early form, imitated our national flag, uniquely bearing 17 stripes and 17 stars, with only the inscribed word Vermont to distinguish it. The good people of Vermont assumed, as did our national government, that stripes as well as stars would be added as each new state entered the Union. Vermont entered the Union after Tennessee and Ohio, and with Kentucky to join shortly, the Vermonters naturally put 17 stripes on their flag. In 1818, the United States Congress put a stop to this, and since then, the stripes have always been at 13, and only stars are added for each new state. Vermont's present flag captures the famous beauty of the Green Mountain State in its coat of arms, and inscribed is the phrase, Vermont... Freedom and Unity. Vermont state flag, the flag of the 14th state to enter the Union, was adopted on April 26, 1923. And now, Act Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Denver Dispersal Matter. The old house at the edge of Golden, Colorado looked empty, but I knocked anyway. Address, mister? Yeah, driver, this is the address, all right. But I guess that... Huh? Hey! That door opened by itself? I don't know. Hello? Hello? Anybody? Oh! Mister! 
Mister, go back. Get away from this open door. God, but you're but you're hurt. Your your neck. You're bleeding to death. Stay down. Barely nick me. I'm all right. Holy cow! I, I thought you was a goner. Here, let me help you. You'll need help if you don't stay out of his line of fire. Well, well who was it? You see anybody? Hey, listen. Yeah, that's a car pulling away from the back. Get a look at it. Well, I can't can't tell that dusty side road back there. Looks like a little one though. Foreign car. Too far away now. I can't tell. But it's black. All right, come on. We're getting back into your cab. Yeah, yeah, I'll get you to a doctor. No, no, I'm okay. You know where Millville is? Sure, a few miles east. It's an old mining... Come on. You know where Don Ricardo lives? For sure, I... You... You want to go there? Does he own a small black foreign car? Yeah, real expensive job. I've, I've seen him in town. But, mister, come you... Come on, because I'll lay odds. He's the one who fired those shots. Uh... Do you mind if I drop you off a few blocks away from his place? The cab driver relented, dropped me off at Ricardo's front door, then hightailed it for other parts. It was a nice home, very modern, seemingly out of place in what had once been a prosperous mining center, but was now a little more than a ghost town. Yes? Mr. Ricardo? That's right. Who are you? I think you know, but I'll tell you anyhow. I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. We can sit in the den. Would uh, would you like a drink? No, thanks. Well, what happened to your neck there? It's been bleeding. I will get to that later. I've been rather expecting someone like you to call in view of my good fortune in insurance money lately. Uh, sit down. You sure you wouldn't like a drink? Tell me one thing. Yes. Who paid the premiums on those four policies that netted you a couple of hundred grand? <laughs> Why, the policyholders, of course. At least, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Four old broken-down miners? They were still quite active, Mr. Dollar, hoping to find a new vein in some of the old workings in this region. Then maybe you grub-staked them, huh? Well, as a matter of fact, I did. And they promised me a share of whatever they might find. In return, they named me in their insurance policy. Oh, you must have given them plenty. More than a worked-out mine could ever yield. How do you mean? To afford the premiums on those hefty policies. Now, look, Dolly, it was all perfectly legal on the up and up. How old were they? Barno. Barno? About 68, I believe. Mulligan and Smith and the other Smith. About the same. So what? Oh, the company was crazy. How did they die, Ricardo? By some strange coincidence, the poor old fellows all went the same way. Accidents there in the mine they were working. Did the police investigate those accidents? I imagine so. Now, look, Ricardo... As you know very well, I was shot at a few minutes ago. Shot at? At a little isolated house on the edge of Golden. You were a lousy shot. Aye. Now, look here. Also, you should have known better than to park that little foreign job of yours in the driveway, at least without washing it down. What are you talking about? That kind of purplish dust it's covered with. Dust? Yeah, I'm talking about the side road back of that house where you tried to plug me. Well? Okay, okay, Dollar. Maybe you're right about the whole thing. So what if I did try to knock you off? Oh, you admit it, huh? Yeah, why not? But since I didn't kill you, then... Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Put him up. Face the wall, Get your hands off of me. Come on, get, come on. get your hands off. Officer, off. I've never seen a prettier uniform in my life. What is this? What is this? We've been waiting a long time to nail you, Ricardo. Get him out of here, boys. All right, take it easy. Pete! So help me, Keith, I knew if anybody would bring Ricardo out in the open, you would. You mean to say that... Yeah, I figured I'd bring these... Better bring these state police out here. Oh, Pete, you're a doll. Now let you and me go out and tear the town apart, huh? Later. After I finish this job. Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Over 150 years ago, the Swiss poet Henri Amiel wrote, Heroism is the brilliant triumph of the soul over fear. Heroism is the dazzling and glorious concentration of courage. During the Korean campaign, Corporal Ronald Rosser was attached to the heavy mortar company of the 38th Infantry, 2nd Division, United States Army. Rosser a veteran of World War II, rejoined the army and shipped to Korea when he heard that his brother had fallen in the winter assault of the Chinese communists. One day, Rosser's company moved into enemy territory. At the time, the corporal was a forward observer and carried a radio. Suddenly, 
In the midst of an enemy attack, Rosser handed his radio to a buddy, slipped the safety off his carbine, and filled his shirt with hand grenades. He charged at the enemy through fierce mortar and artillery fire, shooting from the hip. Straddling a bunker, he riddled its occupants. Still advancing, he accounted for two more of the enemy, shooting one through the head and clubbing another to death. Continuing his one-man charge, he jumped into a trench full of enemy soldiers, opened fire and forced his way relentlessly down the length of the trench, killing right and left with grenades and carbine fire. Out of ammunition, he returned to his company, where he replenished his supply. Then he charged the enemy again and again. Finally, he returned to his own area, and taking the radio back from his friend, he moved out with his company. Corporal Ronald Rosser was awarded the Medal of Honor for his action. Action which had shown the enemy that his personal code of conduct wouldn't let them push around either his kid brother or his country. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Denver Dispersal Matter. <laughs> It took hours, even with Pete Packard's help, and he finally had to go back to his job at the Denver Post. But there in Don Ricardo's house, carefully hidden away under a drawer lining and a sideboard, I found what I was looking for, a handful of canceled checks. It was well after dark when I appropriated one of Ricardo's fancy cars and drove back to Denver, to a little house in the south end of town, not far from the office of Four State Insurance Company. As I pulled to a stop, a big fancy truck nearly sideswiped me. Good. It covered the sound of my stopping there. As unobtrusively as possible, I walked up to the front door of the place. Even above the sound of passing traffic, I could hear voices, loud ones, coming from somewhere in the rear of the building. Cautiously, I edged my way around the side to where I could see the lighted window of a bedroom. All right, all right, I thank you. Only why don't you tell me why? Stop asking questions. Get the things back. Make sure it's only enough to put in the car, the traveling light, and back. All right, Willie, all right already. Boy, you're bossier than Don ever was when you want to be. Forget Don Ricardo and collect your stuff. If it wasn't for me, you'd still be working in one of his nightclubs in Chicago. Lucky you never talked this way down to that insurance officer. Oh, stop that. I thought we were going to stay in Denver until you made a lot of dough with the insurance racket, huh? I left this happy domestic scene to walk slowly back to the front door. Yep. My original hunch at the office in Hartford had been right. Somebody at the front door. Well, why don't you go answer it? Huh? Willie? Oh. Well, Mr. Dollar. That's right. Oh, my, I'm glad you're here, sir. Well, you look upset, Mr. Whitney. I am, sir. I am terribly upset. Handbags? They're in the hall? Yes. Going somewhere? It's that Don Ricardo. Hall? I thought you didn't really know him. I didn't. Oh, if only I'd done it before. I'd never have issued those policies naming him as beneficiary. Done what, Mr. Whitney? Investigated that, Ricardo. But I did, after you left me this morning. He's a gangster. An ex-gangster, Mr. Dollar. No. Yes. I suddenly realized that in your investigation, you'd, you'd investigate him. And he'd think I'd had you investigate him. He'd think I was trying to make trouble for him. It frightened me. Frightened me terribly. And that's why you decided to leave town, huh? Yes, yes, of course. Until this whole thing blows over. He's a dangerous man. He'd stop at nothing. He might even try to kill me. I must leave here immediately. Oh, I wouldn't be too sure of that. Where did you plan to go? Far away, anywhere, where he couldn't find me. And where maybe I couldn't find you. Of course. What? Why did you say that? Well, I was just thinking. This morning, when I was going through the files at your office, you left me alone for a while. Yes, yes, I recall that I did. Why? To make a phone call, maybe? To Don Ricardo? What? Is that why he just happened to be waiting in his little foreign car a block or so up the street about the time I left your office in a cab? Mr. Dollar! Pretty good theory, isn't it? Especially when I have these little scraps of paper to back it up. What are those? Some of Don Ricardo's canceled checks. Made out to you. Twenty percent of the take on those big, fat insurance payments. Where did you get those? Funny, too. They're all dated one day after you paid off on each of those big claims. Give me oh, those. No, you don't. I'm going to need these in... No, I'll kill you. That's the milk toast, huh? You, you dirty... I'll kill you. Okay, baby. All right. All right. Okay, Willie, get up on your feet. Yes, sir. Anything you say, Mr. Dollar... 
But please, you must believe me. Oh, I'm an it. innocent that man. That timid soul Pose of yours may have sold insurance to a handful of suckers, wouldn't he? But it hasn't sold me a thing. Oh, I suppose you find them in every trade. That still doesn't justify their even being alive, though. Fortunately, in the insurance business, they never get away with it for long. Even a team like Whitney and Ricardo. I wonder if they're sharing the same cell. Expense account, item six, ten dollars to the doctor who sewed up my neck. Item seven, eighty-four dollars for a night on the town with Pete Packard. Strangely enough, I still have a bit of a headache from it. Expense account total, including a little gift to that taxi driver, incidentals and transportation back to Hartford, three hundred ninety-one dollars and eighty cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Idaho's state flag depicts the prime industrial pursuit of its citizens, mining. Balanced against this image is a female figure combining the virtues of the goddess of liberty, for she carries the spear and cap of liberty, and the goddess of justice, represented by the scales in her hand. A bright shining star in the heavens is an indication that Idaho has joined the nation. Overall is the motto, Esto Perpetua, may she endure forever. Idaho's state flag, the flag of the 43rd state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 12, 1907. Now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a killer's list. That's right. A list of victims. And guess who's on it? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Forrest Lewis, Barney Phillips, Edgar Beria, Frank Gerstle, and Peter Leeds. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 